Welcome everybody to our um, February 8th uh, workshop on ARPA, the American Recovery Act money. Um, we'll call the meeting to order and uh, just a couple of things I wanted to let you know. We're going to do things a little different today. Um, normally we wait until we've had our discussion, have citizen input, but I don't want to make people wait here all day. So we're going to take that um, towards the beginning, right after uh, Sue does her presentation on community engagement. And that way, um, you know, people have their say, and if they want to get out of here, they can. They don't have to sit here all day. So we're trying to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so ho hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Jennifer, for opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I was telling staff earlier this morning that if we were going to have a day-long workshop, today would be the day. The weather's yeah. just lovely. <laughs> it's either this or binge-watching Yellowstone at home, yeah. right? So, the, so it, it's a good day to be here. Uh, as I, playing pickleball out there, uh, oh, right? Yeah. Pickleball. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is uh, a day long, we'll be scheduled the day, hopefully it won't take all day, uh, workshop to consider the proposed expenditures of the American Rescue Plan Act funds. We've been working on this, uh, this particular presentation and these projects since the first announcement came out that the city would be allocated $18.3 million over a two year period. We received our first allocation of uh, just over $9 million in October, last October, and we'll receive our second allocation in October of this year as well. So these funds must be encumbered, meaning contracts executed, city commission approved and contracts executed uh, by December of 2024, so two, two and a half years from now, and then they must be spent in, in their entirety by December of 2026. So we have the proverbial pedal to the metal at this point on these funds. Uh, today, staff is seeking consensus direction from the city commission uh, in re regards to this particular list of projects. Now, you'll notice uh, that we're talking about the projects in general terms, namely cost and a description of the project. We're taking a very high level view. If you want to drill down into some of the details, we're gonna have to bring it back to you for a lot of these projects. So we're looking at cost and project description today, consensus direction, um, proceeding or not with the projects uh, within the list. We'll need to return to staff with a lot of these projects and the details that I just described, and most likely we'll do that during the business planning process. Some of them may be more timely and we'll need to return earlier than that. Um, so high level view today, uh, contract cost and contract uh, descriptions, if you will. As the agenda goes this morning, we're going to start off with Sue Burness, our Director of uh, Communications, and she's gonna talk about community engagement and also who we notified about the meeting today. Uh, and then we're going to go into public input, as the mayor said. And in discussions with the mayor, we could either do it now or we could do it at the end, which might be around 2 o'clock. So do you want to wait till 2 o'clock, or are you okay with... Okay, there you go. They want to do it before then. So our director of finance, uh, Les Tyler, will then outline the ARPA guidelines. And I know the five of you have heard it before plenty of times, but I think that the public watching and the pu public who remain in the, in the chambers might want to understand the buckets and what's eligible... The, the projects that are eligible to be placed within those buckets for expenditure. Uh, each slide that Les is going to bring up depicts the project, the funding source, and there may be more than one funding source for the projects, uh, and the public benefit of that particular project. The department directors will then take the seat where Sue is now and describe the proposed projects, and staff will then solicit consensus direction from the city commission, mayor, if it's all right, at that time. Yes? Thank you. Uh, finally, we'll discuss the penny funds and the general fund as well, because those three funds, we're creating the ARPA fund, the penny fund and the general fund are all very much intertwined, as you know. The CRA fund uh, also comes into play. However, we didn't include it. it it's minimal uh, within this presentation. Um, and I want to, you have before you a packet, and I want to describe the package that you have. Uh, you have item number one, which is the community engagement. This is also attached to your agenda item. But many, many times you ask us to put it before you on the dais because sometimes the writing's a little bit small and you want to examine it a little bit more. So we also have the proposed eligible city projects and the description of that project. It's a longer description than we have in the PowerPoint presentation. And also the Pinellas County uh, American Rescue Plan Act fund projects as well. Well, we plan on, on most definitely tapping into those when we can and if we can. The, um, you also have the uh, Penny Long Range Fund. 
So uh, oftentimes on the screen, it's very small and you can't see it, so we provide it to you in hard copy as well as the general fund as well. And they're all tabbed and, and uh, clipped together, if you will, so we don't get this, this mess of paperwork in front of us for the day. So hopefully we've made this as easy as possible for us to get through some of these very complicated figures, facts, and numbers. And so with that, I think that's it. Oh, Mayor, also I assume that you will, we didn't bake breaks um, or lunch into the agenda. I assume that you'll call those when, when no. we're ready. <laughs> Nobody's allowed to go to the restroom or eat until we're done with this. <laughs> until we're done, right? Yeah. I mean, usually I try to go every hour and a half. Right. So that's yes. what I'll keep shooting for. Yeah. And we will have lunch since we all tend to get a little cranky when we don't eat. So we don't want cranky that. cranky when it goes past 1230. You're calling us cranky? That's yeah. all. That's all. It, if it goes past 1230, that's when cranky comes right. out. And I don't enjoy a cranky commission, so we'll feed yeah. you for ah. sure. Nobody else does either. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so with that, Mayor, thank you. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Can you just, uh, as part of your, your overview, just kind of double down on why we might see something on the ARPA list that we have had in the penny list mm -hmm. um, and, and just kind of the effect of, you know, we have to have these projects done by 2026. Mm -hmm. The penny has more flexibility then to do some, whether it's streets or other projects, it opens up some things for the penny. Maybe you can just talk about the flexibility issues as to Absolutely. why you might see something on ARPA versus leave it in penny. And Right. Absolutely. So, so those projects that, that were designated within penny, a lot of those were, were rolled over to the ARPA funding because the project has already been envisioned by the city commission for, for the most part, supported by the city commission, and we think that we can, we can um, uh, uh, commit to the expenditures very, very quickly to spend the ARPA funds. And then the others, there are others that were rolled into the penny fund because we have a longer period of time in which to put those projects under contract and to spend them. And I think the important, uh, when you mentioned flexibility, com Commissioner, the important uh, item there is that we need to switch out some ARPA for penny if we're not going to make some of those deadlines, you know, some of the projects. We're going to be sure that we spend our American Rescue Plan Act funding by 2026 to be sure. Uh, so we need to always remain flexible as far as the penny and the ARPA fund and the projects contained within those two funds. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Sue. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm Sue Burness. I'm the Deneen Director of Communications, and I'm going to highlight community engagement and communications related to our ARPA outreach. Public engagement and feedback was a primary goal to provide guidance on how these ARPA dollars should be allocated according to the federal categories. We used all of our platforms to promote the three public meetings which we held in November. And as you may recall, these meetings were focused on key stakeholders, the business community, residents, and our not-for-profits. We live streamed all three public meetings and posted the videos to our website and our social media channels for greater reach and for convenience for our residents and business owners who were not able to attend the live meetings. We also relied on outside resources and communication channels to promote these meetings, including the Deneen Chamber and the DDMA. Our goal was to engage the community to help prioritize the allocation of Deneen's $18.3 million federal ARPA funds, which are intended to help our city and community recover from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, which continues to impact us today. We also provided the community with an online digital survey through a third-party survey management platform, which was working with cities all over the country to assimilate feedback from citizens on the allocation of their ARPA dollars. We want to sincerely thank everyone who participated in the meetings, who watched the videos on the website and through our social media channels, and who participated in the survey. And all of those are on our website for anyone to view, and I believe you have them in your packet today. So what did we hear? I will highlight some of the public input, which will lead us into the projects and priorities that you will hear from staff today. So we heard some recurring themes, including support for our local business community and support for travel and tourism, which ultimately supports our Deneen's tax base. Many of the projects you will hear about today are focused on um, economic vitality, which is one of those ARPA um, buckets, categories, which Les will be talking more about shortly. 
Wi-Fi access and connectivity. Broadband fiber is the backbone needed for any city, especially as we strive to provide smart city services to our community. Mental health programs. This was a priority before the pandemic, and it continues today even more so. We'll continue to work with Pinellas County Health to provide the Deneen community with ongoing support for mental health programs and services. Affordable housing, a priority that we see in Deneen, the county, the state, the country. Today you will hear from Bob Ironsmith and who will be addressing some affordable housing projects we hope to bring forward. Support for non-for-profits, they are the heart of our community and we will continue to work with our nonprofits for ongoing support to sustain services to those most in need. So what did we hear from the survey? You can see the survey snapshot on the screen. Um, this is a summary of all the data that we heard um, through that third party survey that was actually managed by Zen City. Um, and so there were some uh, recurring themes there as well. You can see these are some of the top priorities. Uh, in green, um, I believe it says those were the top priorities. Gray was moderate and least is red. So improvements to local water, stormwater, and sewer infrastructure top the list. Keep in mind this survey was conducted when the reverse osmosis treatment water plant was restored and uh, was being restored from the fire and residents were feeling the impacts of hard water. Other top priorities included funding for local nonprofits, increased funding for first responders, improvements to streets and infrastructure, funding for local parks and recreation, specifically noted pickleball courts, and assistance to small businesses. And finally, I want to add um, that our, communi excuse me, our communication methods for this meeting today, we utilized, again, all of our platforms, our website, our social media platforms, media outreach, including The Beacon. Um, the January Your City at Work uh, video featuring our city manager, Jennifer Bramley, who talked about the, uh, the meeting today and what the purpose of that meeting should be. Um, we also included it uh, in our Deneen News, which is our new weekly e-newsletter. Um, and we asked the Chamber and DDMA to share with their members and uh, Economic Development sent the meeting notice to more than 800 businesses on their active business list. Again, we want to sincerely thank everyone who participated in providing the city feedback. There were some extraordinary ideas presented during this public outreach time. Um, one of the things I wanna note that because there are these federal buckets or guidelines, uh, categories that Les will go into, many of these extraordinary ideas may not have fallen into those buckets for this ARPA funding. But we wanna let everyone know that we have listened and we have heard them and we have noted all of these ideas for future considerations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, any questions for Sue at this point, point before I open up to citizen input? Um, yeah. Did you want to go? Okay. Go ahead. Um, Sue, because I did talk to this um, with Jennifer, uh, on mental health, uh, that was something that came up very strongly. And Jennifer has said to me that the, the Pinellas County is really gonna, I guess, run with that and that we will be interacting with them. That's why we haven't per se given in our um, bucket list. That is correct. I'll let Jennifer yeah, add to I, that. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, Pinellas County and their ARPA fund funding, they have two uh, mental health programs that we're going to tap, in, tap into. Um, and also, uh, during this budget cycle, they've committed to additional expenditures on mental health. So mental health is really a county activity and because they have the resources and, um, and, and they have the funds. We need to tap into exactly what, what it is that, that, that we can bring to our residents, either through communication, um, um, through, through whatever avenues that we can to help our residents understand what's available to them uh, by the county for mental health. So they'll, they will definitely be a partner and that's what we felt that they were in the best position to run uh, the mental health to the most uh, people. Yes, we feel it's a communication issue for us more than a provision of those services because that's simply not within our wheelhouse as a municipality. Okay. 
Okay, but I mean, I just did want that explained because it did come up as it, a very important issue. We all heard it, and it is. It figured very highly, and I think that what we should do in, in that regard is, is uh, I'll work with Sue to bring back a communications plan to, fig, to you know, the specific programs that will be of more assistance to our residents. You know, either through the schools or the sheriff's office or through the county or whatever it is and how people can get help when they need it. And, of course, I'd love to see some go to the schools. I'd love to see some avenue to really reach our schools. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, I just had a comment on that. I, I, I do want to understand, though, um, you know, it's an area I'm familiar with when I work for the county. Um, and I know, you know, there's never enough, never enough for mental health, which is true nationally. Um, so I think, you know, we have, we've done some within our um, grant programs. So there's a little bit of ability with what you're recommending there. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, as we move through this, it might be good for us to totally understand. It might mean that we want to, uh, even in the grant funding, um, consider 211 more because 211 is the access point to get people to the right places, um, whether it's mental health or other areas of need. So um, I just want to, and when I look through the county listing, it looks like what they're doing is more in the um, software areas, how to get you know, get people situated um, so that they're getting help to the right people in the right way, that kind of thing. So I just want to understand that so we're making sure we're doing kind of our part. It is, I, I mean, I agree. It's kind of the will what of the county will well, but I think it's also kind of, you know, we all need to pay attention to it. So, yeah. so we just might want to be more educated as we move through it. I appreciate you brought it up, Commissioner Kine. Thank you. I mean, it Vice could Mayor. be more mental health resources to the schools, <clears throat> you see. I mean, that could be, and I know that's with the board. Yeah, I don't know about the school board because, of course, they do. You but, know, that's I mean, I think there. we should at least put it out there. Mm -hmm. What well, if there could be more mental health resources on site somehow? Right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, now it's the time for uh, citizen input. Anybody wishing to come forward and speak to... Um, ARPA funding, please feel free to do so. Uh, give us your name and address for the record, and you will be given three minutes. The clock is above my head. Good morning, Mayor, <clears throat> Commissioners. My name is Susan Klupel, K-L-U-E-P-P-E-L. -E -E I reside at 2308 Watrous Drive, and of course, beautiful, delightful Dunedin. Um, I come here before you because there are certain very... Um, tough issues that are facing the tennis players right now. Um, and we have had issues now for the past four or five years that have been building a real resentment many tennis players have about having their courts taken away and painted as uh, pickleball courts. They feel betrayed in many ways. Um, I brought some pictures with me and I'll hand them to the city um, manage, uh, not city manager, the city clerk afterwards. But uh, they show that there are six to ten people waiting at Virginia on a regular tennis day. You'll see rackets up and you'll say, what's that for? Well, if there's six rackets up, there are six people waiting. If there are ten rackets up, there are ten people w waiting. There's anywhere from six to ten people waiting for a tennis court because we lost a tennis court to pickleball at Virginia. Um, do we want to stand back for the two factions to battle? Because we know all you need is a couple of hotheads out there getting mad and suddenly the police are called and delightful Dunedin is no longer delightful to be around. It's to be avoided by <clears throat> most people. We don't need to have that happen because we have the funds to do something about this. Um, we want you to return the existing tennis courts to the tennis players, but also something that I just got wind of is that all our courts in Dunedin have hazardous conditions. Those cracks that I just thought were cracks are dangerous spots for the tennis player. People fall down because of them. There are large divots and large cracks throughout every single tennis court in this city. <coughs> now, we note that Hercules rebuilt their tennis courts to avoid that situation. And a lot of our people are going over to, to, to um, to, uh, to that court, those courts for safety purposes. Um, I, I talked to my expert about what to do with our courts, and he said, well, the ideal thing is to take, tear them all up, 
because the foundation is inadequate. Um, to put down a new foundation, then resurface it. If you can't, if you don't have the money for that, at least resurface it. So at least we have five years of something better than what we've got. Um, so I also have pictures that show the condition of the, of, the, um, of the courts. I'm not making this up. It's pretty bad. And of course, you would go over yourself and, and take a look. Um, and of course, you do care about the safety of your citizens. I mean, that would be your number one job. And so we ask that you return the courts, do something to repair these courts so that they are safe, put up some screens, repair what needs to be repaired. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Lynn will talk about also the condition. May I approach the uh, city clerk? Sure. Pictures. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Give us your name and address for the record, please. Lynn Osborne with Noe, O-S-B-O-R-N, 671 Whisper Cove Court, Dunedin. Okay, I am also here today to address the deteriorating conditions of the tennis courts at specifically for me at Fisher and Highlander. Okay, and getting temporary fencing for the outdoor pickleball courts at the Needham Community Center. Okay, courts one through four at Fisher have east-west cracking on every court. Okay, in addition, there's intersections of north and south cracking. The surfaces are uneven and bumpy, causing tripping and falling. This is a public safety issue, and we really need to address this. I was playing on Highlander on a court I had never played on, and I went backwards, and the court dipped so much, I, I all fell. And I was like, whoa, look at that dip. So there really is a lot that needs to be done there. Highlander courts have the north and south cracking on all four courts also, and a huge hole on the court where the new net and pole was put in the day after we were here last month. But there's a huge hole there, and I have pictures, and I'm going to be putting these, I have a whole thing of pictures for you to look at, but there really is a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, the city has an obligation to maintain these courts, and we really need to start doing that. Besides the cracks and holes, there's mold at the back of courts three and four at Fisher, and which is posing more safety issues. Could they be wash, power washed a few times a year? Um, the court number four has two large holes in it on Fisher that we players are holding together with zip ties or thread um, that there really shouldn't be holes in our nets that we're playing on. We need someone for regular maintenance on these courts and someone checking the nets and courts. Could the money from the American Rescue Plan be used to fix these courts? We don't need a facelift. Some of the courts really need to be redone to prevent the water pooling and the unevenness and cracking. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The pickleball courts at Dunedin Community Center outdoors need temporary fencing around them so they, so they will be used more. Now the balls go everywhere and no one's using them because they don't want to be chasing the balls. How much would that cost? There's temporary fencing inside the community center. Let's get some for outside so it'll be used. That would be six outdoor pickleball courts available as well as five indoor courts at three at Dunedin Community Center, and two at MLK. We need help now on the tennis courts. This can't wait two years until the pickleball courts are finished. Please don't forget the tennis players. Thank, Thank you. you. And here's the photos. <clears throat> Who's next? Who wants to come up next? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Janiga. I'm at uh, 1107 Palm Boulevard, Dunedin. Uh, first of all, I, I was at several meetings the last 
few months, and I want to thank all the city officials and um, Jennifer and Mo, who all attended those meetings about the restoration of the golf course. Um, extremely pleased that the city is, looks like they're going to invest a significant amount of money in the golf course. I think right now the key issue is what those improvements are going to look like. And um, I'm here really to lobby for a full Donald Ross authentic restoration. Uh, the more research I do and talking to other golf courses around the country that have done the same, uh, the results just keep getting better. Uh, one, of the, <clears throat> one of the ones I had a discussion with on Sunday is the general manager in Mooresville, North Carolina. And uh, last time I talked to them, um, they redid their golf course in 2014, and it was in serious decline. They were losing money, doing about $800,000 a year in revenue. Uh, since then, their revenue has steadily increased. And at the last meeting, I mentioned that they were projecting $2 million in golf revenue for 2021, and in talking to Luke Stemke, the GM, they actually did 2.4 million. Uh, they are showing now an operating profit of $550,000. Uh, prior to the restoration, they were losing about a half a million dollars. Uh, the most remarkable number, uh, they do have memberships <coughs> there. They cap them at 250. He has 610 people on a waiting list to join their golf club in North Carolina. And it's all because it's a true, authentic Donald Ross restoration. And even beyond the numbers, it really is a historic asset. It's really a treasure underneath that ground. And it would be really a shame if we don't bring that treasure back to the surface and polish it up and make it the great golf course that it used to be. And I think it would do so much for our community in terms of economic impact, making us a golf destination, and really bringing that amenity up to par, no pun intended, with the rest of the amenities that we have around here. We have a beautiful community center, wonderful art center, beautiful parks, but quite frankly, our golf course is not up to that same level. So again, I want to thank you for allocating money for the project. I know right now you're just trying to decide which path to go. And I advocate heavily for the full restoration of the golf course, and I'm here to help in any way I can. And with that, I'll sit down. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hey, morning. Dan, man, I hadn't seen you forever. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> the uh, Dan Mann, 1521 Glen Hollow Lane South, Dunedin, Florida. Uh, lived here for, Betty and I have lived here for over 32 years. I'm here today to talk real quickly uh, a little bit about the golf course. And the aspect again is, and give those of you I don't know, a quick uh, uh, summary of, of some of the things I've done. Business-wise, was the regional president for SunTrust Bank the uh, 25 years in, this, in business. The uh, Lighthouse Pinellas, 15 years, president and CEO there. Civic has been the past chair of Ruth Eckert Hall Foundation, as well as the past president of Pinellas Trails, Inc. Recently, there was an article in one of the golf magazines, and it was about municipalities and their restoration. It's exactly the same thing we're looking at. And the gist of that article was one that said, those municipalities that tried to do this on the cheap, that tried to cut corners, they failed. They've not done well. Now, those that looked at it and said, no, we're going to do this properly, those have actually succeeded very well. So I'm very pleased to see that. When, you, when I think back to Pinellas Trails, the very early part, we had a lot of people who thought that was not going to be successful. Boy, I had a lot of conversations with people. Look at it today, a national winner. This is a gem and a jewel for this community. And I would submit to this group today that the restoration <coughs> of this golf course is in that same vein. It will be a jewel in this community. It's former home of the PGA. You look at all the famous players through golf have played there. You look at the surrounding number of people we have in this community and those who flow over to use our beaches. Those are, uh, again, just the the aspects that give this a high chance for success and to grow and grow and be another jewel in this area. Uh, I'll probably, some, some 30 years ago, when I was president of Pinellas Trails and was giving the opening talk to everybody here for the Needham section, the 
this point I made at that time, and it's the same for the, for the Dunedin Golf Course, is build it and they will come. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mike Bowman. Um, I'm going to kind of throw you a curve. I think they both did such a good job. I'm going to talk about something else up here. <laughs> okay? While you're looking at what you're going to do with that money coming in, uh, take a close look at Dunedin Cares again. Just taking a, a look at this, uh, 344,000 pounds of food going out the door. Provided 286,818 meals. From 2019 till today, we have gone up 108% in the amount of food that we put out there. The pounds of food and household goods were 344,181. Now, this is predominantly people from Dunedin. I mean, we get the surrounding uh, areas, but this is the most of it is from them. It's sorry, I couldn't memorize all these numbers. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, we had 7,348 visits from people that needed food. So when we're looking at it, with this money that we're getting, there's a lot of great ideas. Of course, the golf course, uh, tennis courts, everything like that. But don't forget that you've got a lot of hungry people out there. And I know, looking at me, nobody it's <laughs> not, it's not a good one to put up here for this. but. Yeah, it's, it's really an amazing thing that is being done there, okay? And I know you guys have been a big help in it, and we're just asking, let's do even more, okay? Nobody should be in this town without food. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Anybody else coming forward? Um, uh, um, that's why I'm <laughs> looking over there. Aren't you coming forward to speak over there? <laughs> Vinny? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, Mrs. Mayor, can I just say something? I told my two liaisons, best guess, that we'd probably be discussing this between 10 and 12. So I'm sorry because we that's changed okay. the rules a little bit. So George Ann may be coming in also. That's all right. We'll, we'll make it all work. I just didn't want this yeah, many yeah, people no, sitting. No, no, no. We'll be flexible. Okay. Welcome. Mayor and Commissioners, staff, I want to thank you for this opportunity. As you know, uh, along with the Fine Arts Museum, we bring in several opportunities for education for our community as well as tourism, which means we bring in additional dollars within the community as people come and visit our institutions. They go to other places. So not only are we generating funds for our community through tourism, we still provide the history and the knowledge of what we are, what the community are. During the COVID time, we let our staff, uh, again, we kept them on, but we had to close the museum. Throughout that whole time for the seven months we were closed, we changed our operations so that we still can provide things to the community. We went virtual, we did a lot of different things, but that changed the format of the museum's financial status. Now we had to range out and provide things financially that we never had done before, like TV options, promotions, staffing. Uh, the marketing for that type of thing, all of that changed so that we could reach the schools, the families at home, do programs that were still safe and family-oriented as well. Uh, we, with doing that, again, it made a difference in how we operate, how we fund things, and we wanted to provide nothing more than what we provided previously, but we needed additional funding for that. When we were closed, we continued. We did different virtual tours. We did traveling cases, which we went out and bought those things to provide for the schools 
and for the public to use. We did public home schools. We provided things for families that kept their children home or were self-teaching their kids while they were doing that. All this funding came out of our special funds which we had for our reserves. This just brings me to the point that while we still remained open, but not open to the public, we still provided everything that this community needed about their history, their education, and what we were all about. We remind you that we, a lot of ways too, are the central part of the community in the center of downtown. And this still provided a lot of opportunities for the community to learn about Dunedin. And it was very important to see that if we were gone, that that would not be there. We would, it would be a loss to the city, a loss to the schools, and a loss to the families of their heritage. All the Dunedin heritage is with the museum. And imagine closed, where would people go to find out how Dunedin began, what happened to it, where it was, and what all that thing, our website we had to improve. All these funds came out of what we didn't have to use as our usual funding. So we went in to the kitty and used it. So I want to thank you for all the time and things that you helped, and especially the help from the city during all this time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vinny. Anyone else want to come forward and speak? Okay. We will um, move on to uh, the proposed eligible ARPA city projects and initiatives. Um, Les. Yes, uh, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Les Tyler, the Finance Director. And I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew Hansen, who's, who's with us today on Zoom. He's the Associate, Man Associate Managing Director with Widow O'Brien's, who is with us today. And he, we have him here for questions, for technical questions, and also assistance today as well. Uh, I would like to start to give a brief background of the ARPA funds. Uh, some of this we've seen before, but wanted to cover at high level. Uh, first off, the uh, the state and governmental uh, pot of funding uh, nationwide is $350 billion for state and local governments. And, um, and cities and counties portion is $130.2 billion. Pinellas County's allocation is $189.3 million. And our city of Dunedin allocation is $18.3 million. Uh, as as uh, city manager mentioned earlier, uh, we're receiving these in two payments. The first payment came uh, in October 2021, for then that amount was 9.145 million, and the second payment we're expecting in October 2022, and that'll be the same amount, uh, 9.145 million, a total of 18.3 million in, uh, overall. Uh, the funds must be incurred and committed by December 30th, 2024, and they may, they must be spent completely spent by December 31st, 2026. And also, uh, local governments, including our city, are required to have periodic reporting uh, to the U.S. Treasury, and our first reporting will be due on April 2022. And uh, Sue earlier mentioned the, the buckets, and we've gone over this some before at prior meetings, but wanted to go over these again. Uh, there's there's six, seven categories uh, that are so, sort of defined by a, the ARPA grant. The first is uh, support public health expenditures. The second is addressing negative economic impacts <coughs> caused by the public health emergency. The third is serving the hardest hit communities and families. The fourth is providing premium pay to essential workers. And the number five is invest in water, sewer, and broadband uh, infrastructure. And number six is replace lost public sector revenue. And number seven is just general administration uh, for the ARPA grant. And I want to mention again that some of the projects we're going over today could fall in one, one to two or even three buckets, but, uh, but we, we've identified them in the primary bucket, but there are some of these go in more than one bucket if we choose that. And we also, there's also some very clear ineligible uses of ARPA funds in the, in the U.S. Treasury guidance. First is they do not want you to offset taxes. Uh, if you had a tax reduction, they do not want you to offset that reduction uh, with these dollars. They don't want you to spend it on pension funds or deposits. Uh, do not want you paying for current debt service and also uh, do not want it paying for legal judgments uh, and, and settlements. And also they do not want you to, ink, to build up your reserves. They, they want you to spend the dollars you know, by, the, by the time frame, December 2026. 
And there's, uh, there's the final rule for, the final rule for uh, the ARPA guidance, which is sort of, uh, there'll probably be another, another version, but this is sort of the, what they're calling the formal guidance. They had a draft that was put out in, in July, and now, now in, on January 6th, they had a final rule, they call it. And there were a few changes, but the most dramatic change was they had a change to the, uh, the calculation for uh, revenue loss recovery. We've talked about revenue loss recovery before, and basically there's now two options. There was originally only one option. Originally the first item here says perform revenue loss calculation. That was how the original guidance was, was set up, and, and every city and and government agency needed to go through a formal calculation to determine that number uh, on an annual basis. But the, new, the final rule came out with a, with a, a new option, which is which to, to uh, assume standard allowance of up to $10 million without using the revenue loss calculation. Uh, and, and this is great for flexibility. Uh, staff went through and we did our calculation for, the calculations are on a calendar year. We did the calculation for December 20 and 21 and we came up with roughly about $5.9 million in potential recovery with that formal calculation. Uh, we would never get near the $10 million, uh, you know, uh, with, 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 with the original calculation. So this $10 million gives us more flexibility. Uh, these, these revenue loss recovery dollars will not be, uh, will not be reviewed by the Treasury for Eligibility, in other words, they won't, they won't question eligibility with those, so basically reduces our audit risk, which is a positive thing, and also gives us more flexibility to apply projects that we decide to, to the revenue recovery, to, to basically add, add flexibility. So uh, that's one big change, and we, staff's recommending that we use this standard allowance and up to $10 million of revenue recovery, just mainly for more flexibility uh, moving forward. And we, as uh, the city manager mentioned, we have a list of projects that we're going to go through. Uh, that list of projects is, is in uh, item 1C, uh, exhibit C, in your staffing today. And, uh, and the, the total proposed list of projects we have today is $17,785,000. Uh, and the total allocation that we are having, that we have from the, the uh, Treasury is 18.3 million rounded. So we have, about, we have a difference. We have an un, unallocated amount of about $515,000 that we are wanting to set aside right now at this point just as a contingency. And also knowing that we have one project, which is the looper, looper service that, that we have not identified a number for yet. We're still working through that. We'll talk more about that a little later. But we, wanna, but we have $515,000 that's basically not being recommended at this time uh, on the list. And what we like to do now okay. is... Before you go forward, because yeah. I know you're going to go into the projects, mm -hmm. um, are there any questions or comments for Les on, on the various buckets he's just described? I do. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, Les, you talked about this uh, uh, $10 million standard allowance. Um, just for clarification, does that mean that, that we could just claim that without justifying it and we would receive that money and then we just have, then we just have to spend it? it well, it, it means that uh, we, we need we to have, have the money. Yeah, it can be for any project, uh, for, it could be for any project on this list. Uh, we do have three million of revenue recovery that we're proposing that go to the general fund. Um, that that would come off that ten million dollar amount, okay. but it, but it, it could in theory go towards any project that we have on the list today as we move forward. Does it have to fit in one of those lists? One of those buckets? Yes. No, no. This is this this is its own bucket. Revenue revenue loss recovery is its own bucket, and and this this uh, this this new new op new opportunity gives us ten million dollars that we can put in that bucket, and then we can decide. The, uh, which which projects we put in that bucket, and some, so we may have a project that we say is in category two today, but that project could be moved to revenue recovery if we chose to do so, and we'll work we'll work through all that as we move forward as far as which projects go into revenue recovery, but it really just provides us more flexibility uh, for spending the dollar. 
does that change the whole the whole uh, presentation that we had had previously we were trying to fit everything into a bucket no no I, it, it no to me it doesn't at all to me but and the thing is a lot of these buckets uh, a lot of these projects uh, all these projects are vetted with, with, with Bill O'Brien and, and, and we go I go I work with Matt who's, who's on zoom and say okay here's this project and give them all the specifics and then Matt will come back and say well this is this is eligible under to, uh, category two and category three, and then w we basically choose one of those, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, as far as what we're presenting. But qu uh, quite a few of these projects would fall would fall under more than one category anyway, or could fall under more than one category. So we're really not trying to get too caught up in the in the categories because while they're important, it's important it's eligible. But as far as the categories, I think I look at it like we just need to be flexible in knowing that uh, some of these categories may change as we decide which buckets uh, we want to we want to put the projects into as we draw down the grant the grant funding so we have seven million now that do not have to fit in in, one, in, in any one of those buckets yeah, basically right okay, thank that's you. right yeah because we, we, we have the three that we set aside for general fund right. so we have the difference would be seven yeah mm -hmm. Did it? No, thank you. Okay. Actually, that, that was my same question, and I uh, terrorized poor Le Les yesterday about that because I couldn't quite grasp it, but uh, that was my question. Thank you. So, Mayor, may I? Mm -hmm. That rule did change since we did the, the last presentation for all of you, and it's a good thing because it does allow us the flexibility. And what it means is that in as we approach December of 2026, any remaining funding we can roll over to general fund in the revenue recovery aspect. So, uh, you know, we're very worried about being able to uh, co commit to these projects, commit to this program, and ensure all the expenditures because it's going to be a heavy lift. But the point is that what's remaining, if we don't realize any of these projects, we can put into the general fund and reallocate to other projects. Correct, Les? That, that's correct, exactly. And, and that's a good point. This That final rule came out on January 6th, and Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a very surprising change, and, and everyone, and, and it's great for flexibility. I mean, I, I think most cities, unless they have huge revenue recovery losses, will probably op use this option because of just the fact that it has more flexibility. We are continuing to use the buckets. We want to to stay true to the spirit of the ARPA Act and the ARPA funding, as far as the benefit of the community and the capital projects. Yes. May, may I make just a quick comment then about that because. Um, I know there's cities that have received less, less than less than 10 million, and so they. I, I, when I re first read that, I said, "You wow, they don't even have to follow anything here, because it, it's automatic for all." Yeah, of that us. gives them a lot of flexibility if they have less than 10. They, they, the eligibility requirement would, would be a lot less concern. They would still have to follow a lot of treasury guidelines, but it would be a lot a lot less work or, or risk. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, on that same note, and we talked about this as well, if this commission decided to, $10 million could immediately go into the general fund reserves, done, and $8 million could be used for capital. Yeah, we would, the commission could put more dollars in the general fund. We, we would, we'd want to call it uh, revenue replacement for governmental services. In other words, we, 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 we're not building up reserves, we're putting the right. money in to spend the money, and we would we'd spend those money on, on any, pretty much any governmental service, police, fire, and you know, pretty much any, pr pretty much any governmental service in the general fund, except for those el ineligible I walked through a minute ago, would be eligible against that uh, that that, that, that revenue re replacement money. Yeah. Either way, it gives us a lot more flexibility. A lot more flexibility. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so um, in order to be organized, we're going to go ahead and after each project try to secure our comments, questions, whatever you've got with them, and direction. Because there's too many projects to try to go back and piecemeal. Okay, so this is kind of how Jennifer and I feel like it's the best, because you're gonna have the department heads sitting right in front of you if, if there are questions or concerns or whatever. Um, but again, as Jennifer mentioned, this is essentially just, we're supporting the project, it's not the details of the project. We're supporting the cost allocation but we're not trying to break that down at this point because those things will come back to us for further discussion. Correct. Okay. And that would include that if we get something with more detail, we could say, eh, now that we have more detail, 
Yes. Not so much. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. But Doesn't. this is giving, what this will do is give that, give them, uh, Jennifer and her team, the consensus direction she needs in order to do more work to take it to a point. To, to bring it back. Research it more. Right. I mean, because right now the research they've done is cursory to provide us with some numbers. And one thing that, that Les and I had discussed is that we may, depending upon what what happens today, we may come back and ask for a couple hours of your time uh, again to go over the projects sure. and nail them down a little bit more. We can do it either during a workshop because we don't have that many workshop items or or a separate standalone. But yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be follow-up. We, we, we're sure of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Sure. Thank you. So up till now, we've already used some monies, okay? We've dedicated some monies. So at what, at what point in time will we then be beyond consensus? Uh, actually approve, are we each gonna be? Individual, each individual um, project will be the vote. This is consensus to go do the work. Right. So when, when, will that, when will that happen? When each, each one will be brought to us? Yeah. Yes, okay. individually. Yes. And we're going to look at that as part of the business planning process as well. There are some projects, as I said, during our, our, our individual briefings and today that we would like to move forward on. Um, and others will, will roll <laughs> into, the, into the business plan process. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Okay. Well, we're going to go in department order. Uh, each department will give a brief update of their projects. And the first department will be the fire department, and I'll turn it over to Chief Parks. Welcome, Chief. Good morning. Good morning. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for having us. Uh, our first project is our ALS Rescue Transport Unit. As you know, uh, we've been for the last several years trying to work with the county to get to the point where we would be staffed with the county recognized uh, rescue unit. Uh, still to this date, that doesn't happen. Our numbers are increasing, so we're hopeful down the road somewhere that that would, would occur. But what we're looking at with this unit, we would have, uh, as you can see, a picture of the Palm Harbor unit there, the example of what we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at staffing these vehicle or this vehicle with our on-duty personnel. So we currently have four personnel. We have a full shift. We have four personnel on each engine. And we were talking about taking one person off of two of the engines to make up a crew, and we could make that unit available for ALS uh, purposes. Uh, the, this would also help us as we get ready to start if we do get approved by the county, because we would have the unit, we could, uh, we could start right away as soon as the, uh, the county approves that. Uh, backup transport is needed. Uh, we've had a, a COVID, the flu, everything else is going on here. We've had record numbers of calls uh, in the last last year. We've uh, we've been increasing. So the county, the Ambulance Sunstar units haven't been able to keep up with the demand of the transports. So this is uh, it's been laid back to the fire departments to do that. We have in North County, we have a Rescue 65, which is in Palm Harbor, and a Rescue 54, which is in Oldsmar. And their staff similar to what we're, we're looking at trying to do here. And then Rescue 48, which is in Clearwater. Those are the only three transport units the fire department has in North County. So we're, we're looking to have this as an option that we could use, even if we didn't have the crew staffing it that day, that if we needed a transport, we could take the crew from the truck and use them to transport someone from our area. It happened just as soon as yesterday. We had a, a call for Rescue 65 to transport a patient uh, in our middle of our downtown area. So we had to wait for that unit to come from Palm Harbor to get here. Uh, as I say, the similar process currently in Oldsmar, they have a rescue unit that they've had for several years now and they staff it when they do have the, the enough adequate staffing to keep their engine in service and their, uh, their rescue unit. Uh, other departments, Tarpon Springs, Oldsmar, or I'm sorry, Palm, let me try one more time, Safety Harbor and Tarpon Springs have also gotten an SUV type vehicle and they do the same thing with their staffing. If they have the people that they can put in this SUV, they run it as an ALS first responder. So that, that frees up the, the engine to be available for more calls, more fire calls, more uh, backup EMS calls and allow the rescue to take that. So we're not taking fire apparatus out of service to, to handle a medical call. And the approximate cost that we have, uh, we use the similar thing that Rescue 65 has here, is approximately $240,000. And that's our project. 
So, Mayor, the bucket, the category one is support for public health and expenditures. Chief, can you also go over the paramedicine program that's, that's in the mobile command that's in the possible considerations since you're sitting there? Yeah, that's, that's towards the end, but I'd be happy to do that. Do we want to talk about this first or? Well, no, it's we all part have, of fire. We have a yeah, slide. But that's a, I know, but I just wanted to cut. It's not a recommended one. Okay. It's there. It's the only, so go ahead. Okay. The uh, fire community paramedicine program, uh, this, is, this would be a very new program for us in the county. We were, were kind of setting the stage, if we can, to, to get out there into the field and work with a, a co-op. Uh, we've, we've had some conversations with Meese Dunedin Hospital to see if they would be able to partner with us. And what this would allow us to do is get a, a paramedic out to, to residents that are either homebound, uh, been released from the hospitals, uh, that, that could keep them out of the hospital, keep the uh, keep number one, keep our ambulances available for other patients, and we'd be able to treat them on a case-by-case -case basis. So if they need medicines or they need some type of uh, just uh, consultation, we would have a paramedic there. We also looked at the hospitals where we could get a, a nurse practitioner to ride with us if we did do the partnership. So we would basically be bringing a doctor, medical personnel to these people to help them out and keep them out of the hospitals and keep them out of the ambulances. So if I may, Mayor, um, Chief Cepetto, I think, was the first one who, who called this program to our attention. And we did, when I was working for the city of Coral Springs, introduce and implement a, a community paramedicine program. And it worked very well, and it's been in place for, for many years. That said, there is a great deal of detail that goes with this program. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're not, we haven't completed our research yet. I think it's a very good program. I think it'd be very beneficial to our residents, but it's not quite ready for prime time yet. So that's why it's which is why it's not on the recommended list at this yeah, point. Yeah, and I think with that the county was would be involved as well on the EMS yeah. side of it. And I think that the county is going to eventually. It's it's the future. Uh, I'm just not sure it's the future right now. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And anything on the mobile command? If you'd like me to cover that one too, yeah, yeah. we have. Uh, the mobile I'm command. trying to give you a way to get out of here and not have to sit oh, that'd here. that'd be great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have the uh, mobile command unit. We're looking at our district chief vehicle, which is our, our, our we have a district chief on duty uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. And that vehicle we have right now is a 2016 Ford Expedition. Uh, the reserve vehicle that we have for that is a 2006 uh, Ford Expedition. So it's, it's well beyond its years and really needs to be replaced as a backup. So what our options were, we looked at this command vehicle that, uh, we don't have a picture, it's on the slide. When you get to that slide, there's a picture of what we're looking at. But it basically is a Ford War uh, pickup truck, and we have a, a box on the back of it. So the incident commander can get out, he would have various radios, command boards, uh, different tools that he can use to run an incident, uh, be it a fire, an auto accident, a hazmat, uh, any, any type of incident that requires multiple units to respond to. So this vehicle that we're looking at is approximately a cost of $185,000, and we would keep the 2016 Ford Expedition as a reserve, so we would have a fairly good reserve unit to use for that as well. Uh, also, water rescues, I left that out there. Uh, and this, this basically, the incident commander gives them more tools that they can, you know, have to keep everybody safe and the citizens uh, as well. Okay. And that's a picture of, of the, uh, the vehicle there that we're looking at. The Again. box is also is aluminum, so if you want to replace the, the vehicle, you could just lift the box off and put another vehicle under it as you went, you know, years go by. Okay. And this is not being recommended at this time. Not but. at this time. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, questions or comments to Chief uh, Vice Mayor? Uh, you know, I know that I understand why we may not be recommending paramedicine at this time, but tell me about what kind of medical care cases you would be using this paramedicine for. Uh, it basically be set up so that we, we work through the hospital so you could you know when people are discharged and you'd be able to go to their homes. So in case they, they wouldn't have to go to a doctor, uh, if it's a medicine type of thing, we'd be there. Uh, if it's wound bandage care, that type of thing, um, we would be there to be able to assist them. 
and it kind of keeps them in their, their realm, their home, uh, where we can be there, take blood pressures if we need to, that type of thing. So it's instead of flipping back to the hospital, because, right. Right, correct? Well, the whole idea is to keep them out of the hospital, yes. From flipping back into the hospital. Right, keep beds available at the hospital. And again, keep our ambulances available to handle other calls that we may, if somebody decides, we, we hear it all the time, people get home from the hospital, you know, a half a day later, a day later, they're going back to the hospital because they have other issues. So this would help avoid some of those calls. Well, you know, I, I totally understand, Jennifer, what you said, but I, you know, I want to keep looking at it. Maybe it's not the time right now, but it really is very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope we'll, you know, maybe we're not recommending it at this time under the ARPA, but I think maybe in our strategic plan, maybe no one can hear me, um, you know, under our strategic plan or whatever, we put that in a few years, out years, whatever, but that we continue to research that and see how we could implement it. So what I'd like to do is work with, uh, with uh, Chief Zepetto and Chief Parks and uh, Florida Business Plan Initiative and take it in, in pieces. You don't develop an entire program like this in one year. No, it no, needs to I be get the, that. the original investiga investigation into how we implement the program, how much it would cost. Yeah, and there'd be an ongoing cost as right, well. Right, legacy yeah. costs mm -hmm. associated with that as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, I mean, we'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Is everybody okay with that as a future? Just sure, I mean, I have some questions as well. But uh, <clears throat> okay. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, okay, so I'm confused. So are we doing that one separately out of out of this and we're coming back to these other ones that are on the top that he's recommending. I just wanted the fire chief to cover all his fire things so that he didn't have to sit here all day or he could so. So you're asking us just if we're okay about the discussion about that program? Yes. Okay, sure. Or are we just asking questions and then we'll decide that? We, you can ask more questions. I, it's just she asked for something so I didn't want it to seem like direction without a consensus from the entire commission. Mm -hmm. And that's to establish a business plan initiative pertaining to the community paramedicine program. Well, you know, I only ask that because, um, like, has EMS advisory at the county level talked about this, Chief? I mean, I assume there's been discussion. I mean, there's a separate EMS tax. Yeah. And, and I just don't want to, you know, I've been in that seat, so I know that sometimes things, the, the threads start to go, but I think we need to remember our centralization point for this. So I guess... Has EMS advisory at the county level discussed this concept? It seems like a great concept, so yeah, it's not about. It's been it's been going through for years now that that type of thing's been discussed. It's just now we we haven't had the uh, the county funding for that type of thing. We do have some fall prevention uh, monies that we can get, you know, some type of prevention money that we can do, uh, but we haven't done the paramedicine. That's what I'm saying. It's it's we would definitely be involved with the county with this. They are interested in it, uh, and we would have to develop the procedures that we would need to do that's all run through the medical director and i was going to say the same thing mo yeah, yeah i mean that it, it really is a kind it ne almost needs to be a county-wide it's a county-wide because it's or, again it's keeping or the, the county rooms. oversees it and we're a test case yeah to or, see how it works yeah or or, or or we may want to be one of the test cases. i don't know but i know yeah, it's about keeping people out of the emergency rooms taking pressure off the ambulance services all those things so it's a very unified look and I absolutely think we should have it on our radar, but I think it's a it's a county-wide, I want to make sure we're staying in the county partnership loop sure. on this. Yeah. I, I also, uh, f forgive me, but I wanted to make sure we, we discuss that because I'm, I'm looking at each one of these things for legacy costs. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the big things that I talked at, with, with the uh, city manager about with all of these things is always on a legacy cost. What happens after we do this? And I was hoping, you know, that all of ours wouldn't have any, but... Um, just just because it becomes a, a, a taxing issue, shall I say, uh, for us. Taxing, um, that was a, kind of a joke. But, uh. So, okay. Just to look into it from a county perspective, do you have to add that as a business initiative? Because I feel like when it's, I understand you want to have, if you're working on something, it should be written somewhere. I, I right. totally, I, I get that, but I also... I think there's so much more that we need to know before we actually put it in our business plan. Sure, that's fine. I, I mean, mean, in my mind, it's almost a lobbying yeah. effort first. Mm -hmm. So, I, or not, they may see or that. Or not, I just I don't understand enough of what. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Is it good enough for you to hear that we're interested in the concept? And we can start exploring it. That's yeah, and, and, perfect and, for me. And, and not put it as a business initiative sure. at this point, because a business initiative feels like you're going to take it a lot further. Right. That's fine. And, and I, I, know, I don't know that we, we can determine that. Right. Okay. May I ask? Yes. Just, yes, sir. Just to confirm, Chief, you mentioned at the county level that it's always kind of a conversation that's been there in the last few years. It's probably been there at least 15 or 20 years with different okay. medical directors. It was when I right. sat on the board. And, 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 and it makes sense. And it, you can get the feeling, at least from the commission, that we'd, we'd like it to amp up. But can you feel that on that county level, that conversation is a little bit stronger? And do you think if it is, is that just because we're in a pandemic? And if we can get through the pandemic, well, all of a sudden that just becomes a side issue that really doesn't get any traction? And how do you feel about the conversations? I think that the county is always looking for ways to reduce <clears throat> calls on the EMS side anyway and to relieve the hospitals. So I think it's a big issue with the county as well. They just haven't, with everything going on right now, it just hasn't been to the top of the list to, for them to work with. But I see it down the road. It will be a system. Uh, Manatee County has one right now, and they use it. And from what I understand, that's successful. So uh, I think it will happen eventually. But. Mayor. Yes. And, you know, what's interesting about it is, um, you know, is that, <clears throat> you know, insurance will pay. So there's a funding source. But also know at the county level when they deal with just ambulance billing, you know, you Medicare, Medicaid, you know, it's a big deal. So they'd be allowed to look at it. Yeah, but but so in hard. principle, I mean, let's face it, it's, it's great. It could keep people out of the, you know, out, out of the more expensive types of methodologies. Okay. Um back to the other projects yeah. yes ma'am are you are, well I just are we going to go back to the unit yeah. the rescue unit yep I didn't yep I don't want to be out of my turn no. but if it's my turn I'll go um so um <clears throat> chief we had a long talk about this yesterday about the rescue unit um and and you know and actually Commissioner Torga you you said something that was kind of my issue in terms of the rescue unit was the legacy cost so I, I worry when we add a unit that you know it's a creep you know next thing is we need staff for it we're using excess staff that's great but then hey it's sitting there most of the time so now we want more staff and we talked about that great conversation I appreciate your professionalism um, I personally because we do have a system within the county where they look at our calls per day and they make that um, and 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 they decide when we can get a unit through that separate tax funding um, and we're almost there and there's reasons to potentially get one because of not as many units in the North County. Um, and, and I think, you know, you agreed with me that we're not looking to get two units. Right. So to me, it makes sense to kind of play this out with the county to see if we can get our unit that way and potentially revisit that if that's just not going to happen. Um, that's what I would prefer to do. But so that's more of a statement. I guess that's not a question, but I thought I'd just get it out there. <laughs> None of us know how to ask questions. Okay. No, it's okay. I, I said questions or comments because we're not going to come back. Right. It's we're going to do each thing in its own little bucket. And if we're going to finish, I yeah, I, I think the mobile command vehicle is on hold. Um, and I absolutely agree with the special event, special rescue unit. It's fifty thousand dollars. We do a lot of we do a lot of um, projects or a lot of special events, privacy, climate controlled. Fifty thousand dollars. I think that's really good use of the money. I didn't get to present that yet, but you did a good yeah, job. Yeah, I, I knew she <laughs> she went to the pending, and I knew there was a second. Yeah, so, so my I just thought I'd throw was, that are in. Are we doing both vehicles, or are we doing one vehicle? Okay, moving on then. <laughs> now we've moved on. Ah, all right, Mayor. Get all right. this back under control. Sorry. I just wanted I'm sorry. I thought you were done with your stuff up here. I just wanted you to present all your fire stuff. Thank you. So you want to finish presenting on your the other you special... It's net man. Here we go. Yeah. This is a, um, a special <laughs> rescue unit. And the, uh, the purpose behind this, we have a... It's a fancy golf cart. We, yeah, we have a, uh, a John Deere vehicle that we use now that has a stretcher capable on the back of it. We also had a Kubota that we kind of begged, borrowed, and stole from Fleet that somebody else turned it in. So we made that into a stretcher vehicle. That is now died, and we don't have any replacement monies for that. So we looked at this, uh, this vehicle here, and basically it's, it's being used in several areas, cities, not in this area, but in, in cities in the, around the country. 
And basically, we're looking at this for special events. As you know, we have so many special events. We get into Mardi Gras, and you're down there. If you, someone falls over one of the curbs or uh, has a heart attack, any type of medical issues, they're laying out in the middle of the street with hundreds of people walking around them. We looked at this vehicle. It can get them out of that, the climate area. If it's a hot day, it's a rainy day, we can get them into this vehicle and, and calm them down or, or cool them down in order to treat them. So we looked at this vehicle, and basically we're looking at about $50,000 to, to purchase one of these. So, And again, it, it's no more than, like you say, a golf cart, but it would allow us to get into the areas that we need to get into uh, for these events. I have no problem with that. Okay. You're good. Uh, Mayor, if I may? Yeah. Uh, actually, back to the first vehicle. Um, and you, you probably mentioned it in the presentation, but we currently do have the staff. So when we, we're concerned about legacy costs, we aren't out of the gate having to hire staff for the, for the new vehicle. Yes, it's our intention right now that we're, we're going to use the staff that we currently have. We're not asking for anybody else. Uh, so that, that down the road, if we do get the county to support it, we get three personnel from the county uh, that's paid 400% for, for this vehicle. I like that. And we have a place to store it undercover? There's yes. room? Yeah, it would be at Station 60. Okay. And the special event vehicle, do you know whether or not that comes electric? I do not have the answer to that. Okay. Can that be considered? Sure. If we go. Sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Are you okay with the vehicles? Or I mean, where you stand over there, Jeff? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm good with the vehicles. Yeah. I guess, I, how, um, what Mo, of Commissioner Franey alluded to, is that we're very close. How close are we to getting that first vehicle? We've I mean, been close for a long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the county, and I don't know. We're, we're in the budget process. I have to have everything into them on March the 1st. <laughs> I know there's discussions going on as even as early as Friday to know where where we're sitting with uh, with this vehicle. But we come. It depends on how you look at the resolution that the county said. Uh, was it 97? I think it was that we did. Uh, we're at 10 calls per shift for the rescue unit for Station 60's area. But if you look at the resolution, it goes from zero to 10 calls as being an AS engines, which we have now. And then it goes to 11 to, I think it's 15, to get a two-person rescue unit, which is what this would be. So we're, we're at that gray area with the county. It could go either way. The other thing that the county, I don't know if they'll look at us and say, well, you haven't taken the, uh, what we call the 17 and 26 calls, the falls, and the sick person. We continue to respond to those. Uh, some other cities have not. They've chose to allow the ambulance to respond to that, and I have my own feelings that why we shouldn't we should never give up that 17 and 26 but whether they count that towards it or take it away from us i'm not sure how that'll happen so there's a lot of variables right now uh, i would feel more comfortable if we had 10.5 calls because we could see other units that the county has granted that to but because we're at 10 right at 10 they may say well you're not there yet so i, I can't really give you a good answer except we'll know by the end of the budget session here. John? So uh, I'll abbreviate so exactly what this commissioner said uh, for the legacy side, but also doesn't, isn't there a cost savings utilizing this vehicle? Uh, it would cut down on the number of times the engine would go, the wear and tear that we have on the engine. It is the busiest engine in Pinellas County right now, and it has been for the last two or three years. Uh, because the other units that were above them have all been put into rescue units. So it would reduce the number of calls that unit would, would have and keep more units available. It would also reduce the number of calls, um, I think it was 350 and 351 times the engine 61 and engine 62 came into the 60s area to cover calls. Uh, just yesterday, we had 16 calls in 60s area and only nine of those were handled by our first two engine because they were on other calls. So by having two vehicles that would reduce the number of times other people would, would have to come in here. Is there any way you can quantify that in any way? 
Not, I'm just well, asking. I'm just. I'm we're working on numbers. There's, the the county has set up uh, what they call a data driven focus group, and they meet the first Friday of the month, and we have representation on that committee, and they look at all types of numbers. There's uni uh, utilization hours that they look at. There's a number of calls. Uh, there's a number of calls when your other units have to respond because you're busy on calls. So there's variables that we're, we're looking at and trying to get those numbers together uh, to present to the county to, to you know, voice our opinion that we need a rescue. So we're just, we're, we're there, but we're not there yet. So. But we've been, just to interject, we've been there for quite a while. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I want to say the last 10 years, we have been right on the verge and we never seem to make it over the hump. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying, Commissioner Franey, is that wait till we get over the hump and that the county will possibly pay for it or pay part of it. Well, they will. And they why, will. right, they, and they so will. why are we gonna go down that road now? Yeah. I, is that and, what you're saying? If I could, I agree. You just heard the chief. There's a data-driven committee. There's a, there's a process. We have the, the, probably the best EMS system in the country and we have a centralized process. And I think, why would we go underneath that? Let's, you know, let's stay with the process. Hopefully we're gonna get our unit, they're gonna pay for it, and they're gonna give us three firefighters, one per shift, or three paramedics, one per shift, to staff it. And I think that's, we should stay in that track. Um, we can monitor it um, if we just think it's, it's that much of a difference for us to do it on our own, to go off on our own. But right now, I think we should stay with the system we're part of. So Jennifer, from a funding perspective, because we're not going to debate too much here on this. Mm -hmm. um, if the commission all agreed to that piece of it, because mm -hmm. um, I think we're all supportive of the idea and frankly been annoyed a little bit that they haven't just gone ahead and done it because we've been so damn close, right? But... Um, if we all agreed, would you then move the rescue unit like down to the other section? Is that how you would work this? I would actually ask that we leave it here as a placeholder and see what happens as we go through the process. Okay. Because, you know, to the commissioner's point, the county will buy the vehicle, the staff, and the legacy costs. And that's right. really, really important. It is. Right. That's what we so, want. I mean, we have... We but that's what I'm saying. Would you then move it down here and just leave that open money here? Well, the minute we open up the funding, then, then we lose that funding source, right? So we would reallocate it to something else. Unless, you know, you, you would just have us uh, uh, kind of indicate that it's under the line, but that we're going to put that $240,000, you know, it, it, as a start item, if you will, and retain it until we see what happens. We can also do that and not commit it to another project. I like putting it under the line. I, I agree with that. I, I like that. I agree with So that. say it again, so just make sure I understood it. So <laughs> Everybody's just, agreeing, but I, I want to make sure I understood it. I think that we can put it under the line, but commit that funding You mean source. down here? Correct. Okay. Yeah, but commit that funding source and reserve it instead of reallocating it to the to the. Yeah, department. I'm not looking to reallocate it or anything. I'm just saying. Right, and have a look at it again. I mean, we need to encumber it by 2024. So but, well, we have the seven seven million that we can jump on that la almost last minute, right. correct? Yes. That. So I'd leave it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Right. If we're not going to make that that over ten or eleven calls during a pandemic, then perhaps we never will. I mean, you know. So I think that we need to. to and then we make the decision, right? Whether it makes sense as a commission to go outside mm -hmm. of the MS structure right. and just start funding stuff on our own. But right. again. With it comes a lot of extra costs for us. So right. it's just, it does. Just, just my view. Absolutely. Right. And um, but I do think that that additional ALS unit, I, I think, is needed. I mean, when you when you look at our downtown and how busy it is oh, when I, we're in yeah. tourist season. Oh, so. you mean the little golf cart thing? No, I mean I mean the no, ALS. No, you mean the actual ambulance? ambulance. Yeah. yeah. I don't disagree. I absolutely agree. Given the tourism that we have, and I, I, I think that they need to have a formula for that. But mm. that's a whole other conversation that we can't go down. So. Okay, so am I hearing? And I'm and I'm and I'm agreeing with Commissioner Gal about the electric vehicle, if if at all possible. That's for safety, yeah. for yeah. smell, for noise, and the whole nine yards. It's just more advantageous, but it's also okay. Like so I, what I want to make sure is Can I have that a follow up. Ask a follow up sure. question. If we were to go, if if we say within the EMS system, that it's possible that they would not only purchase the vehicle but the personnel as well. To staff it? Yes, that's that's what I wanted to 
to clarify as well, if, if we purchase this vehicle, we would be out there. I'm sure there's a certain time period, but we would get reimbursed from the county. If it was in the same budget year that we uh, we did it, let's say we bought it in this budget year next uh, October 1st, and then we got approved by the county, we would be able to get reimbursed because we're, we have to purchase the vehicle and then submit the refund to the county to be reimbursed. So it would be- But that's only if they approve. That's if they approve it. Yeah, and that's the piece we don't know yet. Yeah. Right. Now, if we were to go outside the system and purchase the vehicle on our own, if it were ever get to the point where the numbers would then justify the vehicle at the county level, would they then support staff? Or because we purchased the vehicle on our own, we would be responsible for the staff forevermore? That would be a legacy. It's a question to, right now there's county funded, there's several county funded units in, or contractor funded units in the county. So they would be, once they get to the call volume, then the county would, would in, in turn pay for the people that are on those units that are required for whatever. If it's an engine, it's one person. If it's a rescue unit, it's two people. Uh, so they would assume the cost once they acknowledge that it met the resolution. So, and then I don't know as far as buyback of that unit, how far they would go with that. But. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here's what I believe that I've heard. I just want to make sure I got everybody's Good luck. wishes. <laughs> um, okay, I think everybody's supportive of the special event vehicle, whatever we're calling that, and we'd like to see it be electric if possible. Correct. Is that everybody good with that as yep. direction? Okay, and then on the um, rescue transport um, unit, we're going to hold that money um, aside, but get it out of the ongoing list until we learn more about what the county's doing. We're correct. We're not going to reallocate it. No, not yet. Yeah. Yeah, good with that. Until we see what the county is going to do. Because I do agree with those thoughts. And, uh, okay. Yeah, and I, again, if I could just reiterate, when I talked to the chief yesterday, we had a long conversation. Chief, you were amazing and professional and answered all my questions. I appreciate it, even though we're probably not completely in sync. We're not that far apart on this, so... And okay. I agree, this is a small percentage of safety um, that we have against this $18.3 million. So not that there's anything necessarily wonderful about that, but but I certainly support safety in, in, in taking care of our of our residents. So well, I think we're we just have to look at it to see if we can get it done another way. Sure. We're excited we get the opportunity to present it to you, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, we're coming up on our hour and a half mark, so I'm going to ask, yes? Sure. Hurry up. <laughs> Chief has no idea I'm going to say that. The only one that knows about this is Mo. 23 years ago tomorrow, uh -huh. I died here at City Hall. Okay. And if it wasn't because of the rescue committee and the crew that did that, I would not be here to stand here. So I just want to emphasize the point how important rescue is. Otherwise, I would have been gone 23 years ago. So I just want to drive that point home. Thanks. Thank I'll you. never forget that day. That was an <laughs> right. and it was amazing. Bob, don't get too comfortable. What I'm going to do is let Georgianne get up and speak so that she can then leave. Unless she wants to stay for the rest of me because we're going to be here for a while. And then we're going to take a break because it's at our hour and a half. And then we'll come back to Bob. Was it the George Ann, we already Everybody's had, already spoken. We already had input. So, so we're just giving you the I'm opportunity sorry. to do that. Dunedin, That's okay. Yeah. George Ann Bissett, Dunedin Fine Arts Center, and a Dunedin resident, 1324 Weybridge Lane. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't get here earlier, but even in the rain, Dunedin is a very popular city. Ah. So I trudged all the way from the parking. I just want to say that the Dunedin Fine Arts Center, the city had been a wonderful, wonderful partner with us from the day that Sid Intel went to the mayor in 1969 and said, can we build on that land? And we have been a partner with you. And we're in full agreement with whatever you all decide. You all know best. There are many, many needs. And this is really a godsend to have this ARPA money. And I, and I have 
great trust in all of you that you'll spend it the best way. And of course, we'd love a little bit for the art center. <laughs> <laughs> Just a I little. Knew she was going to get there. You yeah, know, I would. Said. But thank you all. Thank you for being so supportive of us, supportive of us, and Vinny. Really glad that um, Vinny is with us after 23 years. I have put in 17 years at the art center, and Mo Freeney is the reason I'm there. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay, yeah. thank you guys very thank much. Thank you. Hey, listen, you are more than welcome to stay. I wasn't trying to kick you out. I just didn't yeah. want you to feel like you had to sit here all afternoon. That's yeah. why we tried but, to let everybody um, speak Ken's early. Ken's watching it now, so I don't know if he sees me. We, I planned on watching it through Facebook Live. Sue does such a great job telling us where everything is going to yeah. be. Very good. So I'll go back and listen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all right, so we're, you, we'll take a quick... Uh, Five minute break, and then we'll come back and resume. Cool.
We're going in, in order of the PowerPoint. Yeah, we're in Skinner. Yeah, which is Exhibit C. Why do we do that? Why do we not have the same order as as the list that you give us with the projects? We did that, Mayor, because that order, if we go in the list, um, then the department directors will be switching in and out and in and out. So we're going. I know, but why isn't the, why isn't, why isn't the list just in order by department? So you don't have to do that. Was there a reason for that? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just trying to get in. Really, I mean. No. No other explanation. No. Don't try to make up one, right? Nope. <laughs> I mean, we do, we do this at the budget time, too, and it drives me insane. Well, I think it's, it's strategic. They're yeah, it's to drive the mayor insane so that right? she's mean to everybody, you know, uh -oh. and makes me mean. Well, I just like things that. organized, yeah, so which is what I just did with the chief, trying to think it would make things easier. But I mean, that would be my strategy. I don't know if it's staff's. But yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> Bob, are you, are you Skinner? covering all of your things when you're sitting there, or do I have yes. to bring you back again? No, Mayor, I okay. have two. So. Go ahead. All right. Uh, good morning, Mayor Commissioners. Good Bob Iron-Smith, Economic Development Director, here to talk to you about Skinner Boulevard, complete streets, and then I also have an affordable housing item. Uh, this is something you've seen before with design. It is a very comprehensive initiative. Um, obviously, this is being moved up uh, with DOT. They're going to start being, doing design now. We're looking for this project to start, really, in 2024, if not a little bit earlier. What this represents is a request of $1.5 million in ARPA funds. It is a, uh, a complicated or a comprehensive funding sources. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of, uh, it's a $7.8 million design and construction cost, but 28% or $2.2 million is coming through grants. Uh, let me just go over those with you real quickly. One million dollars coming from Ford Pinellas that the city was awarded in the competitive process, a construction grant, one million from Ford Pinellas. Half a million, 500,000 from DOT for a safety grant. And then also uh, DOT is picking up $700,000 of the design costs. So we got a total there of 2.2 million which is very significant. And not and, all of that was expected. That's correct. Some but, of that is from their infrastructure and ARPA money. Yeah, and I think the efforts, Mayor, of you and the Commission yep. uh, keeping the pressure on to move the schedule up and to help support the project uh, all came into being. We also have $2.5 million in CRA funding that's going toward this project and a million in pennies. So that kind of represents uh, the $7.8 million. This is a project that, uh, you know, I've heard the words certainly talked about this morning. This is a legacy project. This is a safety initiative. This is slower speeds, bike, pedestrian, economic revitalization, landscaping, all of that will go toward this uh, Skinner Complete Streets. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. Anything on Skinner? Um, I have a question. When are they going to get to the, I mean, I know you're working on it, and this is a little outside of the scope of, I'm totally for this, but um, on our the safety. Uh, so my understanding is it's under design right now, um, and the county is designing. In fact, Commissioner Tonka asked me about the, the uh, status yesterday, and so we will uh, place a phone call to county and find out exactly where they are in the design process. And this is the red light, red yes. flashing. Yeah, this is a signal, and remember then the, the, we'll have the traffic circle and the slower speeds in there, which we think is going to really work for safety on this extremely busy crossing for the trail. Right. But so, this is just a preamble, I mean, until we can get – this entire thing done, but right now this is our stopgap yes. for Correct. safety. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. I think. No, let's think, do yes, this. The million and a half that ARPA will do relieves what? Uh, CRA, general fund, or penny? Penny. No, penny. Okay. Well, actually, CRA. Yeah, oh, is yeah, it CRA? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. it'll uh, this will reduce this will reduce the CRA's budget for this project that's by right. 1.5 million. Yeah, well, one of the things that's happening you're going to well, see. That's great. You got see, a lot of pressure on that fund. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, Commissioner. You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, a lot oh, of pressure okay. on the CRA fund. You're going to see a long-range pr presentation, a funding plan by Les and myself at the March CRA meeting. You're going to see we're taking on tremendous debt in the CRA. The recently acquired property, property. four million. Uh, we got two and a half here for Skinner. And of course, we're also looking maybe at a future uh, other parking needs. So yeah, a no, lot no, of pressure. We got plenty of pressure on that fund, so I, I yeah. get it. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Yeah. Okay, that's all I needed to know. John, anything? Uh, no, I, my question was exactly what what most questions. You're in sync okay. today, John. Yeah, we're we're so, right. So. In I concept and theory, everybody's okay with that particular project in ARPA? Absolutely. And But I thought the same thing. You do have a lot on your plate with the <clears throat> four million uh, per, uh, property purchase, uh, you know, we, Skinner, the 
the two million, two point five. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, well, we do, Commissioner. And not to uh, uh, go in too many different directions here, but uh, you know, we basically uh, could have debt. We're going to have debt service probably about one point one, one point two million dollars, uh, which is significant. I think is what I remember less. And the uh, CRA is bringing about one point eight, and then you have operations and costs and leases. So yes, there's there's tremendous pressure on the CRA. To, uh, to do anything future with the capital. So, but we're going to go over that very much in depth in, in March. We're going to meet with Jennifer ahead of time, of course, and we'll go over that uh, lesson myself. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, and the affordable housing? Yes, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Mayor. Uh, affordable housing, yes. Uh, we, we are looking, again, uh, everything we hear in the surveys. I know the city manager in, in her travels and, and mine, and I'm sure the commissioners too, and the mayor, you know, affordable workforce housing is a very big item, uh, not only for Dunedin, but the Tampa Bay region, and of course it's a national type issue. We are again looking at an opportunity to uh, create affordable housing. Yes, we have tried this on a couple occasions, and uh, we have uh, not made it through the lottery or uh, been picked uh, through the competitive process with the state. We feel much more positive about this one, we're looking to work with the landowner there again on Union Street, and uh, he's uh, looking to uh, tie up the property in some type of contract with a developer, and then we're looking to work with them to create uh, family-oriented or senior type apartments out there. And this represents what would be the city's contribution toward going for the sale grant application at the state. Along with that, we're looking to see what opportunities we can uh, get with Pinellas County. So we're in contact with them too. There's Pinellas County Community Development, and there's also Pinellas County Housing Finance Authority. So we're looking not to rely just on the 9% tax credit, which is what we've done in the past, which, where they only pick one in the county. It's that competitive. We're looking at what other opportunities will present themselves. So this is going to be, uh, at this point, you know, a, a, a placemaker contribution toward creating the affordable housing. And you're going to see more details as this moves along. Be happy to answer any questions. That, that, so, that Mayor, if I, if I may add to yes, that, too, we, we need to leverage whatever we can with the county as well. I know in their penny they've set aside, I think, $80 million for affordable housing. Yeah, and I was going to say, which I've said before, um, you know, both the state but the county has such stringent qualification requirements, and they need to ease up. One of the requirements on both ends is if it, at the state level, if it's close to a particular kind of bus service, and at the county level, similar, if it's in the, one of their transit corridors. Well, everybody here has been working on transit in some form or another, right? And we all know, I mean, it's the chicken or the egg. You cannot, you, you don't have a, a transit system that's worthy to be able to make that your requirement. Is that ideal? Of course it is. So it's really incumbent upon all of us as the staff team members and as us as elected officials to be out there lobbying, especially to the county, to say, stop it. Right now, we just need affordable housing. Stop putting ro you know, roadblocks in our face for something that we have no control over. Land. Yeah, it's and where it, where the heck is all the land? I mean, if if you're really going to be doing this, and then that says that all the affordable housing is going to be in three areas of our county, and that's it, and it doesn't give small communities that do have available land the opportunity to do it as well, and it really cuts out North County quite a bit because their major corridors with their Advantage Pinellas plan, you know, uh, are not here. They're down there. So we really have to lobby really hard for the county to, to you know, yeah, excuse me, just get the affordable housing out there. Because it's, by the time you're done with it, it's going to be four years before the thing is built and used. And we need it now. Mayor, can we just real quickly address the, the public transit issue with affordable housing so that the community is aware of what that issue is? So... Um, the issue is, is that if they're going to give 
at the state level, I think I'm saying it correctly, I'm being very <coughs> broad based here, um, yeah. but they want you to be at, what is it, 15 or 30 minute service or something? Yeah, they like that and they like a certain uh, a certain distance from the bus stop. Right. And, and uh, of course the project, excuse me, Mayor, the project we're looking at, Union Street, isn't, uh, it's got a little bit of a challenge. There is a bus stop, but it is down a ways. And, and I think with the and mayor- there's very little bus service, not to interrupt you, but there's yes. very little bus service on County Road 1. Yes. So, <laughs> so well, what are we supposed to do? At the county level, um, they have the Advantage Pinellas Plan, which they have not funded mm -hmm. yet, still. That all got put on hold because of COVID. Um, and likely a referendum is not coming until 2024. And so with their money, they want to be close. They want to be on these certain heavily invested transit corridors, which would combine land use, high density land use with apartments and affordable housing with very good transit service and, and business um, they want ideal. potential. Yeah, they want ideal conditions. Yeah, and so that's great if you have all the pieces of the puzzle put together, but we don't have that. And so we need affordable housing now, not 10 years from now or 20 years uh, from now. But excuse me. Yeah, yeah well said. I, I agree uh, with everything. Um, you're absolutely right. We seem to be at a disadvantage to a St. Pete Clearwater Largo, which can drive me uh, crazy. But um, I think on this one, we're not going to put all our eggs in the basket with the state at the 9%. We want to look at the 4% tax credits. We want to look at what's called, uh, just a term, naked bond issue. And we want to really push the county, and I could certainly use the help that the, the mayor mentioned with everyone here to keep up, you know, whenever you have the opportunity with the county. Uh, we're certainly doing it with staff. Uh, we feel that there's definitely a very good opportunity here. Uh, I tend to be optimistic. I know I've been before you on two other occasions. I don't like to lose, so I'd really like to see this one occur as much needed. And we're going to keep the pressure on. And uh, certainly in your travels, that would help. So we're going to push the county on this one pretty heavy. Because frankly, we lost out to Pinellas County last year through that state program, uh, their project over in uh, High Point, Lillman. They, they, they got it. It was a bigger project. Well, and in addition to all the things I just said, I was just at an update workshop for the Visit St. Pete Clearwater for their strategic plan. And they were just telling us what they've been hearing through their three different kinds of surveys that they did. And one of the things um, was that they didn't have enough housing for tourist type um, businesses. These people are struggling with hiring. As you know, every restaurant you go to, they're short on staff, right? It takes oh. a long time and all that stuff. They don't have hotels, <clears throat> restaurants, anything tourism related. They're having a struggle to hire people because these people have moved on to other careers during the pandemic, which is understandable. It's all great. But to get new people, these people don't want to live here because it's too pricey to it, live it, here, it, even it for the money afford. that they're making. And so yeah. it's a real problem uh, that was expressed through all of these surveys. So you want to attract business that is, um, you know, to this region, it's again, it's the chicken or the egg. You better have the housing for them. Yeah, just to give you a, a frame of reference, uh, one bedroom apartment, eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars $1,900, you know, monthly, which yeah. is just- I can't uh, afford that. It's just dramatic, and that is across the border. Across the board, any businesses I meet with, the biggest issue is what was just mentioned: uh, can't get people to work, and and part of that is. And you, know, you just had so. Mo. You don't have to say who or what, but you just had an experience with that as well, with yeah. somebody couldn't. Yeah, it's take one a job. of our one of our major employers in Pinellas County. Hmm. They were ready to move here, accepted the position, tried to buy a house, forget it. You know, yeah. kept bidding for one. And then the the apartments are just crazy. So they they said, "I'm sorry, I have to back out. We can't. Yeah. We just can't do it." So yeah, I think that's happening over and over. And that's yeah, in all huge. in all it, in all sectors. It right? is. And but the one issue that we have, Mayor, you briefly mentioned it. We have a smaller unit count. We're at seventy. They like to have 150 because they spread out their cost per unit over 150. So when we come in with the 70 or 71, that's where we have problems. And that's what Dunedin's going to be. We're smaller in fill, and that's where we need to say, hey, listen, we have every need, just like any other community. This needs to be looked at very favorably. Well, and that's where the you county know. should step up even more because yeah. 
they tell you we're the most densely populated county in the state, there isn't a whole lot of opportunities for open land to have it. So you, you can't put so many restrictions on it that, you know, because it is going to be that infill type of development. And so those are the kind of conversations we really need to have with our county commission. Well, I think what you're saying is that tran transit oriented development and the land available for affordable housing <clears throat> do not necessarily they don't. mesh. They don't. And the smaller size, that's correct, Commissioner, yes. Matt Vice Mayor, yes. Who I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. Uh, this just drives me absolutely, absolutely insane. It keeps me, me up at night. Um, <clears throat> the, we talk about lobbying the county, and actually we have to lobby everybody in the county. We have to start having serious, serious conversations about multimodal transportation. And it's not all public transit. It's all about bicycles as well and just ways to get around it. And we, gotta figure, we have to figure that out. We have to create timelines on how to get that done. I agree with the whole issue of uh, the chicken and egg. Right, the, the, yeah. you, right you, you, you can't have the public transit unless you have the ridership. You can't have the ridership unless you have the density. You can't have the density without the economic development. So you've just got this tangled web of, and, and so we have got to just commit to it. And it's not just a Dunedin issue, it's a county issue, it's a region issue to have serious conversations. We had a wonderful summit, I guess. It might have been transportation ended up bleeding into affordable housing. Yeah. Um, but we need to have serious, serious conversations about transportation as a whole. How are we moving around? We aren't going to really address the housing issue unless we address the supply issue. And so we can, we can talk about this affordable housing issue, and that's, and that's fine and that's wonderful. But affordable housing is just a one-prong approach. It takes several, several different prongs. And part of that is density, part of that is transit and just e making it easy for people to get around and then the affordability once they get here to find a job. So and, and and, mean, any, anyway, I just... No, no, I get it. And it may mean <clears throat> that the county needs to look at something a little bit beyond public transit. You know? Oh, right. All forms right. of transportation yeah. that look at everything. And so, again, I think, I think where the county was going with having some of these guidelines was, was noble and thoughtful and good. But I think what we've realized now is you're now limiting yourself. Mm -hmm. And you're and while all of that's ideal, you're cutting out all of these other smaller opportunities that you could do like this, especially while all these cities have ARPA money. <laughs> I mean, come on, they should be leveraging that money. You know, hey, you if you put your ARPA money towards it, we'll we'll put ours. I mean, there should be some something there. Yeah, I agree. You know, and Kudos to the commission and city manager. You know, we put our affordable housing toolkit together. You know, 50% density. We did all those different things. So we have our stuff in play. We just need, as you said, for them to look outside the box a little bit. If I may just recap, if, if, if there's uh, going to be, you know, uh, approve, approval for this, uh, this would be something that's a placeholder, and we would wait for the landowner to pick the developer, and then we would look to structure a deal and then work with the city manager and finance director and, and put something together that uh, you would see here, you know, probably in the summer, uh, something like that, or a little bit earlier maybe. Uh, to yep. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. With the affordable I'm, housing? Just yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just had one comment. Um, just, um, I, I just think the other piece of this is that, you know, having projects that we pushed into ARPA frees up some of Penny. So if another affordable housing opportunity comes along, oh. we potentially have that ability within the Penny. What makes, I mean, we've got time limits on ARPA money. <coughs> so, I mean, some people think, oh, you should put all the money on affordable housing from ARPA. Well, you got to have projects to do that. We don't have projects to do that. But by doing the projects we're doing with some of the ARPA money, it does free up pennies. So if an, if an opportunity comes, that helps us to get there. So I just I think it's important to express that this is the project we know about. We're helping to free up some penny. If another project comes out, you know we have some flexibility. So it, it's a, obviously yeah. a yeah. big priority for us. So. I think it's a good point. They do come up. You know things are fluid. So very fluid. Commissioner, anything? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, I would like to make a couple of comments about this, Bob. Sure. Um, I realize that the $650,000 650 number has, has shown up before, 
And so I'm not necessarily talking about whether it should be in this category or another category, whether it should be ARPA money or whatever, because it's, it sits there. And I know we all talk about affordable housing, um, but we're not an entitlement city, and, and I've talked many times with folks here about that. And it seems to me like, th and this is just a prime example of what forward penalysis is, is really all about, and that's land use and transportation. And that's why they don't have PST, PSTA, that's, a, that's public transportation, it's another issue. It's how do we get people where they have to be to work. And I've read some statements on affordable housing from other, from other cities and other, other locations, and there's a quickness to say that they want to put everybody within 10 minutes of, of their play area and their eating area and their grocery area and et cetera, et cetera. Right. A lot of these people are, are moving around. Um, we had statistics on that once about four or five years ago where people were, were moving, working in one location and then moving and then working in another, and we had to figure out how are we going to get them into those locations. So I look at this, and, I, uh, and I've had conversations with, for example, the city manager about this. Um, this is $650,000. It's going to affect 71 units. Okay, now, now trust me, I, I'm just discussing this. I'm not being negative to anybody listening here about affordable housing. I'm not being negative about affordable housing. But it would seem like you'd want to, you'd want to, you'd want, almost prefer to create work, workforce housing. And workforce housing might be much, much smaller in, in size than what something like this might be. I asked people about this on this category for ARPA, and, and I want to give you two responses. One, one from a lady who said, um, oh, that's cool. Uh, what are they going to cost? And I gave her some examples of what you had given to us before. And she said, well, I'd like to sell my house and move in there. And I said, well, that's interesting. I assume you want to sell your house because and she said, well, because my insurances are going up and I'm concerned about some flooding and I don't know if we're getting that fixed and I need to cut back and I want to stay in Dunedin. So there's an opportunity for me to stay in Dunedin and my income would allow me to do that. But that didn't really accomplish very much for us at all because the people aren't going to be able to afford her housing, her house, uh, so she could take up one of these spots. So could we look, could we look sometime at, at getting smaller significantly smaller units, um, and, and it's really workforce housing. On the, the other side of this, affordable housing, we have people that live here in Dunedin now that are beginning to worry about being able to stay in Dunedin. And I was going to come up with a name for that, but I'm not going to at this point in time. Sure. But come up with a name for that. So we've got people that are going to have to get flood insurance, and flood insurance is we all read about that, and flood insurance is going to go up significantly and going to be difficult to get. Um, and the claims are going to be horrendous over the next time period because of sea level rise and or, um, you know, the flooding that we get from the storms. So I'm just wondering if, if there isn't, isn't some other way to get, maybe it's workforce housing as, a, as, a, as opposed to the word for affordable housing. Dirt's just so expensive now, and, and the construction costs are so expensive. I don't know that we alleviate much if we put 70, 71 people in here from a standpoint of workforce or for people uh, that, that still wish to come here and stay here from, from someplace else. It's, it's just a start, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just... So it's a start, but then we then we'd need to have more money than that. And so... Did that, where does that come from? Does that come from? Yeah, I mean, Commissioner, obviously affordable housing is a national issue. I mean, the price of a home now is way over $300,000. Yeah, um, yes. So people are, are struggling on fixed income. So, I mean, it is a huge uh, issue. It is a, it is a no, huge... No question. It's a huge national problem, yeah. but in our state, it's a state problem. And then I come down to it being really a county issue because of, of an organization like Forward Pinellas, where they have to answer this issue of how do we move these... How do we get these people around? They're not just going to stay in one particular area for their work. We found that out in the study that we did. Even sure. PSDA found that out. People needed to be able to get on a bus and go somewhere, sure. and it wasn't always the same place. So I, I, I just wanted to make that, make that comment. Um, as I looked at this, 
there's no legacy cost in this, but the, my other requirement was. Well, excuse me, because I think there's late. This will stay affordable housing. This is they're going to have restrictions with. Right, the, but it's we're not spending. But let, oh. let me just interject here. So Jennifer, really, all you need from us is is to say, look, we like the idea of the 650 because we don't know if this project you're discussing is going to come through or not. Right. And we'll figure out whether they should be smaller units or whether they should be labeled as workforce versus affordable, because there is a difference. There's your density. And, yeah, and all of those things later, it's a matter of you wanting us to know, or okay. you wanting us to let you know that, yes, putting 650 aside is okay, right? The LARPA funding, correct. Right. Yes. So how, are you okay with that, John? No, I got interrupted, so I won't even finish that part. I'm not okay with that. I'm, I, I, I was sort of okay with that, but if you're asking me directly, am I okay with that? I would say that that's not that's not the program that this should go into because this has to be executed by the tw by uh, 2024. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it's another issue that comes out that we perhaps could have used uh, somewhere else. And I thought I just think that the, that the thought process um, for this 650,000 that's been around before it was another. In another, I think it was in Penny before, it was in Penny before, and, and so now it's being shifted over to here. Um, I, I don't, I really don't know the the necessary value of that from, for this program, for this program. Um, but to, to help you, I, just for convenience' sake, I'll go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and vote for this. Um, but the, I was talking again about the legacy cost, and then I was talking again. About the fact that, from my from my side, this is this is affordable housing at this level is really really a county thing, and if we want to work with the county, um, we should use the money with the county and see what we can get. Doesn't ha necessarily have to be built in Dunedin, um, but it, it should be able to service uh, Dunedin. So. Okay, so I I, th I, th I think I understand. I think you all understand uh, Commissioner Tuanga's uh, expressions and. Um, Everybody else is okay with a lot in the 650 towards a project. We don't know which one and how we're going to make it all happen, but it's the idea of it. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Bob. That's it, right, on your end? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. You gave me a list. And... Nonprofit. Okay, we're going to the nonprofit now. Nonprofit grants mayor, I'll take this one. Okay, thank you. Staff is recommending a total of five hundred and fifty thousand dollars for our nonprofits within the city of Dunedin. The um, uh, we're, the application is going to ask if all or part of the funding request is uh, is due to negative impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and there will be paperwork associated with that request as well. Uh, I'm gonna work with staff to set up a program, a specific program to bring back to the city commission as far as expenditure of the ARPA funds for not-for-profit. We're, we're asking for your consensus direction on supporting the $550,000 uh, for this year. Um, did you say 150? 550,000. Oh, I was gonna say. Yeah. That's what Sorry, I did I say 150? I don't know. Yeah, 500. What I heard, but that doesn't mean <laughs> okay. well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm getting old, so I can't see, and I'm starting not to be able to hear. So yeah, that's good. Uh, this expenditure would be over and above the eight organizations, which is 140,000 yes. in your general yes. fund. Yes. So we'll still have that program in place. Okay. So any questions or comments? I have. Jennifer? I have one question uh, because I really thought about this, and um, if if. An organization goes for the ARPA, which definitely it has uh, very specific guidelines. Does that exclude them from uh, then going for the R140 aid to orgs? No. No, I don't think so. No. Okay. So, um, and so that was one of the questions. Yeah. And then we're still going to do the 140, which you already right. said. Okay. Thank you. Jeff, anything on your end? Come in. Nope. I look forward to the details to follow. Yeah, I have. I have, a, I have a quick question. Is sure. is, that, is this a, re a requirement uh, because of ARPA that we ask? Is was this COVID related? Yes. Is, yes. That, yeah. is that why? Because it's that's that? why. Okay, then I. That's good. Correct. Okay. I have no 
So the program that we set up is going to, we're going to have to consider that paper. We'll probably use the same group that we used before, which would be less myself and, and Phyllis Gorsh, although she doesn't know that yet. She's huh. been voluntarily, she's, she's listening. She's so. in the back. She, she, she knows eye. now, Phyllis. I'm for the, the hoot holler back there, but called. yeah, so, so thank you very much. All right, well, I, I do think it's really important not to pit one group against the other, so let's come up with a program that, that is very um, yeah. yeah. non-emotional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is the best way I can describe it because our objective mayor objective there you go okay <clears throat> uh, you got that you'll be back with that thing all right and uh, next is uh, marketing and all that welcome back Sue mm. thank you um, so uh, this uh, uh, proposal or um, request um, addresses marketing, marketing Deneen um, as a destination. So back in 2020, before I was here, um, the city formed a business recovery task force. And the city was very involved in that. Bob was very involved um, with that. And um, the um, organizations that were part of the task force um, included the city, the chamber, the DDMA, and Visit Deneen. And the purpose of that task force was to help the local business community recover from the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so that task force over the past year has evolved, and it is now what we're calling a marketing alliance. The same partners still um, working together, and the focus is a collaboration of these organizations focused on creating awareness for Dunedin, especially to support the business community and to support travel and tourism, which is one of the categories we talked about that is uh, part of the uh, ARPA buckets. Um, so what we have found over this past year is you know, each of these organizations have their own mission, their own purpose, and their own marketing focus as well, um, which are in many cases different. But really this need to come together with a focus, strategic communications plan, budget, messaging, marketing campaign. Um, and so we thought this would be a great opportunity to hire an outside professional, um, hopefully someone local, a marketing firm that we can work with, that we will manage, we will oversee, we will make accountable through performance metrics, but to give them this budget, to give them what our goals and what the mission is, to align a lot of this with Visit St. Pete Clearwater and even Visit uh, Tampa Bay, um, to create awareness for Deneen as a destination. So that means bringing people into our community, hopefully that where they can park and walk or bike and explore, um, but to really discover not just downtown, but all of the areas of Dunedin. Um, and we know that there is continued opportunities for growth and things are emerging on Patricia and 580. Um, and so for, for us to do this effectively, because we are all immersed in our own organizations and in many ways and, and strong personalities and volunteers. So, um, uh, you know, having a marketing firm to help really steer the ship and to put together a plan because I believe what the worst thing we can do right now is just to begin to throw money at things. We know the marketing tactics that are needed out there, but to put them together in a plan where you can where you can really look at your budget, where you can measure and adjust um, it is really the way to go. And to just have that, um, you know, that partnership with a professional marketing firm. So that really is. So the public benefit, as you can see, um, is the economic vitality, enhanced revenue from travel and tourism sales and the tax that we get that ultimately has the potential to reduce our um, property taxes or keep them maintained. I shouldn't say reduced, maintain, not raise. I think it's important also that you share with the public, and the, I know the commission already knows, but um, that whatever marketing plan, whether you create it or a professional creates it, uh, the various organizations that are part of this alliance all contribute towards those exactly. efforts. It's exactly. A, it's a coalition. 
It is a coalition, and, and that is the plan right now. We are all contributing our own funds to this plan. Um, this would really just enhance it and be able to help us do a little more. Honestly, $100,000 in the marketing world Not is nothing. Um, but it, it really helps provide that foundation, and then the organizations will continue to contribute um, every year to this effort. Can I um, ask? Yes. I think it would be really good, Sue, if you would go, if you could go ahead, please, and enumerate the entities that are involved under this alliance. Yes, that would be the Deneen Chamber, mm -hmm. the DDM, DDMA, the Downtown Deneen Marketing Association, the City of Deneen, mm -hmm. and Visit Deneen. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions, nope. comments? Yes, ma'am. So, um, a fear of sounding naive, I just need to ask a couple of questions. So, we have Visit St. Pete Clearwater, who gets bed tax to do all kinds of stuff, okay? And I know we're just a small part of that in how they market, so, um, and maybe you can comment on that. And then, and, and, and I know we have a lot of struggling places too, so I don't want anybody to misread this, but lately I go into all our places downtown and it's like, best year ever, best year ever, best year ever. And then you follow social media and people are like, we got lots of tourists, you know, and I get it. I mean, tourists are what we want our tourists. So I guess my question is, why? Do, do we need it? Because we seem to be, people seem to know. Um, but maybe I'm missing something and I want to make sure I understand and the public understands. Mm -hmm. You know, I, that's a really great, great question and a great comment because I see those same um, comments on social media, you know, where people say we have too many tourists. You know, you've got a seasonality here that maybe isn't as strong as some areas um, on the Gulf Coast, uh, say Clearwater, for example. But you've got constantly new people. And you know what? It it isn't um, known by everyone. You know, you have a lot of people that come in to, to see the beaches, or they may come in to, you know, vacation at, down in Siesta Key or Longboat Key. Um, Deneen is a great day trip, right? It is a great, or a weekend trip. And it really is, you know, marketing is creating awareness. You have to continue to create awareness, otherwise you're gonna be left behind. Um, there are a lot of other options that people have here. So um, we have a great story to tell. We have have so many great attractions here. Um, the Beatles Museum is going to have a new location. You know, that is a, a huge attraction. Our arts, our culture, that aligns with St. Pete Clearwater. And we know that that is part of their marketing focus. So in many ways, we will be in alignment with them. We will take a lot of what they do in terms of marketing and where their strategic emphasis is, and we'll align it where it makes sense for us. It doesn't make sense for us for everything. Thing, but we'll also work with them to help tell stories through media, through national media, because they're looking for that support. Um, but there are, you know, we still need to, we need to maintain a presence because there's a lot of other people that, uh, a lot of other cities, a lot of other um, areas of Florida that are all looking for the same dollar as well. Great answer. Great answer, and I appreciate it. And uh, I think that the seasonality issue is, is right on because obviously that keeps our downtown vibrant. And I also like, you know, brought, you know, brought up 580 and Patricia and, and being able to highlight some of those areas that are great, but people absolutely don't always know about that. Alt-19 so Great as restaurants, well. Alt-19. And um, so uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have, yeah, I do have some. Um, so we have a marketing plan. Usually in a marketing plan, we put down some of the costs that we're requesting to meet the, the requirements and the objectives. Um, so coming back just to the basic questions, we have the organizations you mentioned, of which all of which I fully respect and, and am very well aware of and spend time with, um, great organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the entire cost of, of the marketing plan, not of the execution of any pieces of it? Who else is part? And let me go just one question at a time. Sure. 
So is, uh, is there more money going in to create yes. this plan? Yes, yes. This, is, this right now is a budget, right? This is, we had to come up with a budget. We have to do an RFP for an agency, an agency partner. We want to pick the right partner who really understands um, what our goals and what our vision is and really understands the market. You know, one of the great things we have here is all of the marketing data that we have from Visit St. Pete Clearwater. They have a ton of data. And so data helps drive a marketing plan. So not only are we looking at this pocket of money, right, but we each are contributing, each organization. Um, in fact, we are still looking at money that we are, have allocated, the city allocated from 2021. We, are, we, have, we have encumbered that money into 2022 with additional money that we are looking at supporting this effort. And so is the chamber, so is DDMA, and so is Visit Dunedin. So everyone is contributing. This is just a piece of the pie. This helps us get, with the money that we have collectively, we could do tactics. We may not be able to get, what we really need is that marketing plan, and we need that strategic um, process. Uh, who's who's going to pick this organization? The, the alliance will. The alliance is going mm -hmm. to pick it. Yes, that's the function of the alliance. And so how much money is going to go towards this selection? You know, it won't go towards the selection. The, um, the selection will be an RFP process. The, the, the um, part marketing firm will come up with a plan, and, they'll pr and they will work with us in our budget, and then they will develop the marketing strategy, which will be the tactics. One of the great things about working with a marketing agency what you really want to invest in is the plan, and then then you are working with them. They will get um, basically when they when they um, when they buy media. If they're buying digital media, let's say throughout the Tampa Bay or say the Orlando market, they're gonna they're going to get um, they get that at reduced cost, and then they get the commission from that. So they will factor in all the details in a plan, but we have to first start with the RFP which is what we're going to be looking at a budget and looking at um, the strategy and the tactics that will be part of that. I'm very familiar with an, with an advertising or promotion agency doing that, but not with the person creating the marketing plan. But let me come back to this then. So that's going to be picked by the alliance. Um, who's paying how much? Who's paying how much what? You're, you're saying that you want to, what is this, what, what's the request, what is the request for? $100,000. What is $100,000 going to get us? A professional. It depends on what the marketing plan is. Um, I worked for uh, 15 years in marketing and PR and advertising agencies. It all depends on what the plan is. It all depends on what the client is. It all depends on the market that you're looking at. So our goal is going to be uh, creating awareness for Dunedin based on the um, marketing that aligns with St. Pete Clearwater. So we know where their target market is. We know it is um, a lot of these are drivable cities in, in Florida. So we're hoping to get one, number one, a plan. So a strategic plan, which guides us. Otherwise, you waste a lot of money just putting money in all kinds of opportunities that may not be the best opportunity at the time. And then we're going to get a media buy. We're going to do digital marketing. We're going to do social media ads. We're going to do um, print ads possibly in um, the uh, airlines, the Allegiant, the Sunseeker, um, the uh, Visa Florida, the F Visa Florida guide. We aren't doing any of that right now. And there's been a lot of interest by the chamber, by the DDMA, by Visa Dinning to collectively do this together, not separately. So that's the Some other. The alliance does that already. So, but, but no, no, the Alliance is trying to do that. We just haven't really gained any traction. We haven't spent a lot of money. There hasn't been a plan. So a lot of this is just really getting the parties together to organize and to focus with strategy and then the tactics follow. And measurement is key. Let's take the word strategy out of all of this. You're asking for a marketing plan. So somebody's going to create, you're asking for somebody to create this marketing plan. Is that what you're asking for? You know, I, I appreciate that comment, but it's hard to remove strategy from a marketing plan because it is all about strategy. So, yes, we collectively are going to work with a marketing agency partner to come up with a marketing plan based on strategy, based on audience, based on marketing goals. 
You know, I have one little, uh, John, I'm sorry, am I, are you through or am I interrupting? Uh, you go ahead, please interrupt. Well, I just want to ask one thing. You know, I've, have we done that uh, Florida on a tank full? I love Have that. we done what? It's called Florida on a tank full. It's, it's all about day trips, and it's just wonderful, the things they come up with. It's, I don't think that we've been, I, I watch it all the time. I don't think that I we've love been, it. We'll, we'll reach out no, to them. Oh, we should. Them. Yes. That would be great. Yeah. That sounds like a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, my comments and questions are, um, and I remember, 10, 15 years ago working on this, um, and it just never quite got into fruition because we were in the recession and whatever. But it was always this idea when Visit Dunedin was created that you would have this collective pool of money, that the city wasn't taking on all the costs to market itself, and that we weren't... Um, competing with Visit St. Pete Clearwater and, and and how to draw all this together. And we talked about it that back then and never did it. This idea, which organically got created again, because it's a good idea, um, when the alliance, when the task force was, was brought together. So what happens is you've got DDMA that does marketing for the city we got us that do, does some things periodically. You've got the chamber that's doing the allegiant thing. Um, and then you got Visit um, Dunedin who's d doing the book and, and they're doing all these things. But there is no, no one thing is bringing all these groups together for, for two things. Making sure that the message is coordinated. You know, if there's a brand that the brand is consistent Right? right? And the messaging is consistent. There's nothing pulling all of these little efforts together. Um, and as we all know, pooling money together, you get a better um, product. So when you have these really, you know, what they're doing is all small cost items. And Visit Dunedin will continue to try to get money from local businesses as well. So that's but when you have maybe some of the larger cost items, a $10,000 or $15,000 item like the Allegiant magazine or whatever, it's best when everybody can pool their money. So, yeah, we're going to have an annual budget. We don't know what that's going to be yet because we haven't seen the marketing plan. But this will – now you don't have four organizations arguing and debating on we want to do this magazine and this, that, and this, that, and this, that. I'm not saying that that's what it is all the time. I'm just saying you've got a professional that's giving you something that helps guide, and it brings everybody back to the strategy, you know, of, of what our message is. The great thing about Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and again, going back to this, uh, the strategic plan that they are working on, and as, as uh, um, Sue said, you know, right, their big goal right now is, uh, you know, arts and culture. The arts and they want to get outside of just St. Pete. I mean, they really want to focus countywide. But also, one of the biggest things they heard um, from their partners, which partners would be restaurants, hotels, cities, those are partners, um, was that they wanted Visit St. Pete Clearwater to focus on um, areas outside of St. Pete and Clearwater. To remember, there's 24 other areas. Not all areas are maybe destinations, but you know, they've got a top 10 list, and so they they really want to do that, and they will really look at our marketing plan and and advise us, good, bad, or indifferent. So, I frankly think it's a great investment, and and it brings four organizations together and it pulls four organizations money and it directs it in a way that can really benefit us. They're going to do the marketing anyway. So I don't think it's about adding tourists, if you will. It's about making the messaging more cohesive, something we can be proud of, you know. So, I mean, it's going to happen one way or another. 
That right. is key, really. Oh, absolutely. That, you know, the message and the creative is key to this. It isn't just a marketing plan, but that is part of the plan, is you have to have the cohesive message. You have to have the right creative. Um, you know, when I first arrived here, even before I did, I think I even mentioned this in my interview, um, is that there are just so many brands out there with Dineen, and it's confusing. Even on social media, you know, we are constantly tracking down, like, who started this, you know, social media Instagram handle and and uh, and and you know and I really think one one of the things we all want to strive for at some point and we're not there yet because this is just the foundation that we're beginning to pull together is that unified community brand is there an element that we can you know all use that unites us and a lot of cities have done that big cities and small cities have done that so that is another goal that we, we all have talked Talked about all of the organizations at the table through the alliance have talked about this, um, and so we don't want to use the city's marketing or the city to, to do this. And and the chamber is really marketing to the business community, right? That's their target. So that is what is going to be a very very uh, smart and very well planned in this is to really have it focused on. Dunedin as a destination, as a place to come to enjoy the day, the weekend, um, the amenities we have here. And again, not just downtown. And I've, I, I have gotten to know enough of the businesses here, and I've been able to you know, interact with them and even working with economic development to know that they have this feeling and this, you know, this, this um, sometimes a criticism that we focus so much downtown. And yes, downtown is amazing, but we have a a lot of great things happening that we just need to highlight those, and we can do that through, um, you know, through marketing, through digital, through PR, through all of that together collectively. Could maybe we could call it Dunedin done in a day? <gasps> Ooh. That's so can I, can I come back and ask some? Absolutely. Would you tell me what? $100,000 is going to go for? You know what, Commissioner? I can't, to be honest with you. I, I All the things I just talked about, um, it really depends on, you know, uh, that's where we start with an RFP. The agency will come to us and say, if we say this is our budget, this is our goal, this is our market, and we're looking at a two- to three-year plan. So knowing that we're going to probably add a lot more money than $100,000 into that at some point throughout that two- to three-year period, and that's money that is contributed from the other partners in the alliance. This, so, you're talking about agency. Is this a marketing plan agency, or this, is this an advertising this agency? This would be a marketing firm, an advertising agency. I, I, I want to call it a marketing. Today, uh, a, an agency that I would look for, um, and again, I... You know, I worked on the agency side for 15 years, and I've been the client as well. And I've worked with some amazing, and I know, and that's one of the things I feel very confident about in this ask, and I think the Alliance partners feel that way as well, is that you, uh, you have someone who can help manage. You have to manage an agency. You have to guide them. You have to make them accountable. So the agency, what I would be looking for out of this budget is, yes, a marketing plan, Marketing tactics, creative, that would include this messaging, the look, and the plan would be a plan that would, 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 um, would focus on the different audiences and, the, and the, really the goals of, of what the alliance is trying to do. And we're going to do that together. Um, the alliance will, will prove everything that we do. They'll prove the agency. They'll prove the plan. Um, we will have, you know, whether it's monthly. I mean, I like to do monthly reporting with the agencies that I've worked with um, in the past so that we know where we are because things shift so fast today. And you need to be responsive and you need to be flexible. Mayor, as you're attempting to run this meeting, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and because of my respect for um, the, the alliance that's involved in this, I'll go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and accept this um, at this point in time. I, I haven't got my answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor I do have one follow-up question, sure. I guess. Is there any type of return on investment? I, is there any, what, you have measurements out there that... I love that question. 
uh, commissioner. So one of the things that um, would be part of the RFP is um, is the agency needs to put together, you know, what the ROI would be. What 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 are what are the benchmarks? What are the measurements we're going to be looking for? So again, this is this is an awareness campaign, but we can measure. There's still we can measure through traffic. We can measure through you know whatever those metrics that ROI is. If it's more. Um, sales, you know, related to the marketing, whatever those metrics, those are all part of the plan. So, yes, always ROI. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the $100,000 towards um, a marketing plan that, of course, will come back to us at some point with, with more detail. Yes. Right? You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as uh, Sue stays with us for the next 25 years, oh, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> okay. And you guys are okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank I, you, Sue. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. All right. So the next thing is the Clearwater Ferry Service. Good morning, Mayor, City Commissioners, Vice Mayor, Vince Gizzi, Parks and Recreation Director. Uh, I have five projects this morning, so I'll start with the Clearwater Ferry. Um, this contribution is to include has been included in our business plan and budget for two th for 2023. 55,000 of ARPA funds being recommended for one year contribution towards the ferry service. 50,000 years also included in the general fund each year through fiscal year 27. Um, I did talk to Les a little bit yesterday. So I'm not sure if that 50 becomes 55 each of those years as well. Yeah, that but will it's uh, 55 one contribution from the ARPA funds. Okay. This contribution will assist in continuing the ferry service round trip from Dunedin to Clearwater downtown and beaches five times a day, possibly for from four days a week to seven days a week. And um, this is a great opportunity for additional uh, transportation. So if I can give you all an update. Because as you know, I sit on the Waterborne Transportation Subcommittee. Um, and unfortunately, our meetings have been running long, so I haven't been able to give you updates on this kind of thing. Um, so through Forward Pinellas, we're trying to figure out how to get the infrastructure grant money um, for the for additional boats, OK? I mean, the, the ferry's running now. It's just running on demand. It's just, it, it, it's not on a regular schedule. And so, but they need new boats, and um, they want to up the times in Clearwater, because we're not just looking at Dunedin. Uh, they are making a plan for both North County, us, and, uh, and South County, I think Madeira, Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach area. Um, and it would be phased. And the battle right now is the funding sources. At first, uh, there was a discussion about buying these really, really large ferries. And, you know, I think we all kind of came back to earth and said, why would we do that? Why would we not do some ferries that are a little bit more like what they already have, maybe a little bit bigger than that, and, and prove our worth, right, to, to the electors, to the our partners and all of that so so the cost has significantly come down it's a matter of who pays what because there's the capital side which we think we can get from uh, any number of sources okay I won't even go down that road it's the operation side which is what this 55 is for so the 55 number is a target it is what they asked for six months ago or whenever right um, we hope that will remain the number. We don't know that. Um, it's a matter of who else is paying what and, and if we can get the county um, to commit to paying some operations annually. <clears throat> and so that's our battle right now. We don't have a referendum, right? So it's got to come out of their whatever fund, I don't know. But um, we do have lots of ideas on how to make this push this forward and there's a lot of lobbying efforts going there's a lot of things I'm not saying I just want you to be aware of what's happening with this I think it shows good faith 
that we have the 55, it doesn't mean we're actually going to write the check is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We've got to just, it, it just shows them, and that's what they wanted to see was a five-year window of some funding that we're committed. But that's all it is at this moment because we're still getting the ferry. It's just on demand. We're just not paying them. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. All of that kind of updated information. I think I have a waterborne subcommittee meeting in a couple of weeks, next week or the following week, and I'll be able to give you the full board, forward Pinellas board hasn't seen it. And of course the county commission hasn't. They've seen pieces of it. They haven't seen the whole plan. So we're still in its infancy stage. Do you guys meet on the water? I mean, do you are you on that little pedal thing where No, we uh, meet at we meet at the <laughs> We meet at the gardens down there. <laughs> Mayor, did yeah. you say we're not that they're no longer running this? It's only, only on demand. Is that what's it's, happening? It's now? been that way since COVID. Okay, so th that it's is it's coming, but it's on, it's on demand. You know, so they do. Sometimes they come up on their own because they can see some reservations, and sometimes they don't. But it. So the funding that's in place is only for that to occur. No. Oh, okay. That's happening without the funding. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The funding that's in place is kind of a placeholder to say we want to participate in this hopefully new program that makes them come permanently. Thank you. That's what that's so it's a placeholder at this point. No check is being written at this point. New program and still to be defined as yes. what 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 is it that's coming yes. here and yes, and likely four days a week, likely regular service, so whether they have reservations or not. So I'm 100% good with leaving this earmarked and hoping it comes yeah. to fruition. Thank you. You guys okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John, you okay? Yes, okay. All right. Ferry is good. Okay. The Highland Park Aquatic Center, uh, our current pool, as you know, was built in 1977, 45 years, 45 years ago, and has exceeded its useful life. Staff is presently working with a consultant firm, Borelli and Partners, to develop a master plan for a new aquatic complex. Components would include a main pool with possible zero depth entry, a bathhouse with restrooms, offices, classroom, mechanical, and storage facilities. Other aquatic features recommended through two community surveys and discussions with our city commission and consultant would be slides, sprays, wellness pools, and a lazy, lazy river, and those were also the top responses on our survey. Um, recommending four million from ARPA funds, three million from penny funds, totaling seven million. And based on the cost of each of the aquatic features available funding, staff may have to prioritize these other features or additional features that I mentioned, or I know you don't like to hear this word, the project might need to be phased in. Okay, uh, I'll start on this end. Just trying to move around. Okay, John or me? You. Okay. Um, well, I'm supportive of this, um, and I think um, I don't really have any questions. We've talked about this a lot. I guess the only comments I want to make is make sure, you know, the public understands why I think it would be on ARPA, uh, you know, the ARPA money versus something else, which has been in the penny money. Um, uh, ARPA money gives us the ability to maybe not have to phase it, which will be more cost effective. Um, it's a time ready project that we can relieve our, the pressure on our penny, but at the same time have a time ready in the ground project that can actually be done um, by the deadlines of ARPA. Um, it's, out, uh, it's outside, it's wellness, it's all the things we're trying to be now, I think, as a nation. Um, and, and again, ARP is ultimately economic stimulus, and it's a it's a building program. So I think it's actually really appropriate for it to be here. It's something we we're way overdue on redoing at the pool, so <clears throat> it's ready to go. And I, so I think it makes sense for it to be here. I don't have any questions. I, I I'm I'm in favor. Commissioner Twenga. Thank you. So this is actually the number one project for for the ARP uh, money. And, um, and I've seen the presentations I've been through, as, as you were talking previously, all of us have been through the presentations, et cetera. And so um, I'm, I'm gonna just applaud the fact that 
that it was put together, um, staff, from the city manager on down, putting the program together. It's a it's an asset, tremendous asset. Um, it accounts it accounts for roughly 25 percent, 20 percent of 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 the entire program from the ARPA. But regardless, it's an asset. So where the money comes from, it's if you're going to have a pool here, it's going to come from some place. And so I, I'm supportive of how you've done that. And uh, and I'll and I'll leave it at that. I, we will obviously have to have to be doing some some. You use the word. I won't use it because you said people don't like to hear it. So seven million dollars is a, is a big number, but uh, it probably will not do everything that everybody wants it to do. But it'll give us a nice pool and a good plan. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Well, um, of course we did sit down with this and. Um, you know, it, it was pretty broad, um, the amount that could be spent. Right. I mean, this is seven million, but you it know, if you added, 13. it was going up to 13. And to 13. 10 to 13. So, you know, I, I am all in favor of this. I just don't know, my question was, do we have 13 million? I mean, that was my question. And everybody said, no, we don't have 13. The answer is no. Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. so, you know, I sort of take up for Vince in some ways. There may be some some of the really um, uh, extraordinary water slide lazy river that we can't immediately do. And uh, I know that there was a really high... A uh, group of people that do want these kind of amenities. I understand that making that amenity, giving those amenities, uh, would add immeasurably. But you know, it comes back down to how are we going to pay for it. So, you know, you have given us the seven million, and said, you know, at least, you know, you can get the pool facilities, the restroom. They have bathrooms, you know, they have very little office space, storage space, and then you have all these kids that you're going to have to, you've got to have a place for them during storms and whatever comes up during um, your camp season. So, you know, I'm for doing all we can. I just don't know how we can do 13 at this point. I, you know, I, I just can't wrap my head around that we could <clears throat> bite off 13. Well, again, that was a, once again, it was a range to do it. It was a range. Between and, 10 and 13. But do you really think that you can do for seven the aquatic features also? No. Okay. I mean, I. The, 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 the bathhouse fell into that, the main pool with zero depth en entry, most important things. Uh -huh. I've got to be able to do the lap swim and teach swim lessons. Um, once you start getting to the real fun stuff, mm -hmm. uh, the spray ground might have to remain outside mm -hmm. until we, can move we, it. Can, we could move it or pay to move it. So um, some of the fun amenities uh, might not make the cut. But we absolutely have to make the cut with things that there just isn't any of now, office, uh, yes storage, uh, a place for kids Refuge when for the kids to go to and yeah, I mean, you can also do birthday parties and other things in those in those rooms. Um, and and a, isn't a portion of it to absolutely make a, a better um, food place? Concession area. Concession. Very very popular. Again, once you have if you have the amenities, you get people staying longer and then you do better with your concessions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen around the the state as we've gone to different facilities. Okay, so I guess the bottom line is, do we have any more money in ARPA to add to this? I, I know it's not gonna be 13. N not in ARPA itself. If, if we are to find any additional funding, it would most likely be in Penny. Okay. Okay, but I am all for it. We're way past due. Does <clears throat> it, will this, Seven also pay for that extra littler pool that's for smaller children that's over on that side. Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and, and look at all the numbers. Again, we, we need to get back with our consultant with the information that we've gained. 
um, from meeting with you from our survey. Of course, we still want to get out to the communities, see what the highest priorities of our community are. Absolutely. 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 Um, not Jen you. No, I was talking to her. No, Jennifer. Sorry. You want me to zip? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> she had something to add, and I, I wanted her to wait until we all get done talking first. <laughs> it's like she's going to. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Not she's you. she's, she's looking at me. Staff. Not you. <laughs> she's telling me That's to shut the heck up. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's courageous to do. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> well, anyway, those are my comments, and I wish we could do everything at once. I just don't know how we're going to do up to almost $13 million. Commissioner? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, this has been certainly part of the conversation since I came on the, the commission and certainly years before that, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I am trying not to be the curmudgeon that says I grew up on uh, Virginia Street Pool, and if that was good enough for me then, it's good enough now, uh, which by today's standards would be a bucket. Um, for anybody who remembers the Virginia Street Pool. Oh, I went there every weekend. Right. Ev rode my bike there every weekend. Where was it on Virginia? I do not. Where the, where the admin building is, the fire admin building is now. Behind where the community gardens is? is no, it's right up front. It's where the building is now. When did that go away? Um, 40 years ago when this new one was built. Early 80s, early 80s, late 70s. I mean, probably 79. Is it 79 it, our pool was built? Uh, yeah. 80. 77. 77. Yeah. yeah, I used to sneak in that one, too. And, huh. uh, <clears throat> and, and so I certainly understand times change. Just and saying. Amenities change. Um, I also understand if you talk to some developers on why their apartment complexes have fitness centers that nobody uses or granite, granite uh, countertops that, that eh, at the end of the day they can have or not have. Uh, it's because even though people don't use them, that's what they want in their apartment complexes. Uh, I understand where this might fall into play in communities as well. People wanting to move here uh, will look for these types of amenities. Um, and so I, I am in support of this. Uh, I'm, I really want to hear community feedback on, on, on exactly what we need, what, what, what the community wants for this. So, but I'm in favor. Which we've done. Yeah, we've done a lot of that, we've but done you just want the surveys. next layer, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. just okay. to, to continue that conversation. I, I, because I, I don't want, as city staff or commission, to feel like we're trying to compete with Adventure Island. You know, I don't think that's the role of, of city government. But if these are in amenities uh, that the that the community really wants as part of their community, then that's a different perspective. So I just want to make sure that we're still in line with what the community wants. Yeah, and the, the, the next steps are to put some type of master plan together showing different colors for different phases based on the money that we have to work with. And then we have uh, the, the consultants committed to three community meetings. So we're planning to do one on a weekend, one on a... Uh, a, a, a weekday and one on in, in an evening. <laughs> Although I do find it interesting <laughs> that we all want this pool, but poor Vince every year has to fight for that money. It was something that we all want. It's, it's pretty interesting. So anyway. It's kind of been the last priority, unfortunately. But, I mean, it, it has to be by nature of the other priorities. So right. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of some of my concern is mm -hmm. that the new pool has been on the list. I've been on the dais almost 16 years. And... Uh, it's been on the list the entire 16 years. And so I'm extremely concerned that we are woefully underfunding this. Um, I'm not saying we have to be at no 13. Um, but, and I understand there may be a way to get there through phasing, which I'm not happy about either. Uh, very not happy, I wanna do it all at once and inconvenience everybody one time, however, I understand there's financial concerns, so uh, I just feel that we we keep trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or whatever, vice versa. You know, we have to have an amenity beyond a pool and a, and a house and a, and a storage room and locker room and party room, you know, I mean, and bathrooms. We have to have an extra amenity. There's. People have pools all the t at their house and at their apartment complexes. And so, 
you know, I'm sure Jeff would remember this. Go ahead, Jeff, you can leave, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> That's instead of going, Whoop, you know, you know, she just leaves. Uh, you know, when our kids were growing up, they're all around the same age, um, Jeff's kids and my kids, going to a singular pool like Jeff and I did way back when um, is not the same thing anymore. It isn't. There's all different sectors being served. Back then, you might have had it seniors in the morning, but it, it was weekend. It was being used by the kids. And no parents were there. You had lifeguards. Did you have the high dive? Because you don't see those anymore. <laughs> I don't know if we did or not. Did. We had a diving board. I don't think we had the high dive. I think that we just had a normal diving board. Um, it was very minimalistic. And in today's world, a, a pool is not just about the pool. It is, it's a gathering spot for teenagers. It's a place to learn to swim. People. For the little people, it's a place for exercise and healing for seniors, and yeah, that's about the pool. But it's also a place to have a birthday party. It's a place where our summer camps go. There are all these different vehicles that use this, and I'm telling you, going down to Largo, and Largo even seems minimal now, but when it was first built, holy moly, no kid wanted to go to our pool. Of course not. And it isn't really, I don't see it as a replacement for Adventure Island. So I, I don't want to get down into too, too much detail because we said we're going to stay at a high level. I just don't feel this amount is enough. It's not enough. I don't think we need to go to the, the high. But if we're going to get a design, and even a phased design, $7 million ain't it. And so I have no idea where that money can come from. I, I have very valuably listen to everybody's concerns. And I understand they're there. But I also don't, I, I don't want to kick the buck down the road. And I just feel like we have to say what we know, already know. We already know it. We know seven million ain't gonna cut the deal. So we'll 10. You know, to me, I'm thinking nine, 10. 10. You know, where that comes from. But I'd certainly rather see what we get for that and have the community respond to that and figure out the financing. And if it has to be phased to do that, and I'm not saying that all has to come from ARPA. I, I'm not trying to get into all of that. I, I really am not. I'm just sorry. We, are, we have already seen, we all had our individual meetings, that $7 million is going to give us the basic pool we already have with a bigger house that serves bathhouse, which half of it will be serving the staff and not even the residents. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying it will serve them, but it's not, it's just, it's, it's storage. I mean, it's not giving the things that we want to see. Not even close. So I just feel like we have to put that out there and just say it. And even if the extra money's got to go underneath the line because we don't know where it's coming from yet. I just think we have to put it on paper. And to me, I think we need to design to something. And it ain't $7 million. Would I just feel like really... Can, can I, I think, ask you a quick I question? Does the high the right school number? use this pool now for... Yep, for its, yes, they do. Yes. So the requirements are met for the, for the high school for this? Yes. For swim team. Thank you. Yeah. A lady, a lady asked me that question, and I and, and I also want to hear, and I know that yeah. your teams, I know that your teams, your, your team, um, you know, they're looking at all of those things that we all looked at individually, right? They're looking at all of that and determining which ones and how big or how small it is. You know, they talked about a slide. Should it be two slides? Should it be one slide? Should we have a slide at all? We're going to have a lazy river. I couldn't tell you if the lazy river should be 10 feet long, or 100 feet long, or 1,000 feet long. I don't know those things. But your team is looking at that and trying to determine what's right for us, what's industry standard, and then what's right for us with the space we have, or do we need it at all because it's going to be a maintenance nightmare. All of those, def that's what you all are talking about. I want to give you an opportunity to put that on paper. And I know that our team will see how hard we're struggling 
with this because of the financial implications. So I don't believe that our team is going to go crazy. I really don't. And they'll know where to cut the costs. Okay, we don't need this item because we've got this over here. Or if we combine these two things, we can get it cheaper or whatever. I just know there's a group of people that can do that for us, and I want to give them the chance to do it. And I don't think $7 million does it. So we're here to talk about do we approve the concept of the project, but also the amount of money. And so that's why I feel like I have to say it, because I don't approve $7 million. I think we need to put more. And I don't know where it comes from. I think the city manager said it's probably going to come from Penny. And, um, I, and I don't, we don't know if we have that money in Penny. I, That's the concern, the ongoing concern, which I totally appreciate. I just feel like we should design it, even if it is phased, to ensure that we cover the, the, the time frame you're, you and Les are concerned about. You know, that it needs to be designed to what our expectations are and not, and then phase it. If I may, Mayor, I think when I'm when I was going to approve or vote for this, it's my understanding that that it would then be set up in these phases, and it's be, it would be presented at the at the group so we can get input. I got input from people, but I couldn't show them anything, tell them anything, um, and it was a very small group that I I, I talked to a number of people about mm -hmm. the pool. If they want the pool or they didn't want the pool, what did they want? Uh, but is is that correct, Vince? That that when you make this presentation. The, all of those elements are included, correct? I'd like them to be, yes. They, are, they were going to be, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. Except that, well, I think we all know seven million is not the number, so why would we do seven million? Well, is your real issue, I mean, obviously we're gonna see this, and we're, we're gonna get public input. I know, I know. So maybe your issue is, if staff really believes at this point that getting us what we, you know, because for me, sometimes it's like, let's let's do it right, that's or let's not do it, or exactly. let's, you know, we don't want to That's put it the, off, but let's do it right or not do it. So what is the realistic budgeted number that you all really think is, if seven million, and I know it's not, so what's the real number? And then let's at least have it on the books so we kind of know what that's we're aspiring what I'm trying to, to and I think that's what you're saying. I don't know how to pay for that yet, and, and it, you know, well, the plan I don't would know. be to design the entire thing, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, and then shade different areas that, this is your pool for three million. This is your bathhouse for two million. This is your spray, and 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 you'll be able to see what those numbers are for each of the elements and how that can get put. I together. get it, but you know what? I also want to avoid. I mean, some of this is going to happen. I I do get that. Looking at you all, I, I do get it. But I want to avoid us, <laughs> the commission. Pick, okay, well that's a four hundred thousand dollar element. Let's take that over that one. I mean, I don't want to do that. I'm talking about. I, I want. I what I want is you all to say this is what we need. This is the right thing. This is our analysis and how we've gotten our analysis. We all know some of that as well, and design it to that, and then show how it can be phased versus seven million dollars, where we're getting a basic. Well, Mayor, you're, you're, the argument you're getting from me is 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 we're really, saying the same thing. Yeah, well, I this is what I said at the first meeting we had. I said, why don't you just give this guy the budget of what we're willing to spend, and let him come back with what he wants that's to come back. That's kind of what I'm saying. The same. Well, that's thing. what I said then. But now we've done it this way, so and I don't like so it. We, I don't like it this way. You want <laughs> because I don't want it to come out with 13 million dollars in our community to say. Well, that's what we want. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we have to also, I think we have to say what we think we would be willing to spend, even if we don't know we can afford it yet. Well, that would be really helpful. Yeah. But that's kind of where I'm going. We I just feel like. Have this, this, we, we, we hardly had to uh, have these uh, other meetings, et cetera, then. I mean, we're really just coming up with, with, with what, what we say we're willing to spend on it. And here's your budget, and you go and do it. Well, and I know it's a chicken or the egg because you got to see the design and the cost of the design. But I mean, I I think I think you I think the team has to have a goal. I mean, the way I'm approaching this, I don't know if it helps. It's the way I would go through life is I'm focusing today on ARPA, and so if this comes back to us at ten million dollars, but the four million from ARPA is still good. Then, then I'm, I'm, and the three million from Penny. Then, you know, I, 
I, I, I'm fine approving this at seven, even though I know that, okay, during strategic planning, it may come back at 10. Because this, we're trying to shove everything into this and meeting. I think I'm in the same place Jeff is. I mean, I know yeah. it's coming back for more. Yeah, it's coming. So we'll yeah. figure it out. Yeah, that's right. So, Mayor Mann. No. Mm -hmm. I understand what the commission is saying. We don't want to be short-sighted because the is no. going to be here for a long, long time. That's right. If you were to ask staff right now what we could pay for and what we could build, we're going to tell you $7 million. No, I understand that. So um, Vince and his staff are working on uh, getting, you know, those approximate design cost estimates and, um, and then establishing what is the priority as far as the community goes and what they feel is a priority as well. Then, then go out to the community and talk about those priorities and then come back with a finance plan for the city commission. The, um, um, but what I can't say right now is that we can spend $9 million. And I'm not okay. comfortable with doing that because we need to understand exactly where our reserve levels will be in all of our funds before we do that. So I think that we need to continue on the process and very methodically uh, uh, make recommendations to the city commission as well as, as what the finance plan would be for those added elements as well. The, you know, I don't want to end up with, you know, in 2029 with $7 million in penny and, and you know, a pool that we should have phased earlier. But, you know, we're really good at this. We, we genuinely are. And Penny is performing much better than we thought it would. So the question is, you know, what can we phase in immediately and, and not have to phase? Well, not constraining the Penny Fund or any other fund, yeah. including ARPA. So I think that we can get there eventually. But I need, we need longer to examine exactly where we are. And in that's our fine. And this is why I was trying to say to you, I totally respect where both of you are coming from with your concern if there's going to be a recession in 25 or 26. I say a recession, I'm saying that lightly, but a dip, you know. This would be the time to, don't say that. Is that yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I know. Uh, but, you know, I, so I, I get that. I, I just felt like I had to say something when, when we're being asked to approve a number, I need... I, I want my colleagues to know exactly where I stand. I want to make sure, especially given the fact this project has been on the list for so long, and we've added other projects. We have another project on this list that just came up in the last year. And I'm not trying to do a value judgment here, okay? Which is why I'm not saying what that project is. Well, but project. Well, I'm- It's a very fair comment. I, but I'm saying to you, comment. I. That's our money, <laughs> you know? And so, and again, I'm not trying to value. I, I'm, I really am just saying that this has been in the works for a very long time. We've done study after study, and, and I, I don't, I want to make sure we provide our residents and our families and our seniors with a product that meets our quality of life standards in the city of Dunedin. And that's anything but basic in my mind. So um, I, I know that it's not going to change what we're giving direction to, but I felt it was important for everybody to hear where everybody is. So I think you've got your consensus. We have consensus direction. Okay. Um, I know you're here, but I really have to take a little break. So why don't we do, why don't we go ahead and do lunch? I'm sorry, Vince. Okay. Um, and then we'll come back and talk about the other items. Okay. Okay. Uh, 30 minutes, so we'll come back at 25 till.
All right, welcome back to our uh, commission workshop on discussing ARPA funding. So we were discussing um, <coughs> Parks and Rec Department items, so I will come back to Vince, and you can go on to your next item. Thank you, Mayor, Vice mm -hmm. Mayor, City Commissioners. Our next item is the Dunedin Golf Club Capital Improvements. And as you know, a sustainability study was completed by the National Golf Foundation last July. As part of that study, specific physical upgrades to the property were recommended, such as green enhancements, <coughs> new irrigation system, drainage improvements, cart path renovations, tee box improvements, bridge repairs, clubhouse enhancements, and maintenance building improvements. The um, ARPA funds are being recommended at $2 million, along with a $2 million city internal loan for a total of $4 million. Planning and design for the improvements need to begin in May of 22, with construction beginning in May of 23, and those timings fit with the slow seasons of, um, of the golf business. The project will provide great golf opportunities. The project will also provide great local, be great for the local economy and good for the neighborhood and property values. And also we would be preserving um, the historic value of the golf course. Okay. Uh, questions, comments, uh, Vice Mayor? Um, okay. So... You know, I'm just curious because we have the two and the two, um, and yet there's still been a lot of talk about a historic, uh, a real historic redo um, of the of the Donald Ross. I'm wondering if, you know, if we give two and two, and then if they are still very interested in that, sort of say, can you come up with a grant? For a million, five hundred thousand, if you if they really uh, want to continue. Um, your microphone. Oh, if you really want to, um, you know, continue on that course, could could they leverage this money and say, okay, this is how much we've got, but then maybe there was a way they could do some sort of historic grant or something if they. I mean, you have two camps, right? Um, and I think most, both camps would say, we just want it, it needs to be brought up to standard. Then you have the other camp that says, well, how much would a trademark name like a restored Donald Ross really add to a return on investment? And that, that's what I'm not sure we've ever been able to grapple with and, you know, come to a conclusion on. We know it'll cost more, but um, I'm sort of wondering if, if they could leverage <clears throat> this and with some sort of matching grant or something. So, Vince, you were working on, you're well, working on something. You want to share that with everybody? Well, we've asked our consultant, Richard Singer, to go back and do a side-by-side -side of all of the um, elements to the project um, so we could see what the Donald Ross looks like and what, what the um, municipal golf course would, would look like or what his plan would look like. Um, we also need to do the pros and cons of, of the benefits and because there is, as, as we know, there is going to be uh, more maintenance. The greens are going to be bigger. The, um, the fairways are going to be, be bigger. Uh, the bunkers, I mean, there's going to be a lot more property to maintain. So th there is going to be uh, a, a maintenance um, increase with the Donald Ross design. And these are just some of the things that I know off the top of my head from uh, what, I, what, I've, what I've been learning. So I think we need to wait. And Richard Singer has already started, sent me a first draft of what it looks like. Um, he couldn't fill in all the blanks without talking to the architect from uh, Chris Spence's name is from the Donald, Donald oh, Ross okay. architect and contractor. Uh, so he is actively working on that now, along with the pros and cons, along with what the additional costs would be for. Um, and, and also there's, you know, I understand that the game may slow down a little bit because, 
you know, because of the size of the course. And so all these things that I'd rather wait for our consultant to, uh, to define for us, but these are just some samples. And I certainly don't have any way to <laughs> judge those. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a golf player, so. That's what you're Jennifer for. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, <clears throat> we do know there's two camps. I've heard a lot about the historic re, uh, redo of the, the Donald Ross. I, w I wasn't quite sure today whether Dan Mann was saying restore it to a playable level or whether he was on the historic. I wasn't quite he, sure about that. And he spoke at the other thing, and he was, my understanding, he was for the restoration. The, rest the historic mm -hmm. restoration. So, okay, so um, we'll... we'll there's also when are you going to bring that back to us, do you think? Yes, and when can I? Yeah, when, when do you think that might happen, next well, couple I think of months? Well, I think within a month he'll be, he'll, he'll be done with it. Okay. But, you know, the other thing is a lot of the stuff that we heard about the Donald Ross really hasn't been verified. I mean, we, we every year spend money on an economic impact study for the Blue Jays. I'm not sure, you know, who did their study. Was it an economist that, that their, their study, or they, they just, you know, estimating what the economic value may be. Also, there's the um, tree issue. When I asked the question at the, uh, the meeting uh, that they had on the Donald Russ restoration, the contractor mentioned, now some of these trees might not be so significant. There are oaks, there are palm trees. Um, he thought oh, about 200 trees might have to be oh. removed. Yeah. I mean, so there, these are the things that I want to put all in one, and you yeah. could see the pros and the cons. So I, right here, right today, I can't really <clears throat> Okay. In my opinion. So for now, we're, what you're asking us to do is the look at the four million, two out of ARPA and two from uh, the loan, and and give again in theory, mm -hmm. general consensus to move forward to those next steps, right? At, at the four million dollar level, correct. And then eventually, of course, the city commission is going to need to make a decision, which will be based upon uh, a recommendation from staff okay. regarding the full restoration vis-a-vis -vis the the right. NGF recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I, we we definitely need all the information, Vince. I'm, I'm just been rolling this around in my mind because I am very interested in historic, you know. But I, I, I'm going to have to see the facts. I certainly don't yeah. have a innate knowledge because mm -hmm. I play the game, because I don't. Mayor Man. Yes, ma'am. So I think, and, and uh, you know, Commissioner Gao is a liaison to the golf course. Well, that's, and I, where, that's where I was going next. Right. I, I know that there's, there's um, a lot of discussion and chat about what we're going to do moving forward. But, again, we need to be very methodical. I mean, people are chatting and people are questioning because we don't have those answers yet. And we're, we're, we're working to arrive at those answers. But I will ask that, you know, in, the, in these terms... We're going to, we need to go at our pace, and we need to do, do all of our research and arrive at the, the best recommendation for the city commission, and we will get there, and we will, we will uh, fold in the board, the current board, um, continually and communicate with them continually. We have now on, our, on my calendar a recurring transition meeting you know, with the board of directors as well. So just want everybody to be patient as we arrive at these answers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just as liaison, I, you, you're hearing all the conversations. So it's it's not like you know a, one set of people are for the renovation, the other set are for for the restoration, and it, it's all across the board, uh, a real mix. I do hear a real concern about the reduction of many trees. That that even the golfers out there are very sensitive to the trees, and they want to keep them as many as we can. <clears throat> I just want to make sure, at least talk about it publicly, that whether it's a renovation or a complete restoration, we aren't doing this on the cheap. I know, right, I'm, the residents need to know that even if it's a renovation and we aren't taking it back to Donald Ross, that doesn't mean that we're just nickel and diming and putting a Band-Aid on it. That this is going to be a really nice quality course once we're done. Yes. Just a true statement. Yes. Okay. Just yeah. A think, true statement. <clears throat> and I, I'm just I'm concerned that that because yeah. that idea can can run away. Well, and it's still a Donald Ross course. Right. It yes. still is. I mean, it's right. It still has <clears throat> the, those claims. You know. And just me personally, I am more in the restoration camp as long as it makes sense because I like that historic kind of vibe to it. But it it has to make sense. Right. Um, so I'm waiting for the facts as well. The question for the four million. Instead of two and two, could that be one and three and free up more ARPA money? 
Well, and then or is it, that not a decision for today? I don't, you know. Well, thank you for. I don't think it's a decision for today <clears throat> necessarily. Um, I, you know, the the two million dollar because it's an interfund loan, it has to be paid back. In right? three years. So, right within three years. So Les and I have had lots of di different discussions about how that that's going to work. And the reason why it's attractive is because it's very we pay ourselves like no interest, right, right. on the loan. So, and and no no closing fees or anything like that. So. Um, two and two is better, Commissioner, if I may. Um, and ARPA is pretty good right now, apart from the pool, you know, in, in, in where we are. So just one thing, if I may say, though, um, the, as far as doing it on the cheap, Mayor Mayor, mm -hmm. as far as doing it on the cheap, um, the NGF was 2.75 to 4 million, and we're recommending 4 million. The uh, full restoration is 3.8 million, but it doesn't include uh, the golf club or the maintenance shed, correct? Right. Correct. And so... That 3.8 million is going to be more if we go the full restoration. I just want to put that on the table so we all understand where we are. The uh, we're doing the four because the NGF had a minimal amount for the for the uh, the club and the maintenance area. So it may be in addition to that if we really want to do the club well. So it's a good figure for now. We know that we can do the full restoration of the course and some improvements to the clubhouse at the four million using the NGF. The the other is unknown. Do we think when the golf course is done? Will it truly be an enterprise fund? Yes. Will, it will pay for itself. It will have to. Yes. Okay. Because okay. that's this is that's the challenge I have with the club versus the pool, mm -hmm. both big ticket items, both very community oriented, but both of them kind of segmented in in the the communities that that use those facilities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with this being an enterprise fund, I think it gives us a little more flexibility on on how that plays out. So, you know, to answer your question, I mean, it's in the black now. And then, right. uh, of course, people are playing round after round at this point, more rounds than ever before because of COVID. To, to it, Vince's it, point. I, I got to interject. It's in the black, but they're not putting money towards capital. So it's That's not true. in the black. Mm -hmm. Let, let's totally. be very transparent totally. about that. So it, it, even though maybe operationally they are, Mm -hmm. Part of your operations is putting money for capital, and that's why we're sitting here the way we are. Right, but for the fact that the restoration will take <clears throat> care of some of that as well. And, and they have paid their um, share, right. a threshold amount each year. Now they have another um, commitment to us at the end of March for $120,000, um, and it looks like every bit of that will be paid to us on time. Okay. Yeah. And even reg regarding that, a lot of times the, the agreement allows them to use part of the January, February money to help put the money together to pay for uh, the fourth quarter of last year. And they are ready to pay that now. So they don't need any fourth quarter money, to, first quarter money to help pay for fourth quarter. So that kind of gives you an idea fi financially where they are. Mm -hmm. I think most of their end, we're getting off subject. So I'm, I'm walking down that road to protect them. Uh, but they are fine. A good board right now. Yes. Um, I think the important thing is to all those elements on the improvement need to stay. And so if we're going to decide whether it's renovation or restoration, that the clubhouse, the maintenance, that the maintenance barn, that all needs to be part of it. So the idea that if we go with a full restoration, well, we can fix those up later. No, I think it all needs to be part of one bucket, one project. I agree. Um, I agree so. with that. But other than that, um, if two and two is better than one and three, I was just trying to free up money for the mayor's pool. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you for um, it. <laughs> you know, especially because it's an enterprise fund. But uh, the, the where we are now with the $4 million, is the $4 million, is that where we're really going to stay? Is that the budget? Or is it going to be more like the pool that once we get, once we open up the hood, that that number can change, will need to change? Well, the four million is at the high end, as I said, right. uh, from the NGF, and and we think that we can ho hopefully come in lower once we bid the project, and then we would stay at that four million and add more improvements to the clubhouse, you know, and those types of things. So I think that's a good number right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. If we do the NGF. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, okay. Commissioner. So, um, <laughs> I just have to say this. A great pool with great amenities ah. has great cost recovery, and that's really good. And I love the golf course, but I think the pool has a broader reach. Um, ages, categories, Mr. all that. Mr. May I? 
Of course. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, just because it is, this is a great conversation for the public to hear yes. and understand. So where is that cost recovery coming from in a pool? And I'm, I don't mean that from an antagonistic point of view. Yeah. It's from my understanding. I don't. Yeah, I mean. That's I, why I was so focused on the enterprise yeah. fund. It'll pay for itself. I, I think when we see it come yeah. forward, we can do that. Largo had almost, I think, like an 80% cost recovery when they first, yes. 75%. Which for a pool wow. is recovery, Some of it, that's, like that's one of the things, like you'll hear any of them say, Two birthday party rooms, they'll be packed all the time, having parties there, everybody's enjoying the pool, place to be, picnic area, rentals, those kinds of things. You'll have a lot of cost recovery and you provide this great amenity for your, for you know a community that actually has a lot of homes that don't have pools um, and it'll be our one and only pool. So that's where it comes from. Okay. But I think that's well, where, it's but it's a fair question. It is, it is fees for It's usage. fees, but it's also a lot of rental stuff that yeah. you can do rental. there that well, can but really that's still a fee cost for recover. Rental. I mean, yeah, so I just, you know, so to me, and that's where, yeah. um, well, let me just kind of holistically, but thank you for the question. It's a good question. Um, so, um, so it's $2 million and $2 million, but there, isn't there like 750000 that the golf course has now? Did we... Speak of that. Have we spoke about that? Yeah, they what um, happens with that? They, they did pay. That, that was with a, a loan that they took out, a small business loan for one hundred and fifty thousand. They did pay that back. They still, unto my knowing this, that they still had thirty nine thousand left in notes from when they from an assessment. Well, it wasn't actually an assessment. It was for loans to the from the members to do the greens back in two thousand and six and. Um, I think they, the loans are up to about 350000 and they're down to thirty nine. but the board of directors has, has given staff the direction to pay those balance of those notes back because they're getting like 6%. But there is this $750,000. So, so, no, when you minus that and you minus the notes, you're around 500000 Okay, half a million. Right, and then, and then there's the 120000 that they would be paying to us, so now you're around two eighty. So, yeah, and I realize, like, that's a lot of that's because of uh, some of the um, pandemic assistance, et cetera. Yes. Um, but my question is, if the, if the bill ends up to really be $4 million, it's really 3.5 because we'll have half a million of that money to put towards it? Or does that become part of the sustainability of it? The money that's in, in the capital replacement fund now? Okay, well, when is the agreement expiring with a... With June. June. And we're going to do, what, a six-month extension? We're going to request a six-month extension. Six-month extension. Okay. So when the transfer happens, and we're going to actually do these improvements, what I'm saying is if the improvements really actually are $4 million, does that 500000 offset our costs? And I think actually... Or it goes towards it. Yeah. yeah, it goes towards it. And I think that's going to be a decision made when we develop the budget. It could, or we could, you know, keep it for, you know, capital moving forward uh, to have some seed money. And I think that we need to just put together that program for the commission at that time and not commit it to okay. the, the renovation cost. Yeah, and, and my reason is, and I want a quality project. I'm saying that to the commission. I don't want to do it on the cheap, whichever way we go. And I don't have an opinion at all until we see the side-by-side -side and all the pros and cons about which, side, which way that will be. I want it done right, and we should be proud of it and ready to go. But I will say your comment today made me a little more sensitive to the fact that it's kind of swooped in and we've got issues with the pool, and, we, and I want to be very sensitive about that, that if we're you know, scratching for more money for the pool, that we're being really clear about what money we're going to use on the golf course, what we can and can't afford. And that means, like, you know, if, if all of a sudden we say we're going, to, we're going to give this much, and then all of a sudden the thought process out there is, oh, but we got a half a million dollars to do more. Well, I mean, I just want to be very clear about what we can and can't do because cause we are going to have to look for money for that pool which means we want to do quality at the golf course, but we don't want to do it at the expense of our pool. I agree, yeah, 100%. So, so I, I just, and I think that that, we, and just, I think, um, and that's just something even in the meetings with the golf course. I don't want that false impression because I've been in a couple of the meetings, you know, we don't have all the money in the world to do everything we want. You know, we have to be responsible about it. And so I just want, I just want them to understand this, there, there is, there's a limit and we've got other pressures. And I think they probably know that, but it doesn't hurt to kind of make sure that, that people really fully understand the other pressures we have. So that what, what we want to do is put the money we really have to do into a quality thing for the, for the golf course, but at the same time, you know, 
we don't have a lot of extra money just to throw around. I mean, we've got to shift it to other projects. If we come in and say we can do everything we want for 3.25 at the golf course, we've got that money to shift to the pool. So, it's so, you know, it doesn't mean if all of a sudden we have money to put in the golf course and it comes in less that now we can do more at the golf course. I guess that's the yeah. That's my thought. You but, guys can, you know, chime in. But that's my thought. I just wanted to be clear about it. So. Okay, but I mean, again, I said something about grants. I mean, are there FERDAP grants anymore? Or is there any grants that would be ap applicable to this situation, whether it's a restoration or a renovation? Yeah, and I think the grants might be more um, for a re for a pool than mm -hmm. than for for a golf course restoration. Um, and I don't believe FERDAP is funded um, mm -hmm. this particular. With all the money the state now has because of exactly what we're, I mean. Well, it may be funded again beginning in their new fiscal year. When are we getting our money for GDP, by the way? I've been meaning to ask that. When the heck are we getting that? Oh, we got the, um, the grant agreement came to us on Friday, this past Friday. So we just have to sign it and get the check? Well, we have to bring it to the city commission. Okay. I have sent it to Nikki's reviewing it. Okay. I sent it to her. All right, yesterday. so it's soon. <laughs> that, that's really well. We well have it planned for. Um, it's we have a placeholder for March the eighth. Great. For to bring to the Sorry, city commission didn't mean for to signing. Take us no, I mean if you know, I think we need to look at grant opportunities because we, and use a lot of this money that we're putting aside and then leverage it, if we can. You know, use FERDAP, use, you know, I don't like on the pool. Right. I mean, if we can do more money on the pool with some grants, too. Um, and heck, maybe we'll get some private donations. Just saying. Um, okay, so I'm just going to finish up. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I don't want anyone to misunderstand. I am very much for bringing this golf course to where it needs to be. But again, I want to be responsible about it. I'm, I'm cautious about putting $4 million as an absolute. If we can do it for less, roll it to the pool. Um, I want a quality project. But what it is, it is, and then the remaining money, if there is any, rolls to the pool. That's my only thing. But I'm obviously a big supporter. I'm excited about it. I want to do it right, but I also want to be careful because I want to make sure we're being sensitive to the fact that we know we're short now in the pool. Thank you. Commissioner? Thank you. Um, what I'm going to say is exactly what I said before at the last meeting we had. Um, and that is that I'm intrigued by the, the full restoration very much uh, intrigued. Um, I think that there, there are some numbers, and, and these guys have looked at some numbers from other folks that have done that, and, and the numbers they are reporting to be there. Um, I, think we could, I think we could really get something out of it at this golf course. I think we could end up, as I mentioned, I've said all this before, but I think we can get some senior tournaments here because of the home of the PGA and the Donald, and the Donald Ross course and here in Florida and here in Dunedin. Um, I think it's a tremendous asset. I think it ought to be just simply looked at like that, as that. And, and, and that's sa the same concept with the, with the pool. I said the same thing with the pool. I think we ought to decide what it is that we wanted um, and then figure out how to do that and give that money to, to the developer and let him, let him develop it and there we go. I think the recovery can be there on the pool. Uh, I think somebody can work some numbers on that. I think it can be there for the golf course as well. And as I said before, I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not for it to be an enterprise fund. I think it should be, I think it can return uh, some cash to us. Um, I think in some of those ways that even the consultant looked at, we got four, four different uh, solutions. And one of them was obviously you give it to somebody who's going to try to make some money off of it and is going to pay us. Um, I'm not opposed to making some money off of it, but I want to make sure that it's available for the residents. Um, at the end of this whole thing, I'm going to have some, make some comments about residents because I've, as I look at each one of these programs that we did, I always looked at it and said, how do we, how do we accomplish the use of this money for the best interest of the most residents that we have, most of the, for the taxpayers that we have in, in the city. Um, so that being said, um, I, I see this as a, as, a, as a great opportunity. I think the course, when I say spending money on the course, again, I'm, I'm talking about the course. 
I'm not talking about the, any, uh, any of the other buildings other than other than you, if you need to have a have a facility that's taking care of the course, then then we need to do that. But um, again, I'm very intrigued by it. I think it could I think it could be a great great marketing asset for us. Um, and again, I think it could be an asset to bring us some cash, and, and not and not not necessarily just in the long term, but I think in the short term, I think it can cover up all of their expenses as long as we do it right. So I would like to see it, watch it go, for, go out further and, um, and just we'll use this, I, I would agree with this two and two and, and see, where we, see where we come out as we gather up more information. Um, the golf course right now from everybody that I've talked to, you get different opinions uh, from people of course. And um, some will say they don't want to pay that much, or some will say they're worried about this and they're worried about that. Um, we need to answer some of those questions for certain, um, but then we need to do some numbers to show that we could we could actually make some of that money. So I think we can. Um, so I'm in I'm in full support of taking it taking it to a level that really does something for the city of Dunedin, just just like the pool. We can either just. The people that I talked to about the pool, which is not statistically sound at all, basically were happy with us having what we were having right now. But that's just to the people that I talked to. There may be a whole bunch more that are saying, oh, they'd love to have all of these big parties and stuff. I didn't get into any of that with them. On the golf course, I didn't really talk to any, any more people than, than, than what I did with the pool. And they're, they're sort of all over the place. They just, they probably need to see what it is that we're talking about and would probably agree with it, would probably agree. Again, we have to keep the cost down for, uh, for the locals, um, for the residents, and, and that's just common sense. So I'm, uh, I'm for the two and two at this point in time, and, and, and let's see how it plays out. I guess you have a consultant working on this now and to try to come with plans for, for the development of it. And, uh, and I know there's plans that exist for a Donald Ross restoration, a full restoration that exists. And so I'm assuming he's probably gonna try to get those plans to take a look at them. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get a lot better understanding of what it is that we're talking about uh, in a short time period. So I'm, I'm game for just going with a two and two at this point in time, staying flexible. And I think it ought to be organized to bring us some money. And I think it can. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm supportive of the the two and two, um, and I'll wait to see what the data says. So, thank you. Um, uh, I also want to agree with uh, Commissioner Franey's comments about, you know, if there is extra money, I mean, we need to just be continuing to look for those opportunities to get where we need to go for something that's been on our capital list for a very long time. And we've done a lot of community official but, yeah, community, community outreach on yeah. that particular area. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pickleball. pickleball. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, can Where I, Where do I sign? Uh, yeah, <laughs> me too. I mean, it's like, well, um, you know, you know, that the, what I tried to tell some people was that, you know, it's already in our budget. That's what I, told it's you. just next year. Right. 24, 24. Okay. So it's there. It's not like we weren't going to build them. <laughs> Right. And you know what, given the fact we had the comments on the tennis court condition, I was presuming that maybe you were waiting to find out what was going to happen with the pool before you fix Highlander Park tennis courts. Mayor, if you went out there today, I didn't see the pictures. I haven't seen Those, them. The courts are in very good shape. Concrete always is going to have some cracking. Every three to five years, we resurface them. We, we put a, a product that brings those cracks together and then we paint over it. The courts look good, they're the USTA colors. Um, so I'll go back out and look. I mean, yeah. I, I'm out there because I play. I, I play and- Well, and uh, you're not gonna play on deficient courts no, as the Parks and Rec director, I'm guessing. I think others in this room have played as well. <laughs> so. Okay. All right, so go ahead, Pickleball. So um, Pickleball began in 1965 in the state of Washington near Seattle. And currently the sport is absolutely exploding. Um, it was actually invented by a congressman, and the first pickleball court was built in his backyard. Mm -hmm. And I believe his dog was named Pickle, and he ended up, <laughs> the dog would chase the ball, and he ended up calling the sport pickleball. So just a fun Cute. fact. 
So according to uh, Economist magazine, pickleball is the fasting, fastest growing sport in America, and I got that out of my National Parks and Recreation um, magazine. Um, and, and it may be the fastest in America, but it's definitely the fastest growing in Dunedin. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> Currently, we share the use of courts, which was mentioned this morning. We have five indoor courts between the community center, um, Edinburgh Hall, and the MLK gym. Of course, they're with specific uh, hours because they're, they're indoor and we have other activities going on in these facilities. Um, we have two on the basketball courts, which are being, I, I go through that way every day into my office and on Sunday, and there's 10, 12 people playing pickleball on the basketball courts, and yes, there's no fence there, but they are out, out there getting exercises, so, you know, chasing the ball a little bit, you know, it doesn't hurt with the exercising. Um, we have four shared courts at Highlander, which are two tennis courts, which equal four pickleball courts. You have to bring your own net for all, for all of these, and we have two, uh, one tennis court with two pickleball courts at Eagle Scout Park off of Virginia. So, and, and they're all very, very, very well used. Um, the demand for pickleball courts, you know, is strongly, strongly should be considered. And this is dedicated pickleball courts. I'm talking about where you have your the nets are all part of the court. You don't have to bring your pallet, your mount, your paddle, and your and your balls. Um, Steph is recommending um, construction of six courts with fencing, LED lighting, small shade structures between every other court, uh, and windscreens. And the windscreens now, they come and uh, there's an acoustical windscreen to help with, with sound, because people, you know, don't, say they don't like, the tennis players don't like that, that sound of the they ball. They don't like clapping? The right. Well, the sound of the ball, <laughs> the, the sound of the ball, ball hits, the, the it goes, oh, it's gotcha. a little paddle. So, um, so the, recommenda the, recommend the recommended location is at Eagle Scout Park, uh, north of the tennis courts, we have Parking, uh, we've, we've, we've estimated we get about 60 parking spaces. Bathrooms, uh, we already have existing tennis courts that are lit, um, and we have the community gardens there. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the opportunity at Sterling Links Park, that is another location that pickleball courts could go, but both of these um, locations are being explored presently uh, and should have some better information in the next month or so with our, uh, the feasibility of this, these locations with our, our engineering team. And the reason is um, that we're going to be putting about 20,000 square feet of concrete or asphalt down to build the courts, and so we need to look at the drainage situations and stormwater, et cetera. And we're, we're planning to do some stormwater work out at Sterling, right? Excuse me? We're planning to do some stormwater work out at Sterling at some point. Anyway, so. Pending on, yes, pending yeah, yeah. on what. Um, Master yep. plan. Whether it's a dog park or whether okay. it's a pickleball course. Okay, I'm going to go this way first. Okay. Well, um, you know, Vince, I'd ask you that. Um, you, you're doing six, at, six pickleball courts at Eagle, Eagle Park, Eagle Scout Park. Um, could we do eight? Did you? I know you were going to maybe remeasure and see if that was a possibility. Yeah, we we did re, we did remeasure, and um, we'd have to take away the little shade screens. We'd have to expand to expand. Um, there's also a manhole at the one end, so I believe that that would it would go over the manhole if we went any further, mm -hmm. um, and then we we would lose some of the parking of those 60 spaces. So I, I don't think that um, I know that that we're not going to be able to get more than six courts there. And is there an ability to do a couple more at Fisher or Highland? Highland? Um, I'd have to take a, a you know, the, the, the other part of this is the, with the pool, we don't know exactly the footprints of the pool right. Right. at the Highlander courts. I'm not sure about the, the Fisher side. We do have, you know, seven baseball fields there. And we also, you know, there would have to be additional parking. So I'm going to take a guess that ideally, if we were going to do more eventually, because I mean, I get both sides, tennis and pickleball, you know, talking to me like, OK, if if we build pickleball courts, then can you get some of the lining off the tennis courts? And, you know, it, you know, I think so. I'm just, you know, looking ahead 
to <clears throat> does Sterling seem like? I know we got to do community input about what people want there. Does that seem like a logical location to put put more whenever we do what we're going to do there? Yeah, but I don't think you always need more in the same place. If we were going to add, you mean if we're going to add? Yeah, if we're going to add more. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know I saw an email this past week that just make sure you build them where you can expand because of the popularity, but I don't think you need to have them all in the same in the same park. Well, yeah, and that was a question I was going to ask you because you do get people saying, oh, well, you should do like kind of more of a, not a complex, but, you know, put a bunch all together. They can do tournaments. Does that make sense? Well, you could do tournaments. I mean, in the world of baseball and basketball, tournaments aren't all done. It's in like the one town or the one county, um, but it's always not on the same in the same location. So you can spread them around and still do tournaments, yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm in favor of this. I, I think, um, you know, we need to keep looking at it because I think we're going to continue to have some interesting dynamic between the tennis, the tennis players and the pickleball players, but clearly we need dedicated pickleball courts. So. Commissioner? Thank you. Um, I had a, a lady ask me uh, over the weekend about the cost of these. Um, it, it is, it, and that's, not, that's really not pertinent to this to, to discussion, but I'm just curious. Um, we're paying 400,000 for six courts or that's oh, that's the request, okay, and that includes the court and the you know the some of the other issues. That, is is it that expensive, Vince? Um, I have a quote right in front of me, uh -huh. and I spoke to another contractor this past week. Um, the courts itself are two hundred thirty-one thousand, windscreens ninety-eight hundred, lights sixty-three thousand, and they're a little bit lower than um, tennis court or baseball lights. Uh, other equipment, 100, uh, 1,650, one site work, 7,500. So I have two quotes that are about the same. Mm, now now you can build a pickle, and in, in, I was up in Oldsmar. I've been around to several of the other pickleball courts, and Oldsmar has courts there. They don't have, it's like our basketball courts. They don't have fence around them. So um, I would recommend that we have fence around our courts. We have LED lighting. Mm -hmm. We have windscreens, and we have shade structures. So for that... Um, those elements on the court, I would, um, that's, that's numbers about right. Vince, if you don't mind, I'd just like to ask a couple questions about this. Um, in, in pickleball, do, do a lot of people play under, under lights? Yes. They do. So that's a very, very common thing, and that would increase the, the usage of these, of these courts significantly. There's a couple of groups that play at um, uh, Eagle Scout. Mm-hmm. And I know for sure because I play with them on Tuesday nights mm -hmm. with about 12, 12 players that are out there playing pickleball on the two courts. Um, I see it from my office at Highlander. I see the people playing on the, the basketball courts. So, yes, they play at night. Uh, and, and in conjunction with, with the tennis, um, the, the, uh, someone was talking today about how many people were lined up for tennis. Now, I started into running because I worked at a company that, well, we were a ski company, a tennis company, a squash company, a racquetball company, and we get out of work and we couldn't find a court to use, so we decided, we, well, we'll run while everybody else is playing. Um, so I became a runner for a while. But it was always the issue of trying to get the court. And do we still have that problem with tennis here in Dunedin, as well as with, with pickleball? Are they lined up waiting? I, I have not seen it okay and I also we have a pro that works for us Greg Reardon uh -huh. and um, I I used to take tennis lessons with him and I never see people uh, waiting to play tennis and maybe there's certain times that I'm missing um, but I haven't seen as much demand and I don't want to I tennis is a great sport mm -hmm. great great sport as a matter of fact Greg Reardon our pro has been our pro for 10 years and he's one of our bigger earners um, he was purist tennis, and because um, he knows if he wants to continue running his business, he needed to learn how to play and instruct pickleball. So he's now doing pickleball lessons as well. So that's just kind of the way it's the way it's gone. So I, I was asking because here we are talking about ARP A monies, and so now that we put this in pickleball, or we put this in tennis. So obviously the pickleball is, 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 is significantly more in demand than what tennis is. Well, and it will relieve 
the the um, the pickleball courts, you know, to more tennis courts. We have 11 tennis courts. Somebody said we had seven, but we have 11. Just because there's pickleball lines on three of them, you can still play. We also have a pro that teaches on one court. That's the 11th court, but he's not there, you know, 24/7 either. So uh, we do have 11 tennis courts. And then once the pickleball courts are built, I would, you know, want to tread slowly on taking lines off of the tennis courts. I mm -hmm. would not do that right away. So from a Parks and Rec standpoint, so providing these two, these two different services or these two different games, <clears throat> you're saying the put the money in the pickleball, don't put it in tennis, put it in the pickleball. And well, we do have, a, we have 11 courts. We do maintain them. We resurface them um, every three to five years. We fix the cracks. Um, so the pickleball court, the tennis courts are in, in great shape to play on. Um, and now you'd have dedicated pickleball courts as well. Thank you. So, and I would continue to maintain, of course, the tennis courts. Sure, absolutely. At a high level. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Um, you know, my question is, okay, you have two very differing interests. They're both very passionate about their sport. So based on usage, I mean, it's some, if, if we can so really try to measure the usage, um, how many good, clean tennis courts are needed and how many, you know, actual pickleball courts are needed? And, and that's the essence of the question. Can you answer that? I mean, you've got 11, you said, but to, of those 11, I guess two have been... Uh, three, of, three of them have pickleball lines. So, th so three of them have been sort of re reconfigured. Right. Well, not really the reconfigure, just lines added to, and, and it's very common on municipal courts, basketball courts, volleyball courts, where there's more than, there's multiple lines on, on courts. It's not ideal, but, you know, you're trying to serve a lot of different um, activities. Well, we can come back with that information, right? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but I would like that information. That's, great, that's a great question. Great I mean, question. you know, what really is the usage and... Can we really sort of target what we actually need to the best of our ability on tennis and good, you know, good, well-repaired courts? And I don't know. I mean, maybe you have to resurface more than every three to five years. I don't know this. I flunked tennis, too. So, um, you know, there, there's a whole list of sports I've flunked, but, you know, during my life. <laughs> well, I, I do know before, you know, with 11 this courts or <clears throat> with 10, and I'm really um, good at I it. never heard of a, uh, an issue where, um, I excel. where players weren't getting tennis courts or they were waiting for tennis courts. And, well, of course, you know, tennis is a game and pickleball, too. There, there are certain hours of the day that, that they're played. They're not played in, in the summertime at 100 degrees. You know, except from our tennis camps. But you'll come but, back with all that information. Yeah, I could. Thank you. Thank you. I think that would be very helpful. Just your best, your best estimation. Commissioner, questions or comments? Uh, sure, I'll make a comment. Um, I think six courts is a great place to start, but I think at the growth of this sport, I I I wouldn't be shocked to see a need for for more uh, courts. I know that right there's two courts, there's two courts to one tennis court, four players to a game. For the most part, you can play it a single, but most of them are doubles. So you can have out at Highlander, I've, I went two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, four, 16 people on, on two tennis courts, but don't actually be 20 to 25 players. So if you're gonna see a lineup of players wanting to play a sport, it's much more in pickleball than it is tennis but pickleball is much more social and interactive. And, and they figure out all kinds of round robins and everybody gets to play. Nobody's on the sideline very long. And uh, so there's a, a great social interaction as well. So it's wonderful for the community. Um, so I'm, I'm a, and this isn't against tennis players. I, I think also the bigger concern is to Vince's comments that I'll bring it back later is they don't play in 100 degree weather. And maybe that's an issue as well, as we've got two outdoor sports that can only be really utilized early in the morning or early in the evening. And maybe we should look at, at shade structures for the entire courts. 
so that maybe they will be better utilized in the afternoon with a little bit of shade. I don't know what that looks like. I know there are out there. I'll just throw it out there and shake a tree, see what happens. But anyway, but as far as this is concerned, I think it's a wonderful place to start. I agree. I'm a little concerned it's not enough. Me too. That's what I'm concerned about. And it, exactly. I really am. I'm concerned that it's not enough pickleball. I'm concerned that we're going to spend this, be there, and we're already going to be in a rears, if you will, and there will be frustration. That's what I'm concerned about. That you, and I don't, I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it, but I would really like to understand, and you can come back because you, you can't answer this right now, but I'd like to understand how you came up with the number of courts, like what you think we need, and was it a financial decision or was it our need decision? You do not have to answer that right now. I think it's a property decision right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, Land. I, I would like to understand what we really think we need. Because if you're talking, whatever you said, 250, 280 for the courts themselves plus the other stuff, then it's really not that much money to add two more courts or four more courts. If they're all in the same place and you're utilizing the same amenity, you know, structure, shade, and those kinds of things. So I, I think... W I think we we don't want to go in being underserved already. I, I want to feel comfortable that that's what we need, and I'm not necessarily feeling that way right now. Even though I want my darn pool, <laughs> I realize that this is. I, I just feel like we might need this is penny on the dollars of the pool. Exactly. So I'm. So can you come back to us on that? Well, Mayor, can I I'm, tag on to that? For yeah, you? sure. Because I just think the issue is the land, and the clear land is over at Sterling. Yeah. And Sterling's were waiting to do a community input, so it all ties in. And, and maybe, I mean, I don't know how fast we can do we that. We have or... two um, main recreation needs, and I had this conversation with Jennifer. One is um, pickleball courts, and is six enough? Probably not. Um, and a dog park. Right. So those are the two things between emails and phone calls. Yep. And being out and about, and I, I'm out and about talking to people on the courts, at dog parks. Um, those are the two biggest things that are coming by through parks and recreation. Like I said, I, I don't want to take us down a rabbit hole. That's why I'm saying, I mean, I think we can go ahead and have consensus for the 400. But I really feel like we might need more. And, again, I don't know how we fund that. I don't know if that's, I don't know what, and I don't need to figure that out right now. I just, I'm concerned that we're going to go in behind the eight ball already, and I don't want to do that because that'll just add more frustration. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Um, the key is that they don't have to be all built in the same location. I get that, but uh, economy of scale with lighting, lighting is, is a big ticket price that you just talked about. You basically said $100,000. You put two locations, then you're talking about two major sets of lights versus adding it one extra light by adding a couple of quarts. So I, I'm thinking economy. And again, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole uh, today, but I just, I think we have to recognize what we already know. Okay. I'll leave it in your hands to talk about and figure it out, but come back and, and maybe, maybe there is some proof that says that's all you need. I just want to know because I, I feel like it's cutting ourselves a little short. So there is one other thing to consider, mm -hmm. and, and I hear you, Mayor, I, I also want to stay at 30,000 feet, yeah. but there is adjacent residential as well to the pickleball courts. And, you know, additional courts mean additional noise and additional lighting. So, I understand. Um, I totally And I think that it. needs to be taken into consideration as well. I get it. I mean, at Eagle Scout, are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Fairway. But he already said you couldn't do more at Eagle Scout. We don't right. have the room to do more at Eagle. But, if it, but it, you got fairway and then the lights and all of that, so, too. So yeah, consensus fairway. direction, then, Mayor, if I may. So I, I misunderstood what you were saying. We'd like to move forward on the four at yes. Eagle Scout Park. Six. Well, Six. Uh, wait, <laughs> and, wait. Okay. No. I did not know that we've determined a location because we've not had that dialogue. Other than today was the first time I've even heard that. I'm not agreeing to a location at this point. I'm agreeing to the 400,000. Well, I, I've always understood that's the only land we have right now. So if we want to do something immediate. We have Sterling. 
Why would we I say that's the only? Sterling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't think we were picking a location. Okay, I'm just going to say we've agreed on a community input uh, on Sterling. What two years ago? Three right, years we ago. We were waiting for the GDP. I'm just saying. How long we do we did. want to keep the pickleball players waiting? That's no. All I don't want to do that, but I also want to be smart with our money. <clears throat> And again, you if you said they can be in different places and not necessarily an economic. But did you hear, just hear what I said about the lights? Yeah, I did. Lights I'm... are really expensive. They're really expensive, okay. and we can go. We can do more on the cheaper if we. All right. Again, I don't want to talk about the location because that's taking us down a rabbit hole. All I want to do is say we are okay with the four, Six. right? Four hundred thousand. Oh, right for six. The money, mm -hmm. which is what you're asking us for. And all I'm asking for is, is that really the number? We can figure out the who, what, where if later. The number. Um, I'm just not approving a location at this point because I figured you're going to tell us what. Okay. It I, just delays it, though. I'm just saying it delays well, it. Well, it might I, but I, yeah, I thought that's where the you know six what? courts just came it. from. Right. Well, y'all knew a lot more than I did because this is the first time hearing of I all of that. I just want to say that. I'm just telling you. It's the first time hearing Any time you have lights, <coughs> you know who we have. Squirrels. <laughs> that eat the lights, Only right? Only in the trees. The trees. But I've been going around and looking at our lights and our trees, and someone's been busy eating our lights again or something. Okay, let's not go down that road. Well, I just wanted We're not, to... That's not on our agenda today. <laughs> I just wanted to drive Mo okay. crazy over this. So I thought we were going to give him a go-ahead to go do it now, you know, but... That was my understanding. Eagle Scout, do it. It can fit six. Let's Again, do it. Again, I way. have yeah. not. Today is the first day I've ever heard that. So I don't want to say that I'm okay with that. I mean, if you want to outvote me, go ahead. But I, I just, I really did not know that. Didn't know we picked a location. Didn't, <coughs> and I don't know what we based the number of six on. Oh, we need Other more. than space. I'm not we don't need more. I know, but We're again, I want, all. again, all I want is our staff to look at economies of scale. And just because we have public input doesn't mean we can't just go ahead and put pickleballs there at Sterling. I, I don't know those answers. I want to get them, and we're not going to be able to do that today. All I'm trying to do is we're okay with the 400, right? Yes. And you guys are going to talk about this conversation and tell us quickly what you think. Well, actually, what we'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about this conversation. And Mayor, if you didn't know that Eagle Scout Park was was the location, that's on me. I, I did mean, not I, know. I, we've been talking. Had about Had no it. idea. Right. So, you know, probably missed that in your. I always, then. I always <laughs> thought it was going to be at Sterling. That's where I've always thought it was going to be. Pickleball was going to be there, and the dog park. It's always what I thought. So, what we can do, though, because we do want to expedite this, we I get genuinely it. do. So, so let me uh, circle back with staff, and we can talk a little bit about both the timing for the. Sterling Park community input because that is a, a prime location for these courts as well as Eagle Scout Park and sit down with all of you again, show you the location, that type of a thing. And, and you also want analysis on the needs for the tennis courts yes, and the pickleball absolutely. courts. Absolutely. That's part so of the equation. We'll bring that all back to you as quickly as we can. Well, I wasn't worried about the tennis courts, but I was worried about the number of pickleball courts and, and the economies of scale with the lighting. Mm -hmm. and, and but we have to be sensitive and, to both sides of this. Yes. Yeah, we do. Right. Yeah. Yes. In my notes, I had said exploring the feasibility of this these lo this location, with, with these locations with our engineering team. Right. Right. Because of the amount of concrete that or asphalt would have to be laid yes. over the the, the, the turf. We can do that too. Okay. That's all part of where where they're going to end up. Okay. I don't want to. I, I I'm, again I just, today is the first day I'm hearing of this say, location, I and I don't want to. I want to think drag. about it. I need to think about that. Yeah, I mean that's that's good. But could we have a date certain that we're going to have this come back so that we could make a decision? I don't want to over. I understand, and I don't want to say, oh, I moved to do Eagle Park. I, I mean, I don't even know what people feel about that. Maybe the maybe the pickleballers would hate that. I don't know, but it's the only land we have, and I'd like to know that we're. It's not just going to. You know, it's not just going to drag. So there's a volume of work inherent in, in the work we've done already today. And so I want to circle back with staff and talk about when we can return to you with, all, with this information. I can't say in the next couple of weeks. But I think you can, when you go back and look, you know which items are sort of the serious priority things. Mm -hmm. And so when you're sitting down trying to do your research on some things versus others, you'll, you know, pickleball sort of. We'll do it as quickly as we can.
I mean, we didn't even have it planned until 2024. And if we get it in 20, by 2023, mm -hmm. we moved it up a year. We can't do it by 2022. Well, I'm just saying, do you, do you see where I'm going? I'm just saying we're, we're panicking because we got this swarm of emails, whereas it wasn't even in the budget until 2024, and nobody had a problem with that Mayor, until today. Mayor, I, I'm sorry. I'm not panicking. But it's, it feels like that's what we're doing, is rushing in the middle of all of these other things. That's what it feels like we're doing. Is, and I, I'm just saying... I, my understanding was the six courts always were planned to be Eagle yeah. Scout. And I feel so bad that no, I didn't know that. Okay. And so it's just a matter of, like, let's build them. The demand is... I get, I get texts all the time. I do, showing too. Showing me the pictures of people waiting. I do, too. And so I just don't... I know how sometimes these things drag, and, I mean, I guess we'll wait and see when it comes back, but I just don't want it to drag. I hear you. I don't think any of us do. I really don't. But I'd, I'd, I'd love it to go to Sterling, but I think Sterling's a little more protracted. protracted uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to take some time, but... Well, I think Sterling could be the additional courts that we need to, to address the need. But again, I think it's going to cost more because of lights. And yeah, so, we, because putting lights in two different locations. So I'm very concerned about that. Whereas if we built eight and called it a day, <laughs> you see where I'm going? And so I, I feel like we have to look at that. Jennifer. Vince, should they all be lit? There's, there's some stormwater constraints that need to be out. Right. Oh, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I, I really don't want to make a call and pull a plug, or, or not pull a plug, but, you know, say go without having that information. I think it's important to have it. Okay, but we are okay with the 400000 Everybody's okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes? We're staying as a start. I mean, it's our okay. start. Yeah. Okay. I'm just All right. To protect okay, guys. Um, uh, I'm not taking a break yet, but I just want to call out that we are starting to really run behind. So we really have to just focus on the dollar amount of these projects and, and not ask a lot of questions about them because we're going to get more information. Special event funding has already been approved. Mm -hmm. It's already in motion. We've already paid out three event promoters. We have another six that are right behind them, and then we have several that are um, that uh, that are filling out their Duns and Sam's number uh, to receive the federal funds. And that was already approved on October seventh. Use four hundred thirteen thousand seven hundred. Okay. There's okay. nothing to discuss there. All right, you you good? I'm good. All right, thank you. Thanks, Vince. Thank you. All right, so then we have uh, live <laughs> library. Miss Phyllis. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, the library playground has reached its uh, end of life. Our Friends of the Library were fundraising, um, had started, but due to COVID closure, um, they had paused their fundraising efforts. Um, at the beginning of the fundraising, um, the Blue Jays were very kind and donated 4,000 uh, to help kick off our fundraising. Um, uh, the current playground that we have um, that was funded um, by 25000 from our city corridor um, study, uh, the Friends of the Library, and then local organizations like the Youth Guilds, Rotary, and uh, Casatinas. Um, we're working with Parks and Rec on getting bids for the playground. Um, initially, when we had first started uh, looking at it, it was $100,000. Um, so, of course, as you know, things are, are going up <laughs> um, in pricing. Um, but we are trying to keep it, the playground would be at the same footprint that it currently is at. Um, we've been to the Disability Advisory Committee. Um, we want to make sure that the playground has accessibility. Um, we're focusing on sensory components, um, tactile learning, 
Um, and of course, encouraging play and literacy. So we have some Let's Talk and Learn panels that we're looking at, and then eventually a story walk. Um, so we can have um, items around the playground uh, and change them out with different um, stories that we're focusing on. So the Friends of the Library um, are applying for some grants, but we are asking the city uh, for 50,000 for ARPA funding for it. So Everybody questions? okay with 50 grand for the library? Absolutely, but I just have one question. I know you, okay, Phyllis. Yes. Wouldn't, I mean, so you're about at 79, correct? Uh, that I can add up. Would, would the foundation? Yes, so we, um, we actually just submitted a grant. The foundation, so the foundation is ready to assist if we need assistance. Um, we do, um, the Parks and Rec has been really great working with different companies. Um, when we're looking at playgrounds, we want to have a wow factor. We want to have some things that are real library focused. Um, so it's not just a general no, no, playground no, no. set. Uh -huh. um, but we do have some other stakeholder groups that would be uh, participating. And it's always nice to have a good base so we can get some uh, matches Matching from, those, yeah. from those organizations. OK, thank you. Everybody OK with the 50 grand? Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. OK. Um, Michael, with his suit, yeah. come on down. You want me to wait? Sure. No, go. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, if you don't recognize me, I am Michael Nagy, Director of IT, wearing a tie and sport jacket. <laughs> Yellow is for honesty and warmth. So. Oh, I, like uh, <laughs> I like it. I like it. see how that works out for us, <laughs> for me. So the first slide, um, we're asking for $3.8 million in broadband internet. Um, so you may ask, what is broadband internet? Um, in context of internet access, broadband is used to mean any high speed internet access that is always on and faster than dial up across your traditional phone lines. Um, what ARPA funding for broadband would mean for the city, uh, it would provide a, a new secure underground fiber optics cabling infrastructure. Um, it would provide free public Wi-Fi zones. It, the city cannot provide any free wireless internet in any of its parks or facilities without the installation of additional secure underground fiber optics cabling. Some city sites rely on third party connections, while other sites have no means to connect to the city at all. The fiber cabling, uh, fiber cabling is our backbone um, that's required to provide any type of wireless connectivity for the public internet access. It also provides a benefit to the city by connecting all three of its data centers to one dedicated uh, secure cable. The city would, could provide free public wireless internet in several of its major parks and facilities that include Gladys Douglas Park and the cemetery areas, Highlander Park to include the park, the pool, the spray ground, tennis courts, the ball fields, uh, Pioneer Park, plus all existing city buildings would be able to have free public Wi-Fi in them. Um, we don't have that currently in all of them. Funding for broadband would also allow us to connect several city sites to our current secure data and voice network, as well as provide free public Wi-Fi to these sites, which include the Dunedin Golf Course, the Clubhouse, the Cart Barn, Sterling Park Driving Range, the Marina Area in Edgewater Park, and also the Moreau Street Garage. It would allow us to provide a dedicated fiber connectivity to our mission critical buildings. Uh, new, build, new fiber cabling would allow us to connect our new EOC, the new city hall, to the existing data center of public services via one dedicated secure fiber line. The EOC fiber cable would also connect the EOC, the Fire Station 61, the new parks operation facility on Solon Avenue, uh, lift stations on Solon, and the Belcher Road water tanks. Uh, the estimated cost for this project is, uh, was $1.336 million. Uh, the quote came in at just about $600,000. Um, the difference, though, may be required for the rest of the broadband projects um, as costs may rise over the next few years, what our estimate is. So the next slide. So these are some broadband possibilities. Um, it will allow us to possibly make the city a smart city with, pub, with some public technology, such as smart furniture as a hotspot, wireless parking sensors, 
smart kiosks, web cameras in the downtown entertainment district, and the newest technology, a wireless street light pole drone docking station. Um, <laughs> none of these items would be possible without providing fiber cable infrastructure um, to connect to the internet. And they're not including the 3.8 million, they're just possible projects. Yes. Right. But you need the infrastructure to get there. Right. Next slide. Another, possibil another possibility is to provide a free public Wi-Fi zone in a designated downtown corridor. The yellow highlighted area you see is just an example of, of what a place where you possibly could have internet. That could change depending on what we uh, are able to implement there. Next slide. Okay. The map on the left is our current underground fiber cabling infrastructure. The blue lines represent the fiber cabling. The yellow boxes, if you can see them, indicate our city facilities that are currently connected to our secure fiber network. The pink boxes indicate city facilities that are connected to us via third party internet, such as Spectrum or Frontier, that includes the marina, Sterling Park, the EOC, and the fire station. We rely on a third party to connect to our secure network. If those third parties, those lines go down, we have no connectivity to those sites until we get them repaired. The orange boxes then would indicate the city facilities that are not connected to our secure voice and data network at all. And that's the new parks operation facility, the golf course area, uh, Gladys Douglas Park area, and the Belcher Road water tanks. So the map on the right does outline um, our cable infrastructure if all this was approved. This is what the city map would look like. All of our city buildings and um, facilities would be connected. And that's the end of the... <laughs> I love the drone. <laughs> all right, do you want to cover this cybersecurity as well, real quick? And then we'll go with all our, any questions? So that's your only other piece, right? Okay, yes. Okay. So these, everybody talks about it, everyone's concerned about it, but what is a cyber attack? A cyber attack is an attempt by hackers to damage or destroy a computer network or system from within the organization or from external sources. So then what is cybersecurity protection? Cybersecurity protection refers to protecting our hardware, software, and our data access from internal and external hackers, uh, attackers, or cyber criminals. It protects against harmful cyber attacks that are trying to access, change, or destroy our sensitive information <clears throat> and disrupt the services we provide to the public. ARPA funding would allow the city to upgrade various hardware and software applications to the latest technologies, as well as provide training opportunities to all staff in protecting against cyber, potential cyber attacks. In the next slide, the next slide, just list the various components and softwares that we would be able to upgrade and enhance with this kind of funding, as well as provide training. I don't know if you want me to go through and just read them all off. Um, yeah, I might as well. Okay, so the first would be the installation of advanced security and intrusion detection software. Uh, contract with third parties for intrusion detection audits and analysis of what we currently have in place and what we would have after we uh, implement new uh, upgrades. We'd implement a redundant data backup at each data center, upgrade our email security gateway and the email spam filtering equipment, upgrade our firewall and network switches, as well as upgrade desktop antivirus software protection, uh, install data center network closet monitoring systems. We have m these things in place, but this funding would allow us to get the latest technologies. There's areas we do want to enhance on. Um, the okay. training? As well as training, yes. The training for all city? All city staff, city commission. And those are done by um, specific companies like yes. No There's, Before? Like No Before, based out of Clearwater. We bring organizations in here to train our staff, provide um, online tests. We would send um, emails to see who would fall for, you know, clicking on things. Um, just for example, yesterday we had 20 emails that came into the city. All 20 of the staff clicked on the links, and they shouldn't have. They never it, click it, links. Never. With, it's, it's so hard. It's no. not the typical one. We're asking the mayor to 
where the mayor's asking for us to buy gift cards, this would be a little <laughs> trickier. I know, that's so funny, right? I get links all the time, and I, I'm like... I've gotten a couple yeah. from you. Delete. I know they're... Yeah, hey. delete, delete, delete. I know where my wife works. If you click on one of those, it comes up and says, Hey, congratulations! You just won yourself. And it's like half a day in training class on not to click on. <laughs> right, so, right. Hey, I love it, I love it. that's a good yes. idea, yeah. by the way. Teresa, you hearing that? No, but my wife has never had to attend any of those classes, <laughs> for the record. Very good. Okay. Very good. <laughs> this also... Yeah. Possibility that it provide the city with, and I have to check with Teresa and all this, that our risk management um, policy or uh, liability could be lowered. That staff are trained and periodically trained on yeah. cybersecurity issues. So okay, may help us as well. That's it, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, quick questions and any final comments from anybody? I'm going to start this way. Just one question. Um, Weaver Park is that? Not included in the public Wi Fi zones? Where's Weaver Park? It's Weaver Park. Park. 19. Halt 19. It could be if that's with the, the way the commission wants to go. I'd have to include this. That was the one that hit me as kind of missing. That's kind of Edgewater. a. Well I had some other thoughts too. Did you? Okay. Edgewater cool. Park's in. And we should Edgewater, I think, is Edgewater's included. in there. Yeah, yeah, down said, there. I said it is in. Okay, go, yeah, good. Yeah, definitely Weaver, but you maybe have some. Other. That was my only one that I caught. I mean, a lot of people at Weaver. I, I'm a I'm a big supporter with this. I think it actually falls really in line with, you know, some of the federal initiatives that are important, which I think is is important for us to do. So uh, yeah. And Weaver Park is west of the wastewater treatment plant. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it so is. The cost to get it, we would actually tie in from the wastewater plant to Weaver Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not saying you have to. I didn't but know if there a was a reason, I didn't but know what if. Yeah, that mentioned. could that could work really well. I, I just think it's a well or utilized the, park and people. Or the would... water plant to tie in there. That's yeah. Okay. Cool. Commissioner, the only thing. Yes, I have to ask some questions. Sure. Um, a lot of money. Um, I'm certainly supportive of the cybersecurity side of this. Um, perhaps you could help me by by giving me the information that I could give to somebody that would ask this question. Why do we need this other broadband? I have whatever thing I need. They, I don't need it. Why, why do I need it? And we don't have to provide public, free public Wi-Fi. We just won't be able to provide any of those possibility uh, items I mentioned. But not only would it provide free public Wi-Fi to certain areas, it would by doing so, we it would allow the city to um, enhance its secure voice and data network, provide it to all facilities. So it, it's a twofold. It's providing broadband internet to the public and securing all our buildings as opposed to using third-party um, vendors. Thank our you. emergency operations center relies on spectrum through the fire station. If we're in EOC mode and during a, an event, if spectrum loses connectivity in that area, we have no communication at the EOC. By doing this, would put the EOC on our secure network and then allow us to put free public Wi-Fi zones in the buildings. Now, the public comes here now and they can connect to our Wi-Fi, but we want to enhance that so that it's all our city buildings have that and, and certain uh, outside parks and areas would have that. So, yeah, it, it's not a requirement, but it's a way to get the city secure to be able to provide future technologies. If, if the city wanted to look at wireless parking sensors, where you have these little caps in the parking space and you download the app and you're like, where's, a, where's an empty parking space in the city? Your app will tell you. So you don't have to keep driving around looking for a parking space. Things like that. So in, able to, in order to provide any future technologies, or as I said, the um, free public Wi-Fi zones, we have to implement this infrastructure. So th it's, it's 3.8, so I still need to stay on this just for a minute because it's a lot of money. Um, so the aspect of providing the services that may come, all right, that, or that we may wish to use, there may be another way of doing that at that point in time. We don't, we don't know. That's technology. Um, right now, to connect some of these other outlying buildings, there's not that capacity. We have to use third party. Correct. Or um, we're going to have to, for example... Um, parks operation facility and the EOC 
if we don't fund it through here, I'm going to have to come back to you to fund it out of general fund to get those buildings connected, and then it won't happen then probably till FY23. Mm -hmm. We didn't fund for it this year. How much would it be just to fund that part of it? Uh, $600,000 just for the EOC. To get to the EOC, which would, um, then there's an additional cost to get the parks operation facility from the street into the building there, um, and then whatever other equipment we may need. So I kind of looked at that and I said, what's the risk of not doing that? What is the real risk of not doing that? Of not doing the... Yeah. Of not connecting those, those facilities. facilities. I'm, I'm again, it's 3.8 million, I have to ask. Just the EOC, the EOC's fiber connectivity, not only you're not connecting those buildings, but it's going to be tied into the Solon Avenue Force Main Water Project. Um, so they'll put the infrastructure in, but there just won't be any fiber cable. And I don't know, and, and Jorge may be able to speak on that. I think that, well, as Jorge is coming up, uh, Commissioner, from my perspective, the, and, and a, a good example of this is when uh, our voice and internet went down here at City Hall, we were reliant upon Spectrum to send their crews to repair the fiber optic cabling so that we could have connectivity. Right now, we're relying on Frontier and Spectrum to provide some of those services for us, and, and specifically to our EOC, which is, to me, not optimal as far as cyberware goes, as far as, as, as continued connectivity for us and control of, of our internet and our voice. and and. I mean, and we're, we're subject to their firewalls. We're subject to, to all of their systems in place and not our own. And so I think that, that the benefit to the city of Dunedin is to, uh, to essentially bring us up to speed because most cities, you know, do not rely upon other providers to, to provide their, their voice and connectivity. So I'll have. Yes, um, How many, that's interesting. How many cities do this and don't do this? Do you have I any? I don't know. No, that's a detail. Rub, yeah, right. just okay. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, to your, your comment, and if I could elaborate on, on what Jennifer and Michael said thus far, was specific to the, the project that Michael defined that would make uh, an, a fiber connection from essentially his current office of public services up County Road 1, down along Salon, and then back down over to the EOC and Fire Station 62. Um, that project was actually bid along with um, a force main design project that engineering was working on for uh, wastewater. There are some economies of scale in that bid uh, to allow that bid alternate to be included. If you recall, um, several years ago when we originally brought this uh, to the commission, uh, there's some economies of scale not only in bidding it that way, but also in repurposing a, an existing force main that's going to be abandoned and uh, because of the fact that it's cast iron, but it's perfectly um, applicable to use it as a conduit to, to push the fiber through that portion of that existing force main that can be repurposed. So there's economy of scales in including that work now. Um, as Michael and Jennifer included, we've made a sizable investment in the Emergency Operations Center for continuity of operations, but yet if we have the internet go down because spectrum is the first thing to go during a, a storm event, then we've made an investment on a building that can't talk to any of our employees, yes. can't communicate with other departments and divisions that will be critical during post-recovery. So from that perspective, uh, it seems like a very reasonable um, request to make in order to, to make sure that we can ensure continuity of operations pre and post storm. With that. So could we spend right now, instead of 3.8, could we spend $600,000 and connect the, just exactly the facilities we want yeah. and take the other money and, and, and perhaps do the pool or, well, I, 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 you know, I, and it's not a, that's not a fair question. That would only be to elicit a comment. So. So no, I, I can actually respond. There, there is a method to the madness. We, we bid the project um, such that um, we could work within the 60 days award parameters uh, for that, that bid to be honored and be able to be awarded by the commission if, if you so desire. Um, so the plan is to, uh, given concurrence and, and the commission's desires today, that would be one of the first pieces of the $3.8 million that, that Michael's laid out. Uh, to come back to the commission within the next couple of weeks 
actually with an award recommendation for that force main project that has the bid alternate, bid alternate that includes this IT fiber component in it. So yes, we could spend that 600,000. We're actually hoping that you'll agree to that so that Michael can come back here in a couple of weeks and award that project and we can get that first piece done. But again, that's just the first, be first component of building this overall in, um, fiber connectivity throughout the city so that we're not in a situation where we've got old infrastructure in the ground, which is what happened here recently where, where City Hall was down for over a week uh, without being able to communicate with any other elements of the city because our system is so old that, you know, uh, vibration from an adjacent construction project took down our system. But I guess my question was, could we then not do the other part of it? That's certainly the commission's prerogative. Okay. I think the staff's recommendation is that you do. And I'd like to elaborate that one of the other key components is a dedicated fiber line from the current public services building to the new city hall. Um, currently, our, the way our data and voice work is from the IT data system public services to the water treatment plant. From the water treatment plant to the wastewater plant the wastewater plant to the rest of the city. When we had that major fire at the water treatment plant, the network was on the other side of that block wall. Had the fire got over there and destroyed it, we'd have no connectivity outside of public services. This dedicated line would be underground going from IT directly to City Hall, connecting two major buildings as well as the EOC. Um, so then the water treatment plant would still be connected to the wastewater plant. And later on, we'd do some work to maybe make it go correct directly to the uh, new city hall, but I think it's critical to uh, provide that kind of fiber cabling. Now, to Sterling Park, to De Gladys Douglas Park, to the marina, um, those things you know, could be later phases, um, but at least it would allow us to provide our secure voice and data in those areas and provide public Wi-Fi down the road to those sites. Yeah, because I, I want to mention, you know, we need to we need to include public Wi-Fi in this project uh, to to make this a fully eligible ARPA project. So that's a that's an important component. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that, that's it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, Should have spoken up yes. earlier, Les. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I was going to I was getting ready to say I talked to somebody I talked to some other folks about this thing and they said, well, we don't care to have that. <laughs> But now you have to have it, so it doesn't matter whether you care to have it or not <laughs> to get it into here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments about or questions about any of this? Quick question. Uh, cybersecurity. Never Did we, have we, is that a good number? I mean, I'm really concerned about cybersecurity. Um, it's been a major uh was it in administration? Yes, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is administration, and I know we even discussed it in, I think, environment. I mean, it was sort of a Everywhere, yeah. a real push for the League of Cities, so. That's what keeps us up at night. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps me up at night, too. We, we <laughs> feel we've, we do pretty good on the software and hardware equipment we have installed now. It's training is important to really get a company in here, train our IT staff, train the city staff, do ongoing training, um, and then see what error, bring in an uh, intrusion detection company like No Before and others in here to see what are we lacking on our side, on what we currently have, and then see maybe those are the only things that need to improve. The number is a, a estimate of what equipment we have and what the new cost would be. It could change, it could be lower, it could be higher, it depends on once we get into it. I just don't know exactly. Well, I mean, I do think it's a primary uh, consideration of our times. Uh, if I could commit uh, comment on that, uh, Teresa Smalling, Director of HR and Risk Management, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Uh, cybersecurity insurance, especially for public entities, is off the roof in terms of the amount of premium because Unfortunately, historically, governments have not paid a lot of attention to their IT infrastructure. And so a lot of governments, as you have seen, have had to pay ransomware because their systems have been easily hacked. And so, um, as Michael mentioned, having um, proper training, having the proper firewalls, having um, all the check 
checkpoints of um, establishing a secure network are some of the things that will help us to keep our premiums down and possibly even get cyber um, security insurance. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Jeff, anything? Uh, you know, just a few. Um, you had mentioned, you know, one of the benefits would be we wouldn't have to rely on the third party vendors and you used the recent outage at City Hall as an example. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering about staff, that if we didn't have Spectrum the last time we went down here, how does that get corrected? Is it all on us to correct the outage or? Like if a line gets cut. If the line gets down, we were just down here. So the fiber cable, it, the city owns it. We don't lease it, so it's our property. And so we contacted, there's numerous vendors in the Tampa Bay area. Um, we contacted uh, MCS of, out of Tampa. They came over with their staff, a team of four, and they looked, they performed their test on the cable and, and determined what the issues were and what we had to do to install it. So it's up to us to mm -hmm. correct that. Now, we will always rely on Spectrum Ethernet to get to the outside world. You have to have some carrier. But I don't want to rely on them um, with their overhead lines for an emergency operations center or any of our other facilities like uh, the um, marina, what we have at Sterling Park with Frontier. Okay. If, you know. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. So <clears throat> uh, what happened? It, so nothing would have changed. Yeah, for, for City Hall with that. That was uh, a bad example. I used it. That was a bad example. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry. But actually, it was a, <laughs> but it was a great example. that we because But I thought it was tied to the third right, party. Right. No. We were waiting on Spectrum to climb down the hall and, and figure things out. That was a bad example. Okay. Um, <coughs> and you've got, I don't know what, I guess it's slide 27, but where it shows the downtown and the, and the yellow lines, that, that would, that's an example of, hey, the, the Wi-Fi zone. How does... And I know that's just an example of the downtown, but if we're talking about free, the potential for Wi-Fi throughout the entire city, is that what that would look like? It would just be yellow throughout the city, or? It would require fiber cabling throughout the city. Now we're talking million, or gajillions. Okay. And all. So we get downtown primarily because we're going down to the it's marina. As an, an example, right. it's an entertainment district. We, we have right. more visitors, folks there that we can provide it. Or if we were gonna, do the smart like furniture. Smart furniture or any other smart technologies okay. you would need in, in that area. Okay, so it's a free Wi-Fi free Wi-Fi zones because we're already running the the fiber optic out yes. there. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, that's it, I think, as far as cybersecurity is concerned. We pay for that in the first failure. You know, that's kind of insurance is to keep up you know, the assets and the training. So I'm good with that. So, okay. Okay, uh, just a quick couple of things. Um, when you showed us the yellow for the downtown, you said that could be done. Is that not part of the 3.8? That's the downtown? That would be part of it. It is. Okay, because I don't see a, a, a line going down there, but it'll be there. Be part because the idea is we take, when we move out of this building, we're going to take fiber cabling, new one that's got in it, <coughs> out of the building, and we can use that towards Pioneer Park. Pioneer Park and then the garage, um, and that would cover cost, down. Yes, connectivity and devices. Okay, and then I know on the list is a new garage. Would that also, so will that also be sort of an area? Yes. So yes, we, please. In order to get to the marina in Edgewater Park, we would go from the new city hall, um, Highland to Scotland, down to Scotland and across the street into Edgewater Park. So if there are any facilities going to be on Scotland, they would be connected there. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. And no. then um, I know you said on the list uh, that you had uh, the driving range and the golf club, but what about the rest of Sterling Park? So I Because we, I we're not doing anything yet. So I consider Sterling Park, which is the driving range. Yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of property behind it that's gonna be okay. something. And if we get the fiber to Sterling Park building. That's nothing, dude. That's, that's part of the, the park development. We then. Could take it that's part of the park us. development. We could take it through our property wherever we want to. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I agree on the Weaver thing. 
Uh, I, my other one was Sterling. Mm. Uh, so you were talking about storms. I, this this works during storms, so that we can have phone calls and our internal computer data. It with the outside carriers, those are likely going to be down. We won't have access to internet per se, but the, our everything we have will be communicating and we can communicate with each other. Correct. Even if we don't have cell phones. Yes. Right? Correct. Because you'll Our have buildings this will all system. be able to communicate with each other and share data. On the internal internally network. Which says to me a whole hell of a lot, really, when you're talking about safety, access. I mean, come on, we were out of electricity. I was seven days in Irma. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. We were really lucky that the internet didn't go down, but one swift wind that during that storm that could have happened. We're also going to look easily. into since we use Spectrum as our primary for to get to the outside world for the new city hall. We're thinking of also bringing maybe Frontier, another vendor, secondary that for we've got two providers as backup. If Spectrum yep. will go down, we can switch over to Frontier so that we'd have access. Yeah. Chances of both of them going down. Right. Is, no, very smart. I think this, um, well, let me ask one more question it's to Jennifer. So you had talked about, because as, as everybody knows, as part of uh, ARPA, it is providing free Wi-Fi to the public. And you had talked about the borrowing of those, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. hotspots or? Yeah, yeah. At Wi-Fi's. the library. Yeah. What are they called? MyFi's. MyFi's. Mm -hmm. And you said we only have a few right now, but we could, in theory, add a bunch. Because as soon as this whole, well, let me just say, as soon as this whole broadband thing came out as part of this, I just didn't know enough about it. I spent days, days doing research about that Wi-Fi smart furniture. I'm sure you saw the crap I sent Jennifer. Well, that's why I found the pictures. Yes. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> So I learned a lot, and um, what I learned is there are some cities that actually do have their own cable, mm -hmm. but they've been working on it for 30 years, and it's billions. It's billions. So um, because, you know, what they wanted you to do, the system, the ARPA, was look at actually how do you get to underserved areas of your city and get them access to Wi-Fi. So that, you know, if they have to do school online, they have access. If they have to, whatever, any of those things. And I was trying to figure out all these creative ways to do that, and there isn't, besides spending millions m millions and billions. And I thought, well, Mo's going to fight for her electric company before she's going to let us go down that road of being a cable company. <laughs> Just say it. I'm feeling better about this. So, so... Which is what got in, me into the discussion with Jennifer about that, about these things that we can borrow from the library. So can you just speak to that for just a quick sec? Sure. The, the MiFi is a little little mini MiFi zone in the library. I actually um, um, leases them out, if you will. doesn't really rent them out. but um, Or do they rent them? I'm not sure. So if they... they're Verizon. Right. MiFi is... I guess the term you use is like saying Kleenex. It's a tissue. It's a, yeah. it's a brand. Verizon calls them a jet pack. It's a hot spot. It's a little mobile. You can take it wherever you want to, and you've got Verizon Internet. What we're thinking you know, for the city wouldn't be that. For example, if you would switch back to slide showing the smart furniture and smart, um, I think it's... But before you carry on, though, I know what the mayor's asking me, Michael, yeah. so hold on a second. This is for underserved community okay. Okay. people right. is what I'm trying to say. How did they get to participate... Oh. Where it's not just, oh, we're providing downtown free Wi-Fi to our tourists. How do our residents... Oh, there it is. Yeah, so this is one. And okay. He doesn't have a hair tie. Right. Yeah, he's got a hair tie around his. So, so anyway, what, what you do is you actually plug this into, into your, your system, your desktop, and it's a little MiFi. It's a, it's a little hot zone, if you will. And we were actually able to get the Internet via these items when, when we were down here at City Hall. The, um, what, what I'd like to do to address that underserved comment from our community input meetings is, is get a, a lot more of these at the library so that if we have students who are underserved who need, uh, you know, because a lot of times they need that for their schooling, 
then we'll have them available at the library. Um, and that will be, a, you know, in talking to Phyllis, she has, I think, 20 now, and they're always out. They're always rented out. So okay. we want to increase the number yeah, of those. More than one child, you can have up to five devices connected to that. Right. That's cool. Child. And maybe make them available, work with the schools and make them available to when they, you know, teachers know that there's a, there's a student or students who don't Our have trouble, access, yeah. then we can make this. So you'll come back to us with some kind of yeah. proposal with that because I think that that is really important to meet the spirit of oh, absolutely. of what this is. How much are those per hair ties? Yeah. In the hair tie? Yeah, the hair tie. Yeah, the, uh, uh, we pay for the. But I, we probably have to get our own. But monthly service. Yeah. Uh, you know, remember the lady that was asking for that, right? And she said we're in an area that we just don't get Wi-Fi service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with with children because they do everything yeah. now on their little us uh, their little screens. But mm -hmm. I also think you know I seniors. mean seniors, yeah, board. seniors. To me though, it it all seems like by having these hot spots in some of the parks. Right. So it's not just downtown. So that was the it other thing I was right. just going to talk about was so in all of my research, and I may not use the right language because I didn't go back and look at it for this meeting. But there are these no nodes or nodules. Once you get your fiber in and you create, you know, access and you have your service, you can do these nodes. So as you're walking through the park, you wouldn't even see it. You could be in a tree somewhere, you know, and you have access. Well, you can do that in, in the downtown as well. And what can happen is not just a matter of, of a, a resident mm -hmm. or a tourist, whatever, accessing Wi-Fi, which by the way is still a benefit to us if they do, you now, did you see the little sensors, parking sensors and spots? Mm -hmm. If we had a parking sensor, which by the way only costs, uh, I think it's $400 a piece, not for the yeah. backup stuff, but a sensor. If you had one of those sensors in every one of your parking spots, you could have an app that would tell anybody where there is a free parking spot in real time and always have parking counts, no more parking studies. Yes, it would, let, it would allow staff and to do that. And Wi-Fi would allow you to do that in the CRA, mm -hmm. which, by the way, I plan to bring up during strategic planning. So that is, like, really, really cool. I was trying not to say what I normally would say. No, I think, Michael, you may so, have a new assistant that you could hire. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know... A, you've got, the, you've got all the security reasons to do it. B, you open yourself up with the Wi-Fi, at least in the downtown, for just one. And there's like five or six different things you can do with that, those nodes. Um, the back end of having that Wi-Fi, it comes to a landing page. And you can send out messages to people on that landing page. You know how when you go to a county meeting, you always have to go on the Pinellas County page website, right? It always takes you there when you're signing into their Wi-Fi. We can have our own landing page. And you get all the data, where are these people from? Who's using it? I'm telling you, really, 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 really cool stuff that we can do. You can't be mayor, though. I just, you know. Well, you can take, you can take my job. <laughs> anyway, there's... I think it was the yellow tie. <laughs> yeah. no, that's actually good. And then the, and then the uh, you know, all of the other things that we can do. I mean, there's just a whole ton of things we can do, but the security, you know, piece of it for our system. One of the things, and I think you'll agree, that the city is, we're not doing it now. We're trying our best. That's why we hired you. But for a very long time, we were very in the dark with technology, and we need to be at the forefront of technology. Um, We're trying to be and this, this gets us there, um, gets us better yeah, positioned yeah. to imp continue to improve. And how many people are in our parks? They're going to use our parks. They can go sit in a park and do their work if they want to. So and you'd be able to get statistics on how many people connect. To That's you. the point. See, oh, there's more people going to the park, Hammock Park, than the library. There's all kinds of it. So I'm very supportive of all of this. <laughs> but I do agree that Weaver would be, and if you can figure out a way to do that. But you'll look at that. Again, you, you, you're giving us a rough estimate. Okay, so is everybody in agreement? 
with uh, moving forward the 3.8? Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Yes. John, yes. Yes. Okay. Mayor, one final thing on that. Um, so the uh, bipartisan. And, I'm sorry, and the and the cybersecurity cyber piece. Yes. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill will be a competitive grant process. Broadband is included in that, so it's not a given, but we would certainly uh, apply it for a grant Absolutely. for this particular and see if we can recoup some of that into ARPA moving forward. For the pool. Right. It's all about the pool now, right? Getting Apparently. more money for the pool? What pool? Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, we'll Watch out, because I'm about to make it parking sensors. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're good, right? Thank you. It was the tie, Michael. Thank you, Michael. It was all the tie. It was that suit. Okay, Teresa, we'll go through Teresa, and then we'll take a break. I think if we're, when we go through Teresa, we're almost through. Nope. Uh -oh. One, two, three, four, four. And then we got three. Five, six, seven, I've tried to do that with eight. workshops, and it never works. Yeah, hey, we're we almost have eight done. more <laughs> major things to talk about, so go ahead. Good afternoon again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission, Teresa Smalling, Director of Human Resources and Risk Management for the city. I have two items to bring forth for your consideration. The first is premium pay, as is um, specifically allowed for in ARPA. Um, it, the good thing about this is that state, local, and county government employees are automatically considered eligible as workers that are able to um, get this premium pay. And what the city wants to do is, um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Les, is we want to recognize those employees that worked tirelessly uh, throughout um, the COVID that we started in March, 2020. Um, they were on site when we were going through the governor's safer at home order. Uh, they, um, when other employees, some of our other employees went home, um, they stayed to make sure that uh, operations continued. And these would be the employees that have not otherwise received other pay, such as hazard pay or um, compensation from the state uh, for services, their services. Uh, we, since it is, um, does make all local government employees eligible, we had a breakdown that we wanted to um, have a scale of compensating those employees that um, have been with us through much of COVID. So it would not include any employees hired this year. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, it does not include uh, commission, city manager, deputy city manager, department directors, or variable on demand, or temporary employees. Any questions on that? Any questions or comments? Everybody okay with that? I have a comment. Sure, go ahead. Um, so, and I, and I understand we're not gonna get detailed until later, which I'm great with that. Um, just, I just, my own sensitivity with it, of course, is when you're looking at essential critical, however you define that, I know that um, you had a whole group of people that, you know, I saw them all the time, the water workers, the wastewater, you know, the people out on the street that ha they kept working no matter what. They didn't get to be zooming in and, you know, having shorts on and, you know, eating off to the side and all this kind of stuff. So not to say that was easy, but it was a whole different deal than having to drive to work every day, gas expenses, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, not knowing what the pandemic was, was bringing, um, those people had to be here. So I just want to be sensitive to that over, you know, other employees that I guess maybe part of the time they had to come to work, some of the time they didn't. So I'm assuming, and I guess um, that that's potentially what you're looking at for the $1,600 type yes, of person. Yes, and that's, that's why we went with the graduated scale. Yeah, I, I, I like it. But I, I, think, I think this is good. Our, you know, our employees, and we have a lot of the essential people that, you know, had to do it every day. Yeah. And, and, and it was a different world for others. So thank you. Anybody else? I think, we're, I think we're all very supportive of this, oh, and yeah. I think we're all extremely happy that we get the opportunity to do it. it. And then ARPA. Right. Yeah. Next. Uh, the next item is our human resources management software. As we saw during uh, COVID, um, we had to become fleet of foot when it came to recruitment um, in making sure that we had online services uh, both for 
the recruitment side as well as the onboarding side, the paperwork and all of that. And we still actually had to have someone come in to you know, help people with paperwork. So uh, this software has actually, was actually put in, uh, requested in my second year here and we put it on hold first for financial reasons and then because we were going to do the transition to the new ERP. Uh, once we went through that transition, we realized that as, as what happens with a lot of ERP um, installations, there, there are a lot of times they're really meant for finance. And so HR tends to be a sort of add-on. And currently, uh, we're paying about uh, $1,900 for the ER, the HR side of the recruitment and the performance management side on the ERP side. So you basically get what you pay for. It's a very limited system. So we are bringing this forward now for the, an online applicant tracking system. The one that we have is very limited right now, as well as a performance management system, which uh, at the moment our supervisors use an Excel spreadsheet to uh, conduct evaluations and uh, do the scoring for our eval uh, performance merit increases. So this is uh, for your consideration. And I guess the next slide would show uh, what the overall cost is. The first year cost is about 27000 It's prorated uh, based on um, uh, proposed uh, implementation start date of March 1st, 2022. So that is a prorated amount. And then year two and year three, uh, as we come online with the full implementation of the system would show you what the, the actual cost is. Uh, any years going forward would be a one to 5% increase over year three. Any questions on that? Well, just to answer, you need this to do your job better? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want to be clear. So basically, you're spending $1,900 per year. <clears throat> year. And we be, once the money from ARPA is gone, we'd be adding to the budget $44,000 a year. Approximately, yes. And, and, and how will that speed up, you know, the ability for hiring? And, I mean, do you have any kind of a... Uh, of goals of what the data would be that would kind of make it worth it? So we are moving into a generation of um, people who are fully online. They don't want to look at things on paper. They want to be able to pull up your online applicant online system from their mobile phone because a lot of people don't even have laptops anymore. And they want to be able to apply to your, for your job immediately online. This is what this allows. Our, our laws are changing constantly as making sure that we have um, safe hiring practices, that we, we are not adversely impacting um, people, whether it's by race, gender. Um, so the, having the online system allows us to stay compliant, to have hiring practices that are legally defensible. And then onboarding, uh, we want to be able to have people fill out their paperwork online once again, uh, take, not have to write down, write out their, their information by hand, and the system becomes seamless in that once they're putting their information at the application uh, side, they're selected for hire and then it goes into the HRIS, the information system that houses all our employee database. So it becomes a seamless system. And then with the performance management, right now, as I said before, we have um, every year the supervisor you know, gets out the Excel spreadsheet and fills out information and tries to use their memory to remember all the great things the employee did with the, with the online system, they're able to go in and journal uh, accomplishments throughout the year. They're able to use it, employees are able to use it for career pathing, succession planning, uh, all the things that we have as our, on our to-do list. And so in automating some of those systems, 
it then gives us the opportunity to spend more time on some of the things that have been sitting on the back burner because our recruitment, even during COVID, has never, has never abated. We, have, we were recruiting nonstop even makes, when we were at home. Yeah, and, and, and I'm fine. I mean, um, you basically just makes everything more efficient. And I did reach out because I knew I'd heard of NeoGov, and I reached back out to the county because they were looking at NeoGov when I was doing the interim job there. And, um, and it was, they went with something different just because of what they already had as a platform. Um, but NeoGov was very well thought of, and they, were, they had several segments really pushing for it. And one of the main things was the performance appraisal, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's important. It's, it's, a, it's almost, I think, Mayor, you said it, making sure we're with, we're with it, you know, in terms of right. being, um, technologically uh, doing what you got to do in this day and age, especially for recruitment. So, Anybody Thank else? Did, did, you say, did you say, how much did you say it's costing now, 1900 uh, we pay 7530 for the online tra tracking and adver advertisements. And so now this goes up to 27. Yes. And, and I thought your answer would be, I wrote down what I thought your answer would be to this, would be efficiency, integrity, and, uh, and, and security. Did I say security? Efficiency, security, and, and integrity. So it, it, it makes sense that it's, that's important stuff and it's important from an HR standpoint that we have, that we collect that kind of information and, and it's protected. So, um, I, and it makes sense. Just, I didn't realize what we were paying before. I didn't know how good it, that, that uh, suite was, but it doesn't sound like it's very efficient. Okay, good, that's what I thought. So everybody's okay? I'm yes. great. Okay. Yeah. Um Boy, that's a lot of money. Uh, certainly, we need to be to be there, and I understand that, right? We need to be able to communicate with with the next generation, or actually, three generations down. But uh, your uh, asterisk at the bottom: year three costs, a fully amended program, expected increase. Year four, that's one to five percent. How about year five, year six, year seven? Approximately one to five percent each year. far as you know now. And at what point does this become a really pricey program? Uh, at the five, time five, the, five percent a year. Um, I would say at the time the commission deems it to be such, sir. <laughs> okay. And uh, year one it's 27,000, year two it's 31. Uh, then year three is 31 to 44. I, I might have missed it, but why the big increase in year two or year three? Year one and year one is prorated. So we're actually starting half with nine months, six months left in the fiscal year. So that's half, a little less than half. And that would be one-time costs are included in year one. So then year two, we're still, there's still some implementation expected with um, training our supervisors on the performance management would be the, the greatest investment. And then year three, you're looking at what's fully implemented. Okay. We're fully implemented. All right. So we're on our own in year three? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, I think you got consensus on that from this everybody. Direction to move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, take a quick break and we'll come back and try to finish this up.
Welcome back to our final piece of our ARPA meeting. Um, thank goodness our residents didn't have to stick around this long. <laughs> they left kind of quickly, actually. Yeah, we got it worked out fast. pretty well. Okay. So, uh, next item is the looper service. George. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a few comments, and if you have any questions, I'm going to have George sure. help me out here on sure. this one. Uh, basically, uh, as you know, this is in our 22 business plan and budget, uh, and it's to, it's to explore a looper service as the people move her downtown, Dunedin, and to address parking and traffic issues. Uh, we, we, staff would like a little more time to get the estimated cost for this service. We, we did have a consultant uh, who, who did a preliminary calculation of a real rough calculation of this service that we got Friday afternoon and we really need some more time to vet it and kind of go through it to uh, to uh, make sure we know what we have before we present it to commission so we started the process we've hired a consultant who's looking at it but we like more time to get some more concrete numbers to bring forward to the commission and you you're in the process of doing your hiring for your traffic planner right we are who's going to be helping with this we certainly yeah and I mean one of the things I've certainly said to Jennifer is, I don't think we want to be in the transportation business. We want to hire an outside company to come and do that. Oh, so we want to work with PSDA, who did the right. original looper downtown. Yeah. And yeah. Some level less said, you know, there are so many variables that go into it. Yeah. Partnership opportunities. Yeah. Um, grant opportunities. Yeah. You know, whether you buy or lease capital equipment, you know, there's just so many things. Your microphone, Jen. Or, Oh, microphone. Again? I mean, it just. Thank you. <laughs> it does it on its own. It right? does it. On its own. Yeah, well, it's her finger it's that crazy. goes over here and then she forgets about it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I do understand. Uh, but, you know, that's a good thing for you to know. You're our, PS, you're our PSDA representative. Mm -hmm. That if you look at what. Because when I was there, that's when they began the looper downtown St. Pete. And if you could get a sense of those numbers, then that might be helpful yeah. to them. And we're doing that. That's yeah. consultants drawing on some of that experience from St. Pete. Part of the problem with that mm -hmm. looper in, in St. Pete is it's going everywhere and it's a much bigger area versus what we have. So that's part of the problem. Anyway, uh, anybody have any questions or comments? We want to leave that in, right? We don't really have a cost at this point. As long as there's no cost to it, I'm I'm fine. But well, there's. I, I still have issues with it, but no. It, it, okay. Sure. Give me okay. I, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, regarding this looper, do you have any preconceived concept in your mind about how this would run, uh, what it would cover, where it would go, et cetera? Non-commissioners. That's one of the things that we've asked the consultant also look into is some route considerations. Um, you know, what kind of headway service we want. Do we want one vehicle, two vehicles? So those are the kinds of things we're going to have to. So just in really quick, I think it was 2016 or 2017 when I was on PSTA, I met with those folks and they were just getting, they were working on the, the, the looper over there. And of course, knowing that we had Tesla and Mercedes and uh, everybody, Google and everybody else had had their own self-driving concept available. We said, well, how about if we just got one of these and just let it go wherever it wanted to go, whoever wanted to call, but we had a driver, mm -hmm. had a driver. And then, then PSTA at some point in time could come in and sort of take it over. And so working with PSTA, getting that accomplished is, is a great concept from, from what Ms. Deborah said. Uh, you yeah, know, I think PS, Ford Pinellas, I think, would be a key player. Uh, oh, FDOT, yeah. I think, would be a player. So, uh, you know, I, a lot of conversations, I think, have to be had. Well, I just want to let you know that, so obviously, a bunch of us have been talking all about that. And we said, use us because we're a square mile in miles and, and, uh, and, and see what you can learn from, from here. So they were sort of agreeing at that point in time. I don't know where they are now. Jeff, maybe you can comment about that. Thank you. Okay. Um... All right, so we're all in agreement to leave that in the mix for now until we get further information? Yep. Yes? You know, if, if there's one thing I really want, it's the looper. No, it, me too. Me too. Absolutely. But I, I think we had, you know, Bob can tell you, you know, we were talking to a company for less than 50 grand mm. that was going to run it, like golf carts, large golf carts. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really all we need, you know? 
It's, it's, but they chose to go somewhere else. Um, anyway, uh, okay, so you got that? We do, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, less revenue replacement general fund. Yeah, the next item is revenue replacement, and uh, in our 22 budget, uh, when we approved the 22 budget for the general fund, we set aside and we budgeted uh, $2,020,000 for provision for government services in the general fund. Um, the 23 budget right now, we're, you know, we're, we're just starting to look at the 23 budget, and what we're seeing right now, we're estimating to have a shortfall of roughly $800,000. Again, that, that, that's a, our best estimates today uh, with current projections. Uh, and we also are, are going to be facing, we believe, some increased labor costs in 2023 as we uh, complete and roll out the implementation of the organizational structure review and salary study guide that will be, uh, that's, it's out on the streets now as an RFP and the, the plan is for that to be completed this fiscal year to be considered for in the next fiscal year's budget. So to assist with the increase in 2023 uh, budget, Staff's recommending we increase the general fund revenue replacement amount by $1 million and increase it to $3,020,000. Uh, and that's what we have recommended today. We'll be discussing the general fund in a few more slides to go over in a little more detail what, the, what our alarm range forecast looks like in item 1E today, uh, just a few, a few slides back. So this will basically add another million dollars to assist us in with our 23 budget uh, and uh, and assisted balancing 23 budget. Okay, any questions or comments? Is Let's that the most you could do? That's the most? No, we could do more. I mean, we could do, we could definitely do more than that. I, did, I, rec I, I was mainly looking at 23. Uh, we're going to have a shortfall in 24 uh, more than likely as well. And, uh, and but this, this, this basically puts us in a position, hopefully, where we don't have to address any millage increases in 23 as well as uh, hopefully, hopefully not addressing the millage increase in 24 as well, and look at that more in 25 is what we're hoping, looking at right now. So this is going to cure the shortfall? This cure the shortfall for 23, yeah. It will, it will, I mean, we, we still may have a challenging budget, you know, as we walk through the budget, but it will definitely assist with what we're seeing now as well as uh, potential increases in labor that we may have with, with the study that I just mentioned. So any extra that we end up with getting towards the end, we can certainly put in this category if we needed to. That's true, yeah. Quickly with a, with a, with a pen. Yep. That, that, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Mayor, that's what I was just going to say, too, that I think any money that we can bleed off to bolster up, because um, we do know we're going to have those labor costs, uh, and we want to do the right thing by that. Um, and I think that's, Jennifer, I guess, as we move forward, just thinking again, you know, I look at the penny and the ARPA, you know, they're just like two sides of the scale. You know, again, trying to balance what makes sense for the capital projects when you look at both those funds and then how much do we need to put in. But I think that adding this million was important. And if we can do anything more, that's awesome. Okay, everybody in agreement? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, program management and accounting. Yeah, this is... Uh this is mainly for our, we have a, our contract with Widow O'Brien that we, uh, the commission approved in September 2021. And uh, there's, they've been assisting us with, with eligibility. That, uh, a lot of the work we did today and the stuff we went through today was, was uh, you know, vetted by them, uh, working with them to make sure that these projects are all eligible under the ARPA guidance. Uh, and we plan to use them over, over, the, over the entire grant term, uh, you know, five years after 2026. The total maximum uh, dollar amount of their contract is $361,000. We have a PO for that, so we're recognizing that here, here and including it in our totals uh, up to our $17.7 million. I uh, want to note that the actual cost may be less than this. Uh, well, I think we'll have a much better idea later on this year once we have fully developed our ARPA plan working with the commission and also after we've gone through our first our first reporting period to the U.S. Treasury is in April in, of 22. So once we go through that, we'll have, I think, a better idea of what uh, what our, our needs will be as far as consulting moving forward. You know, from the firm, they've done a really good job so uh, at this point. But right now, we're just keeping this the PO intact, and we'll just monitor it. And if we find that it's going to be less money than this, 
down the road we'll move this money to something else, but we're recognizing the full commitment at this point. Any, yeah, um, but, uh, Les, you know, one of my many calls to you yesterday, um, we could actually use up to 10, correct? Mm -hmm. on, yes. on their new way that they figured it. So you have flexibility if you need to add to that fund. But again, we have things that we really want mm -hmm. that we're looking for money somehow for also. Anybody else? I don't think we're all in agreement. Okay. Yeah, my, my only comment is, is that for I don't know how long I thought they were called Widow Brian. Widow. 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 <laughs> Widow. 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 Widow Brian. I, I wanted some uh, little old lady to come up and sit in the chair. Widow Brian. <laughs> Widow Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> Matt thinks that's very funny for <laughs> Okay, so poor Matt has sat here all day. I think you can, nobody has any questions for him, right? He can get off this phone call. He's been on it all day. Oh my God. Yeah, we're just oh. moving on to Penny Fund and General Fund. Okay. Yeah. You're excused, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I, uh, the conversation I, I appreciate it. You guys did a great job and uh, definitely captured the, uh, the new guidance around the revenue loss provision, but if any questions come up, please let me know. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, uh, septic to sewer, I think is the next thing because the two fire things yeah, we already fire, covered. Yeah, the septic to sewer is the next, yeah. Yep. So the septic <clears throat> actually, uh, let me try to take this really quickly. Mayor, the septic to sewer is under the line and we're not recommending ARPA funding for that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. And the reason for that. Oh, that's, I get it. Specifically is because we really think that that's going to be the infrastructure bill. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah and, okay. and we can continue to look at that program moving forward. I forgot forward, that it was under that line. That's all right. Yeah. Well, and uh, listen, we've been talking about doing, we're already in the process of doing it, but we've been talking about it for a long time and it's important to us. So it's going to get done one way or another. Isn't, isn't the state, I thought they <clears throat> were really going to try to address that. Yeah, well. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what I've heard from environmental, that they, they really were going to push hard to, to get, funding for septic to sewer out to right and there were a number of it state federal you know all sorts of different opportunities for us with this right. program and we'll certainly pursue all of them yep okay thank you uh thanks paul good job thanks paul. Yeah. <laughs> awesome okay so the penny fund long range forecast yeah the, uh, penny fund long range forecast uh this is a, a revised version of our 22 budget and we've we've we put this out to, out to 2030, which is our, for our full Penny 4 time frame. And first thing I want to mention here is, uh, is our, our revenues. Our, you know, our, our revenues in this fund are our Penny sales tax revenues. And our actual revenues for 2021 uh, came in real, well above our budget and our forecast. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Penny revenue, actually sales tax revenue in the state of Florida has done really, really well. Uh, much better than the county estimated, much better than we estimated last year, which is a good thing. Uh, but basically, our actual, our actual revenue in 2021 was $4.586 million, almost $4.6 million. Uh, that's about $500,000 more than we projected uh, back in June. Back in June, we did projections, and we could have adjusted them along the way, but, you know, we did we didn't. We, we, knew, we knew they were conservative, but really did not think they were going to continue to climb the way they did the last three or four months of, of 21. So with that, we have 21, uh, so that, that's our new base year. So that, that basically increases our revenue in 22, 23 every year because our base is increased by that amount. So, so the revenue adjustment in the penny fund out to 2030 is about a $4 million increase in penny revenue, uh, penny for revenue compared to what we were showing uh, in September when we approved our budget. So uh, very good news. I want to mention that uh, I think we're reasonably conservative here because uh, 23 to, to, to 29, we're using the county's estimated uh, sales tax growth amounts, which are pretty conservative, I think. Uh, we're also conservative in 22 as well right now. So, but that, that, that provided a lot more funding in, in, our, in our, our plan out to 2030. And with that, we have a couple changes in the expenditure plan. Uh, we've 
We, we've added in, if you look at the very bottom, the third line from the bottom, we've added in a parking garage uh, project at $3.6 million. And that is, uh, that's over from 23 to 25 time frame. Um, we also have in our 22 adoptive budget, we had a $2.5 million uh, budgeted in the CRA fund for a, a placeholder for a parking garage in 24. I want to mention that because the, the CRA amount that's budgeted currently, and that's budgeted in the CRA to be a loan at this point, uh, a finance amount in the CRA, that plus the $3.6 million we have in the penny fund uh, totals about $6.1 million that we would set that we've got for a parking garage uh, uh, for the Scotland Street property. So between those two funds, we've dedicated $6.1 million towards a parking garage at Scotland Street property. The other project we added was Brick Streets. Uh, we uh, we we know we probably need Brick Streets sooner, and we'll work on that moving forward. But we wanted to get it in here. So in in 26 to 30, we put $125,000 in Brick Streets project. Uh, which totals six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars over that five-year period, um, you know, in this current scenario and forecast. Um, I want to go back to the prior page for a minute because another important thing to point out is if you look at the the, the, the yellow highlighted column on the far right out to twenty thirty, you know, so we, we we've added these projects and adjusted our revenue and and we and we have an we still have an un unobligated fund balance of four point two million dollars out in twenty thirty which is really good. You know, our, our goal a year ago was to have that number, uh, try to keep that about $4 million is what uh, uh, the city manager and I have, have has kind of made as, as our goal because having that is set aside for things we don't know that could, could happen out to, you know, uh, 2029 timeframe. So we still have $4.2 million unobligated, you know, and, and also be able to put those two projects in there. So those are, those are the only changes that we've made to the, what we had in our 22 budget. Okay, any uh, comments or feedback or mm -hmm. questions? Well, you know, I, I I think the poor little brick streets, are you're going to have to move them up because you have several wearing out, and, and they are $100,000 projects, you know. And, and they're, they're more than that. More than that. That's what I'm going to say. They're, that's woefully underfunding that's woefully what a underfunding. brick street would and cost to fix. we need to move it up because we're continuing to see these failures and we've got to address them because they just get worse when we sort of slap it, you know, try to. Yeah, we're banding it. We're banding. We're banding it. it, and so I really would like you to think about, you know, with the real need that you've just seen with just one road, basically, and you haven't gone down Buena Vista. But I think I think I think you. I seem to remember you giving us something, already. Yeah. Right. And the, is that in here? Is that road in here? Yeah, some of that's Most in here. It's in here, not the 125, but the. So you mean when we really discuss the budget cycle, we might can discuss based on real need moving it up somehow well i think that where we left it um was that staff was going to 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 retreat if you will and come back with a capital plan for all of you as far as which streets and how much right and that type of thing so yeah so this is just a placeholder you want to show it in process. penny right so to acknowledge right the the brick street yep. you know the the will of the commission but we need to come back with that plan for all of you right we haven't seen it yet because right. i remember i was seeing something and yeah, but yeah I, I just talked to a resident in Buena Vista who said, "So you think it'll actually be in my lifetime?" <laughs> well, and, uh, I so mean, yeah. They used to say that about the drainage on yeah. uh, on uh, Princeton and Harvard and all that stuff. Well, and, and just reiterating, I mean, we're spending a lot of money on band-aiding, and we proved in our workshop that from a long-term perspective. The costs are pretty much the same. It's just that the brick streets last forever, and the other way you have years. to redo, redo. So a hundred um, years. So actually, we'll look forward better. to the budget. Actually, it's better. The yeah. brick streets are better. I know it's pretty equal, but okay, good, better. Oh. John's brick factory is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. right. That's now. exactly right. Okay. Awesome. All right. So you're going to come back during budget cycle, and we'll yes. see something new. Okay. Anything Thank else you. about the long-term penny fund review? Nope. 
No, but I mean, again, I mean, if we get, keep getting a healthy reserve, our pool problem may be resolved. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the rules for the penny fund regarding reserves? Isn't there something special? Well, there's a recommendation by the county that you have up to like 10% uh, kind of set aside, unobligated, and that's kind of where we came up, I, I came up with that $4 million number, and because we're, we're pretty early in pennies still, you know, we're, we're, we're in 22 and we got to go up to 29, December 29, so, but they, they recommend 10% uh, unobligated, uh, you know, so you have, when things happen down the road, we've got, you know, something to fall back on, projects, unexpected projects that we don't know about today. And also that 10% that of that $4 million seemed to satisfy the Board of Finance when we forwarded the finance plan for the City Hall. That was a big one mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, right. Right, correct, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe during the budget cycle or something, you can give us a, I know what you're doing is you're using the county thing, but can you, can you give us one that we'll throw away right away that's, that we can see what you think it's really gonna be? Oh, sure. yeah, I, I can just just scenario. just for the heck of it. Yeah, you know, I think we're conservative here. I think which is good. We have to be that way. Yeah. I mean, we're planning on that. But mm -hmm. I mean, it would it would be helpful to know, do you think it's going to be 200,000 more or a million more? Mm -hmm. You know, just to have that sense as you're making decisions and over the next period of time. Sure. Yeah, definitely. That'd be helpful. All right. Uh, general fund long term. Les, did you have the uh, three million high-level slide in uh, hard copy? Yeah, I've got it in the back. Yeah, on the power. In the back. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so this is another revised. Uh, this is a general fund revised, and this is basically taking our 22 budget, and uh, we've not made any changes to the revenues at all. The only changes we've have is we have some changes to the expenditure plan uh, that I'd like to walk through. Uh, the largest. Uh, is for the personnel, if you look under 23, you can see a red font number uh, under personnel line item under the expenditures. And we've done a couple things here. We've, uh, first, we've, uh, we've looked at our 23 budget and, and we know that the, uh, the personnel cost for the fire collective bargaining agreement uh, that was approved a few months back is going to cost more than we have budgeted. We, we budgeted it in, in 22, when we did our budget in 22, we, we we uh, we did an estimate of what we thought the contract might be, and then and that and that was put in 22 and also 23 in future years, and we we're about and that was about eighty thousand dollars less than the the actual agreement and actual cost turned out to be. So we've added eighty thousand dollars in 23 to cover the uh, the difference in the in the agreement with the fire department. And the other thing we've done is, you know, this is sort of a starting point in, in looking at our our. Uh, the organizational structure review that I mentioned a few minutes ago, that study RFP just went out uh, recently, and, and the expectation is that, that that study will be completed this year, sometime uh, this summer is my understanding, and the, the goal is and plan is to, to have that information and, and include it and implement it and be considered in our 23 labor cost and 23 uh, budget, budgets, uh, budget for the city. So what we've done here is we've we made an assumption and that the average increase of that study for general fund employees would be a financial impact starting in 2023 of a 4% increase. So that we know that some some positions will have no increase and some will have more than four and, and it's very difficult to know what the study will, will result, but we, we, we did this as a starting point. So we have a 4% increase in labor cost for general fund employees and the total estimated increase in labor cost as a result of that is about $520,000 in 23 over 22's uh, budget. So we've added $600,000 in labor to 23. Uh, is, uh, that, that's what that red font number is doing. And that's the fire, depart fire cost plus the, uh, the estimate of 4% for the, uh, all other employees. That's the, that's the major change. We also- uh, Plus, before you go on, yeah, sure. Mayor, if I may, because I know the employees are watching, so I wanna be very clear here. We've baked in a, a merit-based increase of 3.5% starting in, in fiscal year 2023. That 4% would be above that, and as a result of the organizational study. We're not anticipating the entire organization would get a 4% pay increase. That study is going to tell us where Cheers. people are. There's below market, we're gonna bring them up to market. 
and that type of a thing. So, but we need to have some something to base the budget on in fiscal year 2023. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And uh, and as Jennifer just mentioned, this is slide two. If you look at the red font on the far left, it's showing that you know, as she said, we've got a we've got an increase of 7.6 percent in 23 with the 4% plus the, the merit that was there, and then the other years, uh, 24 to 27, still have the merit of 3.5%. And where where are you showing the, uh, for, the, for all of our benefit, the revenue replacement? The revenue replacement is uh, on this page two here oh. on the slide, and it's, it's like uh, right, the third caption there under intergovernmental revenues. And this, this particular, this general fund scenario has this has the revenue allocation uh, the same as our 22 budget, which is two million twenty thousand um, dollars, and I want to go back to page one for a second. Uh, you know, so w w with the with the six hundred with the increase in personnel cost that we've done here, and the only other thing we've done here is we we took out the pickleball court. The pickleball court was in 24 in the general fund, and we took it out of the general fund because now it's being a proposed ARPA project. Those are the only changes we've made, you know, uh, to the general fund. And so, with the with the two million dollar revenue recovery amount that we uh, that we had approved in our budget, with with these changes, if you look at the very fourth line from the bottom, you can see that our revenue shortfall in this scenario is a, is an average of eight hundred thousand dollars a year going out to twenty twenty seven, starting in twenty twenty three. And this is with the this is with the two million dollar revenue recovery. Uh, we, I have a slide for the three million revenue recovery. I can go to in a minute that I will in a minute that that shows that uh, if we use the three million, that shortfall goes to five hundred ninety thousand. And I'll and I'll, I'll go to that in just a minute. But um, but I want to just mention again that the only changes here are the labor and the pickleball. Everything else is the same assumptions as we had in the original budget. And I'm going to go to the uh, last slide here. This is a slide that is uh, that has the the three million dollar revenue recovery. The only change here is we have more revenue recovery in in 21 22 time frame. As you can see, the fourth line from the bottom, the budget shortfall has gone from 800 thousand to 590 thousand. If you have any trouble reading that, I'm passing that page around. Um, yeah. So, so with so with our three million dollars that we've that we've sort of uh, agreed to move forward with today, you know, this assumption increases labor by six hundred thousand dollars, and then we're we're looking at roughly about a five hundred ninety thousand uh, dollar average shortfall in the general fund with with that scenario. And that's the number we have in there now. Yeah, that's 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 a current number, right? Mm -hmm. This is yeah, this is this would be the three million dollar scenario. And our percent reserves are perfect. Yeah, we're in pretty good shape. You know, as you can see, we're we're at fifteen, pretty much every year here. You know, we, uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, we have we have, and again, five ninety is not not, it, it's it's not a huge shortfall. You know, I think twenty three. 23 will be able to work through our budget pretty easily and then I think uh, 24 as well and 25 I think I think we'll need to consider and again we, we don't know where the study is going to end up we're estimating four percent once we have once we have uh, a better idea of what the study is going to going to going to provide it, it could be less than that it could be more than that and we'll, and we'll you know adjust accordingly once we know you're okay the budget shortfall is that being added in to achieve those reserves Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Is. We got to see it without that. Yeah, it's being. We have to see it without it. We got to know what it is without it. Well, that's what the three million are, but though not. I know. Oh. But they're also adding this shortfall. It, when you look at your reserves, it, it, when you look at your percent, it looks like you don't have a shortfall, but you do, because they're adding another five hundred. That's what I'm saying. It's very deceiving when you do that. Well, but. Maybe we I need to see where we are understand. really. You're yeah. just showing the the difference right. between revenues and expense, but you've offset for that with the three million dollar 
Yeah, the three things. million dollars is, is is included in in as revenue. Yes, but there's also this five hundred and ninety thousand dollars in there as well. That's coming from nowhere. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. That's what I'm trying to say. We're showing, yeah, the, yeah, we're showing the short form. That's, that's why I'm saying it's very deceiving. I get it. I get what, but I mean, I'd rather I want to see what those reserve levels are supposed to be without, or, or would be without that five ninety. Mm -hmm. I I thought it was an eight hundred or something. It you, doesn't or, it, matter. We're still it 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 looks like our reserves are great and they're not. Well, again, the, what this is saying is it's saying that you know we can we can meet our reserve levels if we we have a five hundred thousand dollars shortfall. In other words, like in 23 right now, you know. It was 600000 essentially. Yeah. We would need to reduce expenses by $600,000 to get to that 15.6%. 15, 15 that, that, that's really what that means. Yeah. Okay. But, but, uh, I, I, I want to see this without that five. And I want to see what all the percentages sure. are because there are going to be years, just like when you look at this, some years are lower than others. Higher. So I think that we'll just, I mean, I think that this is standard accounting and we'll just show it to you in a different way, show you the, the shortfall under. Yeah, under it's just helpful. So because the first thing I, I mean, I think I'm like everybody, first thing you go to do is what's your percent of reserves. And then that makes you look further. Mm -hmm. But when you look at your level of reserves, you look like you're good, so you don't look any further. Mm -hmm. Well, could we just do an exercise? I mean... You, you don't have to give it to us now. I'm just saying. No, but I mean, couldn't we just do an exercise just for fun instead of 3.2, put in four of the ARPA, and then just show how it, four million might affect this? You get what well, I'm saying? The question is, though, if, if, if we're going to take that, then what do we not do in ARPA? Well, I don't. I, I do not say anything about pickleball or, or, <laughs> or the pools or you know or broadband. I mean, yeah, we want it. We want it all, and mm -hmm. I totally agree. But then, I just like to know, you know, just for intellectual curiosity. We can absolutely do it. It's an Excel spreadsheet, so. Yeah, because truthfully, I was. Thank you, Mayor. Because I, I, I totally as soon as I saw that, because I, I thought we didn't have. I mean, I consistently question it every time right. we see it that way. I, I this is not the first time I bring it up because it really throws me off. Mm -hmm. I understand why it's there, like for the big budget book. Mm -hmm. I Almost get like that. There should be a line below the line. Though, yeah, so can it, see what's really happening. Yeah, because I, I think it's we, yeah, you guys probably look at the numbers. We look at the percentages. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing we go for. Are we good? Are we at 15 or better? And if we are, okay, what, what else are we talking about? But if we're not, then we have to talk. And so well, it's as just a, it's and, and as a comparison, misleading. Just, as a comparison, just to throw it out there, our adopted budget that we adopted for 22, the, the, that same line item was a $290,000 shortfall. 290 was our shortfall in our adopted budget. So... Uh, and, and this is 590. We've added, you know, uh, in this scenario. But I just, I just want to point that as a point of reference. And, and really, you know, if I look at this, and, and, and we, we'll get the scenarios to you, uh, uh, Mayor and Commission. But if I look at this, really, we had a $600,000 in labor in 23, and that's our shortfall. So if, if we, if we didn't adjust labor in 23, uh, we would be, uh, we'd be balanced in 23, and then we would have. Uh, we'd be much better off out to 27, you know. So the good news is, you know, we're, we're showing this fairly large labor increase, and and it's and it's really not it's really not making our our estimated shortfall that significant, you know, for, from my standpoint. I just want to mention that because we're, we're not that much we're not that much higher than we were in our budget at 290. But less um, the 590,000 is called shortfall, it used to be called revenue enhancement. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, we're not gonna do a revenue enhancement because we've just said, oh no, this will take us out to like 2025, but there's still a whole thing in here that assumes a revenue enhancement. So I don't know how you, I, yeah, I'm just glad you said that because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm trying to follow why, why we're we trying are to, doing You know, in, in, this, in this we're trying to, we, we try to, we're trying to average out the shortfall, in other words, because uh, that, that's what that's what because uh, if you don't do that you end up having 
you end up having uh, some of these years showing a lot higher percentage than others. So we're trying to average a shortfall to make sure we, in those last few years, we're at 15% or higher. That, that, that's kind of how, how we've been doing this for a few years now. Um, so, yeah. you know, well, let's, let's than, review it maybe during strategic planning. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I just think we have to be very uh, deliberate on how we're looking at something. It's one thing what's going to be seen in a budget book. It's another thing on when you're using this as a tool for decision making. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And and so I think we need to not zero in on 15 percent. And but that's what we do. We're making predictions, though. We're making predictions for the future, and we're trying to smooth the budget so that we have at least our our you know our reserve policy in place. Right. And and actually be as transparent as we can as far as as, as identifying the budget shortfall. I think what we need to do for all of you is to move the budget shortfall down below the line yes. here. Yes, yeah, so that we what, see where's the real gap. What the percentage is when that's moved down below right. the line is yeah. what you're looking for. And then and at that year. time, we determine what, if anything, we want to do mm -hmm. about it, yeah. you know? Okay. Yeah, I just don't want to have a false sense of security. No, I because I just Somebody did. Say, oh, okay. I just did with that three point here. whatever. I was like, oh, good, we're good. And then I was like, wait a minute, no. There's still 590. It was so still with, a shortfall. With, yeah. with that shortfall, that percentage is not going to be 15. No, it's going to be less. Right. So that's what we're saying. We're not saying the truth. Right, thing. right. Cool. Yeah, we'll get that to you. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it'll oh. give you a little grief once in a while, less. <laughs> or less. Well, you know, I should have known better because I normally show both. And yes, you do. You do normally show both. Okay, yeah, we're at we're, good. we're at final comments, right? Can I yes. ask a question then? Should should this uh, this affect the what we do with with the ARPA? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's I, a, it's a valid question. But again, but I but think what do you take away? Yeah. That's what Jennifer is saying. What do we yeah. what do we get rid of? And and these figures, like as I said, they're projections. They're I, I think in the end it could. I mean, we could roll more more from ARPA into the general fund. To, to balance the budget, we can right. certainly do that, but we're projecting right now. And so yeah. I think that we not need to leave that on the table. It's a possibility in the future. But it's, it's I mean, our, our uh, projections are also very conservative, which we've been talking about. We have got to be conservative as far as what we anticipate will be our revenue. It might come in a whole lot better that short shortfall diminishes and we don't even need it. You know, so what I don't want to do is make decisions Reaction based upon the outlying years when all sorts of things could happen. You, you recall when we were sitting here about 18 months ago, so worried about Penny that we were reporting out month by month. <clears throat> and, and Penny did something completely opposite to what we thought it was gonna do. So we have to be really careful about what we do and, and not, not pinning ourselves down to these, you know, the yeah. projections or estimates. Points in time. And, and also, you know, this, this estimate for labor, you know, I, I, you know Who I, knows? I talked to Jennifer about this. I, I don't even like making this kind of, this assessment is very hard to make and it's it, it's just a broad brush, brush stroke guess, but it's a starting point, you know, as far as what that study might might provide as far as cost. Well, let's see see what it looks like when it's when it's completed. Okay. All right. Any final comments, Vice Mayor? On the whole day? Um, well, I I thought it was a great workshop. Um, we really thank you. I know people Everybody worked really hard to bring this to us at this point, and I know there'll be more research, but um, I thought it was a, a really interesting uh, 9 to 4 day, 9 to 3.30 day, and uh, I appreciate it. I appreciated all the work, and um, now I'm going to be real interested in seeing what comes back for the research on several of the big projects. Yep. Vice, uh, Commissioner Gell? Uh, I, I can I concur. I thought it was a, a great day, good, healthy conversation. Uh, my only concern about the, the the last topic is, and I know it's hard to predict long range, but I don't want to set us and the residents up with, hey, this is what we're going to do with ARPA money, but then have to dial something back because I I I I'd, yeah. I'd rather give them give the residents something than take something away. Is is my concern. Mm -hmm. No. Well, you mean just be very transparent that 
I, I'm trying to figure out what you're saying, Jeff. Well, I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to tell the residents, yes, we can afford a $9 million pool, and they go, oh, no, we can't. We can only afford $8 million because we have to. Right. We have to. He's already up the pool from $7 million, <laughs> so we're, we're working on him. We are. <laughs> hmm? We are. What? Gotcha. <laughs> okay, so am I next? Yeah. All the drain. So, uh, and on that note, perhaps, you know, tomorrow, you could get us a printout of that shortfall below the line. Sure. So we could start to say, oh, how, how much do we rely on the fact that, oh, that'll probably ebb and sway and we don't have to worry. Because, I mean, uh, I thought it was a great day. I mean, clearly, general fund, penny, ARPA, they're like three yeah. sides of this coin. And, you know, two, two sides, we're doing a lot of capital. Can't pull penny money back to general fund, but we can pull ARPA money back to general fund. So it's all, so I think that's why we just got to stay on top of those. And getting us that printout will help at least make me understand better, you know, what, where we are. Um, um, obviously, some of the ARPA projects relieved the penny, which is a good thing. Um, the, I, I did want to say, I have to say this, sorry guys, organizational study. I said it to Jennifer, I'm going to say it out here. It's all about the consultant. It's all about the person who runs the project for the consultant. I've seen horrible pay studies, and I've seen great ones. It's all about the consultant, so um, be tough. Um, the, uh, and then the other last thing is, I will say this, I'm not panicking, but we do have two constituencies, tennis players, pickleball players out there, who are politely telling us, we don't want to fight with each other. Please yeah. help us. Yeah. So, I feel, and I, and I understand, Mayor, you didn't come with the thought we'd do, and maybe there's something else we need to learn about the two, what seem to be the two options that are on the thing. I just want, I do want a sense of, like, we don't want the, the feelings to get more, um, uh, what's the word I want? Contentious. Embroiled. Contentious, thank you, Embroiled. contentious. Um, and they're continue. asking for our help. I mean, and we're, we're behind the curve, not because of anybody's fault, but... It'd be great to kind of make a decision sooner rather than later, but I want to make a good decision. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want it to drag as sometimes things can. So that's, mm -hmm. that's my gov final comment. Typical but, government, you yeah. Know? Well, yeah. And that's I mean, what happens. <coughs> but it, the staff has a lot on their plate, too. So yeah, it's not do. even. But um, great day, and thank you to my colleagues. Les, always amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. And that's it. Thank you. I'll go along with what everybody said to make it shorter. I'd also want to say that it would be great maybe if staff did confer <coughs> a couple of these things about the pickleball and tennis, if they could, to alleviate some of our concerns here. So, And also when we talk with them, I think that would be good. Great, great meeting. Less great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to Jennifer Les and Sue and all the <coughs> department heads. They practiced this meeting. Oh my God. You know, to try to make it flow. And I still screwed up the order. <laughs> Except you screwed up the order. <laughs> did you guys impersonate us when you practiced? Yeah, like, we did. I'm sure they did. Well, I'd love to see what? that. Okay, that one, yeah. yeah movie star here. Never film such a thing, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, a lot of work goes into all of this, a lot of conversations, a lot of strategy. And so. Just know that's always appreciated. It doesn't go unnoticed. But it's a lot to digest. I am very um, concerned for all of these projects and how to manage them and get them done. And I'm worried for all of you. I'm not concerned that you can't do it. I'm concerned at the sheer workload and I just want to make sure we're hiring enough project managers or whatever we need, you know, to make it happen because it isn't worth having a heart attack over. <clears throat> we do want to make the right decisions. We do want our employees to be happy. We do want them to have a sense of accomplishment. But it's just really important about how we approach it. I know you all know it. I just want you to know that you have reinforcement from this place because it's a lot and we can't barely fill the posi open positions we have now let alone get all these capital projects you know it's just it's a lot and I I want you to be honest in what you need to accomplish it we need to know that yes. thank you mayor 
Thank you, everybody. This is a good thing for our community. I know everybody will not agree with all the things that we're moving forward to, but I think everybody, us as well as our team, tried to listen to what the community said, what the money was available to use for, and we tried to pick things from all areas in one way or another. So we touched everything, whether it was our departments or the buckets that ARPA put out there or the needs of our community and tried to, you know, pick and choose a little bit from everything um, because we can't be everything to everybody. We're not the county, but we did try to pick things that we knew were important. And hopefully everybody will appreciate the diversity of types of projects that are there and, and how many people those projects actually affect. Because I think we all tried to look at that, you know, not in a vacuum, but collectively. So thank you, everybody, for all the hard work, and we are adjourned. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.